Time now for Rocky Jordan. Things had been dull around the tambourine until I got that invitation to the tent of a desert sheik. And it was a great party. The host was fine, the food was fine. And there was a dancing girl. She was fine, too. But I shouldn't have puffed on that Egyptian water pipe. Two whiffs of that, and everything went up in smoke. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the Mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Death in the Sand. It was all quite a setup. Rocky Jordan, the guest of honor of Sheikh Abbas Ali and his caravan tent on the desert. But I didn't like the way the festivities ended up, with two wild tribesmen accompanied by a blonde named Diana Carrington dragging me into Cairo police headquarters on a charge of murder. I guess it all started early that afternoon. I was sitting at a back table in my cafe when a little fellow in native dress came shuffling my way. Effendi, you are Rocky Jordan. Who'd you expect, the Sphinx? I am Ishmi, Effendi. I am a sand diviner. I'll take it somewhere else, Ishmi. Try some of the tourists up front. They'll bite. Wait, Mr. Jordan, one moment. Your future came to me as I was reading the sand. Tells of strange things for you, Effendi. Yeah? Like what? I will read the sand for you, Mr. Jordan. It reveals all. The past, present, and future. A first... The pure white cloth on the table. Look, why not just skip the hocus-pocus and get to the point? And now, on to the cloth. Sand of the Sahara from my diviner's pouch. You're going to have to clean that up, you know. Now, I take the sand so in my fingers. I let it rain down between my fingers so. The mystic sand. All right, just keep it out of my coffee. Yes, ma. I see it again. A letter. Uh, that's standard. This letter is to Mr. Rocky Jordan. It is you. <laughs> you are this man. But now, I see a trip into the desert. Still standing. But now, Effendi, a beautiful woman. A sleek ash blonde like pure crystal. Oh, you're improving. Tell me more. I will try, Effendi. Uh, no, no, she is fading. But wait. No. No, this, this cannot be. Come on, Ishmi, get to the payoff line. No, Mr. Jordan, please, I cannot tell you this. Kata. Keep it in English and get it over with, huh? Very well, Mr. Jordan. I see it in the sand. I cannot mistake it. What? I see death. Uh, that's enough, Ishmi. Who sent you here? I, no one sent me here, Mr. Jordan. I'm only an humble sand diviner. I have the gift. Then take it somewhere else. you find plenty of yokels out around the pyramids. Imshi, Ishmi, Imshi. Very well, I will leave it, Andy, as you wish. As you wish. Little Ishmi took his sand pouch and the hurt look in his face out the front way, and I sat looking at the pile of sand on the white cloth he'd left on my table. Every time somebody comes into the tambourine with that sort of pitch, I begin wondering. And I didn't stop wondering when she came toward my table. She was beautiful, ash blonde, like pure crystal. You are Mr. Rocky Jordan, I believe? Why, uh... Yes, yes. Won't you sit down? Thank you. And Mr. Jordan, I am Diana Carrington. Well, I'm glad to know you, Miss uh, uh, Diana. Oh, thank you for being informal. Rocky, I have a letter for you from Sheikh Abbas Ali. Here, open it. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, my dear Rocky Jordan, I would be honored to have you as a guest at my tent on the desert this evening after prayers. There's a gift for you of rare beauty. I will await your coming. San Sheikh Abbas Ali. Hey, this is all right. You will go. Why not? I understand the sheik puts on quite a party. Ah, good. I'll pick you up here at the tambourine at six. You mean you're invited to? Certainly. 
Do you mind? What? No, of course not. Okay, I'll be on tap at six. Good. I'm sure the Sheik's gift will be a great surprise. Goodbye, Rocky. Diana threw me a radiant smile and walked out. It occurred to me the sand diviner's reading of my future was coming true a little too fast. A letter, a crystal blonde, and a trip to the desert. I picked up the square cotton cloth Ishmi had left on the table. It was a napkin bearing the stamp of the Heliopolis Hotel. I decided my little sand diviner had a lot more to tell me, and the quicker the better. The Oasis Room of the Heliopolis Hotel is fixed up like a Hollywood B-picture set. Paper mache palms, an oasis made of blue glass with some sand in it. I went in and sat down. Ishmi sat at a table across the room reading the sand for a couple of goggle-eyed tourists. He saw me, jumped, and looked quickly away. And my vision was suddenly blocked by a menu the size of a Sunday newspaper. On the front cover was the picture of one of the handsomest Arabians I'd ever seen. Your service, monsieur? Oh, I, uh, I didn't bring my glasses. Oh, uh, then may I suggest our specialty? Rice of the Nile, exotic nuts of Arabia, spices from India, blended into a dish fit for a pharaoh's taste. Bring me a plate of ham and eggs. Ah, as you wish, monsieur. And send that sand divine over to my table. I'm worried about my future. At once, monsieur. The waiter stepped over to Ishmi and whispered something in his ear, but Ishmi stayed put. I waited... I finally caught his eye and beckoned to him. Instead of coming over, he turned and disappeared down a hallway. So I got up and followed. When I reached the hall, Ishmi was gone. There were several doors, and I chose the one marked manager. Seated behind a mahogany desk was the handsome Arab whose picture I'd seen on the menu. The picture didn't do him justice. He was clean-shaven in perfect British dress. As he stood up, he towered over me. May I help you, sir? Why, uh... You the manager? That is correct. I am Master Symbol. Oh, I'm Rocky Jordan, Cafe Tambourine. I am delighted to meet you, Mr. Jordan. Please be seated. No, no thanks. Uh, looking for a little guy named Ishmi. Oh, our sand diviner. You will find him in the Oasis room. <laughs> Not anymore. He's avoiding me like my creditors. I don't like it. That is indeed strange, Mr. Jordan. Ishmi has been in my employ for six years. He is my finest attraction. Well, then maybe you can explain what he was doing at my cafe this afternoon. I am sure I do not know. I didn't mind so much his scattering sand all over my place, but he predicted my future a little too accurately. Oh, that is understandable. Ishmi is the finest sand diviner in all Cairo. He has the gift. Now don't tell me you think he's on the level. Most certainly. He reads the sand for me often. Ishmi has never failed to predict the future. Huh? Well, thanks. Uh, sorry for busting in, Mr. Symbol. No offense, sir. Well, as your people say, may your mother give you many brothers. Oh, oh, so kind of you. But one brother was plenty. Even then, she could not tell us apart. Well, I'd love to hear about it sometime. Now I will find Ishmi for you. No, thanks, friend. I wouldn't want to offend such a remarkable gift. Asa Symbol's eyes narrowed for a second. Then he smiled and bowed graciously as I got out. A cover-up if I ever saw one. By now, a herd of elephants couldn't have kept me away from the sheik's tent. So I was waiting that evening when Diana drove up in her little Austin 7. We crossed the English bridge, honked a couple of dogs out of the way, and roared out past Giza. The road got rougher and rougher, and finally we made it to Sheikh Abbas Ali's encampment. Four or five tents, camels and goats, tethered downwind. Sheikh Abbas Ali's tent opening must have been six feet high, but he had to bend down to come out. Peace be unto you. Oh, we appreciate the invitation, Abbas. Alaikum salam, Sheikh Ali. My house is your house. Come now inside. The food is prepared. <laughs> I've heard your meals even top my blue plate special, Abbas. I trust you will enjoy it. Seat yourselves now. Oh, uh, do you wish forks and spoons? We'll take it your way, Abbas. <laughs> Rocky was a little surprised that you should invite a woman as your guest, Sheikh Ali. You see, Rocky, we at times yield to the customs of your people. You are very gracious. We all said bismillah, then the sheik gave us kush-kush and watched us burn our fingers eating it. There were about five courses, all hot. We finished eating, and then the sheik politely suggested that Diana go to the tent of his wives. She went, and Abbas watched my reaction. There is a reason not for the years of Miss Carrington. Oh, so that's it. Rocky, you are a non-believer, but you are my friend. That's right. I like you, Rocky, and I can speak to you. 
Sure, sure, sure. I live on the desert. I do not come often to Cairo, but now that I have come to Cairo, I can speak to you. Sure, Robert. Friendship is a rare thing. There are passages on the matter in the Koran. Uh, sure, now, what does she want to talk to me about? Rocky, you have no wife. Hey, wait a second. I do not suggest that you have two or three wives such as I. But one moment, Rocky. Now you will see something, Rocky. Hey. She is beautiful, no? She is. She dances with the grace of a palm frond. Rocky, she is my gift to you. She will be your wife. Oh, now, wait up. There's nothing doing. You're very thoughtful, but I'm just not interested. Oh, let us not argue. We are good friends. We will smoke the water pipe and then discuss it further. She was light brown, the color of the café con leche the Spaniards drink in Morocco. She had on the veil over her face, of course, and a little bit more. We smoked the water pipe as she danced. We sucked the smoke up through the long tube from the water in the glass bowl of the water pipe. The sucking made the water waver. I could see the girl reflected in the water in the glass bowl of the water pipe. She seemed to waver like a reflection when a stone is dropped into a pool. She tilted and wavered, expanded, contracted. I looked up. I wasn't looking into the bowl, but she was still wavering, like water. The music was a long way off. Water seemed to be getting in between us and filling the tent, the whole tent. Then I knew why. The water pipe had been drugged. And as I drifted off into dreamland, I remembered what Ishmi had read in the sand. Death. And I wondered if I was the victim. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. But first, here's a word about one of the most popular shows in radio. The program, CBS Radio Theater. And this week, you'll enjoy The Mating of Millie, a hilarious Cinderella story starring Glenn Ford and Evelyn Keyes. So start your week with a pleasant hour of fine comedy. CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 6. Now back to tonight's story with Rocky Jordan, Death in the Sand. As I said, Ishmi, the sand of Ina's predictions about my future were coming true a little too fast, including a beautiful blonde, a letter, and a trip to the desert. I checked on Ishmi with his employer, Asa Symbol, at the Heliopolis Hotel, but didn't get any satisfaction. That evening, the blonde named Diana Carrington and I went to the desert tent of Sheikh Abbas Ali. I smoked a water pipe and curtains. I don't know how long I was out, maybe half an hour. Then my senses slowly returned. Through the haze, and then more clearly, I saw Sheikh Abbas Ali still seated across from me, the water pipe still in his mouth. The music had stopped, and the dancing girl was gone. Sheikh Abbas didn't move. His chin rested on his beard. I spoke. He didn't answer. I got to my feet and moved over to him. I reached out and touched him. Then stiffly, grotesquely, he toppled over. I bent over him, and a sickening smell like ether almost sent me spiraling off again. I heard the rustle of the tent flap and turned. It was Diana. Rocky, I think it's about time we told Sheikh Ali... Why? What's the matter? Sheikh Ali... Better not touch him, Diana. He's dead. Dead? Rocky, what did you do to him? Why did you do it, Rocky? I was drugged, that, that water pipe. You were here with him every minute. You killed Why him. Why should I kill him? Somebody must have drugged us both. Tama! Diana, what are you doing? Tamala. You get those wild tribesmen in here. Tama, hurry! I want Miss Diana. Both of you, look at your chief. Sheikh Abbas Ali is dead. Who do this? Rocky Jordan was here. You! Kill Kill anyone kill me. Stop! Kill Diana. anyone kill me! Get out of here! Call off those two dervishes, will you? Get some sense into your head, Diana. Now, Rocky, we'll see what the Cairo police think of murder. Samak Abdul, bring him along. The 
two wild tribesmen took me, one on each arm, to Diana's tiny Austin 7. We all piled inside somehow. Diana drove and we roared into Carol. At least it gave me time to get my head clear and have a look at things. I tried to figure Diana and Sheik Abbas Ali. The tribesmen from the Sheik's caravan obeyed her every command. The car screeched to a stop in front of police headquarters. The two hefty camel boys dragged me in right through to Sam Sabaya's office. Diana didn't wait for questions. And, and Sheik Abbas Ali lay on the carpet dead. And Rocky's standing over him. Jordan, kill him. I'll do the talking, Samak. Kill him with water pipe. Don't be stupid. What would I have against Abbas Ali? You were there all the time. Yes. I told you I was drunk. Please, water please, please not calm yourself. Jordan, all of you. Captain Sabaya, how can we become... Miss Carrington. Now, Jordan, you have heard the accusations. I suggest now that we hear your version of this affair. Well, it's about time. Go on, Jordan. Diana brought me an invitation from Sheik Abbas Ali this afternoon. The Sheik and I were friends, so I accepted. Diana drove me out to his encampment herself. He said he wanted to talk to me alone, so he sent her to the tent of his wives. Then a girl danced for us. We smoked a water pipe, and I passed out. When I came to, Abbas was dead. That's all I know. Miss Carrington, who saw Jordan commit this murder? Why, well, no one actually saw him, Captain Sabaya, but Rocky was there. I was drugged, Sam. How could I have done it? Was Sheikh Ali also drugged? I don't know. These overgrown sand fleas didn't give me a chance to find out. Then there is little more to be learned until the body is examined, and that we shall do at once. But, but Captain Sabaya, do you think that will be possible? The Sheikh's wives may already have buried him. I have considered that possibility, so I must leave for the encampment immediately. Well, what about me, Sam? Jordan, it stands to reason that you would not have killed the Sheikh and then drugged yourself. So until your accusers find greater proof, I will release you. You're, you're letting him go, Captain Sabaya? Yeah. These two wolves in Sheikh's clothing waiting to tear me to pieces? I would advise them to leave you completely alone, Jordan. Miss Carrington, I will talk to you again. Where do you live? 305 Sharia Danya. I must ask you to stay there. And Jordan... Sure, sure, Sam. Good. I may want to see you. Fine. Just look in some dark alley. I'll be there with a knife in my back. I didn't like the fire in the eyes of Shamak and Abdu, so I got out fast and caught a roving taxi. And I was off for the Heliopolis Hotel. Ishmi, the sand diviner, was the kickoff man in this game with death, and I wanted to know who was calling signals. It was about 11 o'clock at night when I walked into the oasis room of the Heliopolis Hotel. Little Ishmi was still missing, so I scouted the dining room and the lobby, then I went back to the manager's office. The door was open, but the office was empty. Something caught my eye. In the center of the desk was a white cotton cloth, and sand was scattered all over everything. I picked up the cloth, began looking around. Then I found myself suddenly suspended in midair as a powerful hand held me from the back at arm's length. Asa Symbol had stopped being polite. Why do you come here? What do you want? Set me down, Goliath, and I'll tell you. Now, who are... Oh, Mr. Jordan. Oh, uh... Who cut your chin, Mr. Symbol? My chin? Why, why uh, better get it? I'm still looking for Ishmi. Ishmi? Yes, your sand diviner. Now, come on, tell me where he is and I'll get out of here. Ishmi is no longer with us. Oh, why not? Why, he is not reliable. There were complaints. That's not what you said this afternoon. Where does he live, then? Unfortunately, I do not know. He worked here and you don't even know where he lived? Perhaps you will find him tomorrow, out about the pyramids. Yeah... Maybe. Well, if he comes back, tell him I'm looking for him. I will tell him, Mr. Jordan, most assuredly. Where Asa Symbol fitted into the picture, I didn't know. There were a lot of things I didn't know, and only Ishmi could tell me. I fished in my pocket for a couple of piastres and moved outside to a beggar who frequented the corner near the Heliopolis. The first piastre paid off. I learned that Ishmi hung out in a den down in the Muxi section of Cairo. I tossed the bag of the second coin for luck and then caught a taxi. Compared to Ishmi's hangout, my cafe tambourine is as sedate as the tea room of the YWCA. Ishmi was there. Mr. Jordan. Sit right where you are, Ishmi, and get out the sandbag. I am in no mood to read the sand. For six years, I have faithfully served as a symbol. Now he discharges. Yes, me. I know. That's what happened between you and your boss. Mr. Jordan, every night it was my custom to read the sand for Asa Simbo. He, re he relied on me. I have the gift. Sure, sure. Uh, what happened? But tonight I went to his office. I was ready with the sand when he came in. His actions were unspeakable. Why? 
it's simply because of my confession about what happened this afternoon. You mean when you came to the Café Tambourine? Yes. I have the gift, Effendi. But when this man offered me two Egyptian pounds to tell you those things, I, I could not refuse. I confessed all this to as a symbol. Wait a minute. Who sent you to the tambourine? Sheikh Abbas Ali. He paid you to read my future? Oh, yes, but I told you only what he instructed. I did not read it in the sand, Effendi. Did Abbas Ali tell you to leave that Heliopolis hotel napkin on my table? Uh, no, Mr. Jordan. Uh, that was my mistake. Yeah. You bungled the job, Ishmi. But I am most furious man, Mr. Jordan. Look, if you please. This menu I brought with me from the Oasis Room. Read what he says about me. Yeah. The Heliopolis proudly presents Cairo's foremost occult specialist, Ishmi, the sand diviner, with a personal endorsement and affection of us a symbol. You see? Now he throws me out, like a rat into the desert. I am most angry. Yeah, yeah. Who's Diana Carrington, Ishmi? I know I have no such person. Besides, I have other... Uh, I must go. Stay right here, Ishmi. Let go of my arm, Mr. Jordan. Let go. Oh, the police that scared you, huh? Hello, Sam. Hello, Jordan. I see you found him for me. Captain Sabaya, meet Ishmi, Cairo's foremost occult specialist. Oh, please, I am only an humble sand divine. Yes, of course. I only wish to ask you your purpose in visiting the Café Tambourine this afternoon. Yeah. Tell Sam what you just told me, Ishmi. But I, I told this man nothing, Captain Sabai. Hey, wait a minute. About the visit, Ishmi. I was not at the Café Tambourine. Jordan, what does this mean? He's lying to you, Sam. I know nothing. This man just now came to my table, but I was in no mood to read this. Oh, you little... Wait a minute, come back here. Let him go, Jordan. Sam, you get away. He's got plenty to tell you. Sit down, Jordan. I will find him when I need him again. Uh, I don't figure you. Jordan, why did you not tell me that Diana Carrington was Sheikh Abbas Ali's wife? Say that again, Sam. Diana Carrington is the wife of Sheikh Abbas Ali. How is that possible? Apparently, the Sheik did not always stick to his caravan. And also, you did not tell me that Diana was once a dancer in Casablanca. I didn't know, Sam. Believe me. Listen, did you check Sheikh Ali's body? It is gone. There is no trace of it or his caravan. And I do not fancy digging up the entire Sahara Desert to find him. But it doesn't... Wait a minute. Hold everything, Sam. Supposing that wasn't Sheikh Abbas at all. Just a dummy. Jordan, stiff... I have talked with both tribesmen who brought you in. They say it was the shame. Well, don't believe them. And at the moment, I am not inclined to believe anyone. You going someplace, Sam? Yes, it is very late. I would advise you to get some sleep, Jordan. Why? For you, tomorrow may be a very busy day. <laughs> I sat there trying to figure my next move. I picked up the big menu Ishmi had left in his haste, the one with a handsome picture of Asa's symbol on the front cover. Then I took a pencil and tried to make like a London detective, writing down all the elements of the mystery. Sheikh Abbas Ali invites me to his tent. I'm a convenient witness to his death, also a suspect. His body disappears. The crystal blonde who took me there turns out to be his wife, which means that he'd been leading a double life. Scramble that all up with an Egyptian sand diviner and you end up either cutting out paper dolls or doodling. So I doodled. Yeah, that made even less sense. Then all at once it made plenty of sense. I had the answer right in front of me. I grabbed the menu, did a fair imitation of a ten-second man out the front door, caught a taxi, and in 14 minutes flat I arrived at the house of Diana Carrington, the widow of Sheikh Abbas Ali. <laughs> Rocky Jordan continues after this brief announcement. Following the Monday Night Radio Theater program, you'll want to stay tuned to CBS for My Friend Irma, one of radio's foremost laugh shows. So after Radio Theater, stay on for My Friend Irma at 7, Monday night. Now to conclude tonight's story with Rocky Jordan, Death in the Sand. Diana had given Sam Sabaya her address at headquarters, and I remembered it. 305 Danya, in the foreign colony. Well, quite a layout for the wife of devout wanderer of the desert. By rights, I should have gone right to Captain Sabaya, the Cairo police, but this was too good. I wanted to see Diana. Why, Rocky. Hello, Mrs. Abbas Ali. All right, you know. 
You killed my husband. Let's talk about it. No, Rocky, not here. Sure. Well, maybe you'd like to call your two sand fleas in again. They're gone. What are you doing here? Looking for your husband. He's dead and buried, thanks to you. It's a fine act, Diana. Now go into your dance for me, minus the veil and the grease paint. Why, I... That was a great show, Diana. Very well, I admit it. Abbas Ali had a sense of the dramatic, I suppose. It was I who danced in native costume in his tent. He told me to. Keep going. That's all. I returned to the tent and he was dead. You had killed him. Now listen to my story, Diana. And stop me if I'm wrong. Better get out of here, Rocky. Not until I show you this menu with a picture of Asa's symbol. Does it look familiar? Why, I... What, I'm I... Uh, quite a doodler, Diana. I drew a beard on him. All right, have a look. It's not George Bernard Shaw. What's all this nonsense? With a beard, Asa's symbol is a perfect double for Sheik Abbas Ali. All right, what about it? Asa's symbol told me he had a twin brother. Was it Sheik Abbas Ali? Why, what difference does it make? I thought so. Well, Asa's symbol became wealthy here in Cairo. Abbas Ali lived out in the desert with his caravan. He chose that life. But Abbas Ali started slipping when he met you. After he married you, you had to find a way to support you. He loved me. Sure. So you both dreamed up the whole idea. I was to witness the death of Abbas Ali, then he'd disappear. Only it wasn't Abbas Ali. But you saw him. And I might have been fooled. I should have known when I bent over him and smelled the ether. The ether from the spirit gum that held on his false beard. You'd better forget it, Rocky. All Abbas Ali had to do was shave off his beard, put on his brother's clothes, and suddenly he's the wealthiest Mr. Asa symbol and nobody's the wiser. Abbas, he knows. I should have been smarter. I was standing with my back to the hall drapes. <clears throat> A hand reached through from behind and again held me in midair. It set me down and turned me around. But this time it didn't let go. Now, Rocky Jordan. You nicked your chin with that razor, Abbas. Diana, you will leave the room. Do it quickly, Abbas. Go at once. Hurry, Abbas. Hurry. More dramatics, Sheik Abbas Ali? Death is not for the eyes of a woman, Rocky. You got plans? Rocky, you were my friend. Yeah. I liked you, Rocky. Take off the record, I've heard it before. Friendship is a rare thing. It is regrettable that it must end. Oh, I don't like it either. Listen, Abbas... Abbas's symbol is dead and buried in the desert. Phony beard and all, huh? He will never be found. And neither will you. That's the way it is? Yes, Rocky, my friend. Okay. Then we might as well make it interesting. <laughs> I suddenly jerked myself away from him, made for the door. He was big, but he was fast behind me like a panther. I had hold of the door latch, and I came up with both feet. Bounced off the big better one like a rubber ball. His huge hand caught me across the face. I landed head first in the pile of chairs and mirrors. I swung a chair from the floor and caught his shins. Kill, kill, kill. He lunged, kicking. I took the first one on the ribs, rolled away, and was up again. But only for a second. The next time I came up slowly, ready for anything. He stood there looking at me in surprise. And he took two steps, sagged, and dropped hard on his back like a spread eagle. The peculiar scroll of a knife handle stuck out from his chest like a wart on a nail. I spun around, and there in the open French window stood Ishmi, the sand diviner. I am most angry, Mr. Jordan. Ah, yes. So I notice. Thanks, Ishmi. Too bad you had to kill him, but thanks anyway. I did it not for you, Mr. Jordan. I had been wrong. Yeah, sure, sure. Where is Miss Carrington, his wife? Oh, she'll keep. Sam Sabaya is sure to be along any minute. I do not fear the police now. And I'll, I'll tell Sam you did it to save my life. I had much greater reason. This man killed my faithful employer. My trusted friend. Hey, wait a minute. You know this is Abbas Ali? Yes. I know everything. That he took Asa Symbol's place? How'd you figure it out? Figure it out, Mr. Jordan? Well, that was not necessary. Remember, Effendi, I have the gift. With the gift, it is very simple. Oh, now, wait. Don't tell me yet. Yes, Mr. Jordan. I read it all. I read it in the sand. <laughs> Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. The night story by William Fifield was edited by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. I 
I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around 10 o'clock, I left the Cafe Tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. But before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> I made a dry run down the boulevard Barkeel, and sure enough, a stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. This is a very personal matter. Uh, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now, just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. At first, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. Want to stay with that story or try another one? <sighs> Mr. Jordan, would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then. Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend, but very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? <laughs> you are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? Have the dough with you? Certainly not. It's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan, at the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me. By 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And hey, what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, Mo, Mo. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work nights. Uh, what'd you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. Now, take my wife. Always wants to know what happened. What? Oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, 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 that's Morgan. Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan. Killed in mysterious explosion, salvaging operation. Off coast of Ras el Had. Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. 
a reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Mudafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, Come in. So I did. I, I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. Yeah, we meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. No, no. There's enough hot air over at the Cafe Tambourine to keep me in shape. I'd like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, why, I... I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Uh, why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tornay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tornay was arranging for me to give someone a massage uh, at the sanatorium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know I've he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? i got reasons for believing it. Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! <laughs> I got out. If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fader Brahms to show up. So I sat out in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Yorton? Yeah? Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Yorton. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Mr. Jordan, I saw you talking to a man named Fedor Brahms. Well, nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan, but I can guarantee you he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Jordan, a man does not yoke when he is 40 fathoms under. Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? I'm sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bid, Swenson. You got competition. I hung up knowing that Fader Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Malau wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Svensson's door. No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh, what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room and the dresser upside down. It looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 there has been a fight. But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yes. Oh, oh what are these? Oh, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter and it read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address... 62 Fernier Road. It looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Brahms. Next, Jan Swenson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Morey. I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. Mrs. Phipps, may I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh, you'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from... Shh, 
Please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes, everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fader Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild, and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with the gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier had mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium, and Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. Rocky! I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door! How did you find me, Rocky? In the telephone book. Uh, same old Rocky. This here, your finger man? Uh, me, Philip Tournier, my bodyguard. Well, we've already met. Twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside a phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tony, eh? I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three? Well, count them. Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they, you're having a relapse, Angus. Maybe i better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. I'm, I'm beginning to see what you mean. Same as there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky, I'll pay you every cent if you promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Oh, Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can but... trust Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. Will you hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there? Oh, sure. Well, feels loaded. <laughs> I'll have a little left. <clears throat> Here you are. Fifteen thousand dollars. Cut it if you like. No, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm gonna show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. 
Angus put his valise back where it was, and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs, trying to decide what I was going to tell fate of Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough. I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut, and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator when we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Oh, Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I, I walked into the room and, and there, there he was. There's no doubt about it this time. Oh, Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things moved fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man, he rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. Well, Jordan, I am afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Jordan, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. 300000 He is missing. I believe 15000 of it is in your pocket. Tournier did talk, didn't he? May I see it? Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my door. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, Jordan? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look them up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But um, about that 15 grand, Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find this three time you speak of. But, Jordan, the facts remain incriminating. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, John? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. Sabina was first on my list. She took my bait once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Dornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open-air market on Farron Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have, too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I gotta find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. I went to the open air market on Ferran Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. Jordan! I'm coming in, Tournier. Yes, yes, of course. I, I thought you were in jail. Oh, weren't we all? There, uh, there is a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd start leveling with me, Tournier. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky, but I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. Well, try these for size. Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus, Fader, and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Ras el Had. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hold up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. 
Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Carroll. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300,000. But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door, but I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fate or Brahms again, or Svensson or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fate of Brahms. Sure, I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. But take that shiny cannon out of my face. It hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Oh, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat, all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard a sound went up on deck. Then I heard oars fading into the fog. Zangus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. I see. Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car. Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not lying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get him together. You you know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. I waited till Fader Brahms drove off around the corner, and I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. It wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got... Uh, what, 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 what is this? Captain Morey, if you'll be at Seeker and Elmo Dar in half an hour, I'll produce him. Uh, Jordan, go home and go to bed. But Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should I send an escort? Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, Jordan. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. Sam was in no cooperative mood. But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. <laughs> Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it, a quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. <laughs> Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. Pistol blazed almost in my face. And everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps and went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. 
The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Sabaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. The Sharon again. Why here? We, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wronged me. Feder Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, and Fader Brahms. They're all the same man. The... Oh. It's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. When did you know this? Uh, I should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes, make sure I didn't lose interest. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Maury. Dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No. I wasn't sure until Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Maury, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. So when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Maury, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. It's just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fader left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that, uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, uh-huh, I see. Probably during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? My dough? Well, you see, Georgian, there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Jordan, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. You will get your money. You always do. Time now for Rocky Jordan. It's not that I ever objected to publicity about me or my cafe tambourine appearing in the Cairo newspapers. But this particular item I didn't like. It said, Captain Sam Sabaya of the Cairo police announced today that the body found floating in the Nile last night has definitely been identified as that of the local cafe owner. Rocky Jordan. The news came as something of a shock. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with a man named Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter, within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Café Tambourine, 
crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, The Man in the Morgue. I was comfortably planted at a back table in my cafe tambourine, reading the afternoon paper, when I happened onto that item announcing the death of Rocky Jordan. My chair almost went over backwards. As soon as I could stagger to my feet, I got to a phone. I was certain that Captain Sam Sabaya knew as well as I did that the news of my death, and I quote, had been greatly exaggerated. Sam wasn't at headquarters, so I headed for the morgue faster than a relative going after a will. And I didn't stop for flowers. And there, seated calmly beside an occupied marble slab, was Sabaya himself. His face registered mild surprise and no signs of grief. Well, Jordan, you look very natural. I'm not laughing, Sam. I appreciate your respect for the dead. Incidentally, I had hardly hoped for the chance to question you. Why not get a Ouija board and commune with me in the spirit world, huh? Come on, Sam, what's the gag? There is no gag. Your body was found floating in the Nile River. The coroner reports death by persons unknown. You were murdered, Jordan. Okay, so I've been murdered. There's only one slight catch in your theory, Sam. I never felt better. One moment, Jordan. Take a look at these. What about them? An American passport, a birth certificate, both wet. Made out for Rocky George. Yeah. Well, what have you to say about this? Plenty. They're my papers and they belong in the American consulate. And unless you get a search warrant, I'm Calm yourself, George, and I did not take your papers from the American consulate. They were on the man found in the Nile River last night. Now are you convinced that you are dead? All right, so he stole my papers and was murdered. That still doesn't explain how you decided it was me. You will see for yourself, George. Oh, let's stop this routine, Sam. Now, perhaps you understand. Yeah. Begin to see what you mean. About my build, height, weight, same color hair. And Jordan, observe that the face is no longer recognizable. So that just wraps it all up, huh, Sam? Now you see why this man is Rocky Jordan. Okay, so I'm dead and murdered. My papers have been stolen from the consulate. Well, thanks for finding my body, Sam. Jordan, I agree that this is no joking matter. Good. Not the wire tied about the feet of the corpse. His body was never intended to be discovered. It's a pretty thin wire. Indeed. And so it broke here. Thus the body was probably tied to a weight. When the wire broke, the body floated to the surface. Sam, somebody plants phony papers on the guy, then buries the body in the Nile so it won't be found. What kind of sense is that? That is what I want you to tell me about. Oh, I know. Stealing passport from the American consulate is not an easy task. I therefore assume you took your own paper. This, of course, is, is legitimate. Tell me what you did after that. Sam, the first thing I knew about this was in the afternoon news. Jordan, please get to the point. There isn't any point. I had nothing to do with it. Very well, Jordan. We will wait until you decide to cooperate. In the meantime... In the meantime, how about letting me have my papers back? I'm... Uh, Kind of particular who turns up dead with him. Very well, Jordan. Thanks, Sam. See you later. Uh, Jordan, on your way out, please do something for me. Yes, yeah, Sam. Stop by the florist and cancel the wreath I ordered for your funeral. I came up out of the morgue and breathed some fresh Cairo air. The American consulate was within walking distance, and there was a matter of missing papers that needed explaining. When I reached the consulate, it was locked tighter than a saloon on election day. I rapped in the glass door, but no answer. Peering in, I caught a fleeting glimpse of a face from the inner office, like the face of a terror-stricken child. It disappeared, so I knocked again. Just as I was about to wear out my knuckles, the face reappeared, and what went with it wasn't bad. Dusty yellow hair braided into loops that wrapped around her head. Her mouth was small and trembled into a smile. She raised her eyes to mine. They were not the eyes of a child. Finally, she opened the door. Just a crack. I am sorry. The consulate is closed. Please come back tomorrow. Well, tomorrow may be too late, lady. This will only take a minute. But, but everyone has gone home for the evening. You're still here. I do not count. I am only the consul secretary. Look, lady, uh, there have been some peculiar operations going on with my papers, and I want to straighten it out. Your your name, please? Jordan. Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan. I am sorry. The consulate is closed. 
Please return in the morning. Oh, sure, but in the morning I may be dead again. Dead again? Look, Miss... Um... Ralph, Laurie, Ralph. Please, what is this about being dead in the morning again? Maybe if I can have a look at my fires, I can explain it a little better. Well, Mr. Disney would never permit it, but come in, please. I will get your folder. Are you planning to leave Cairo? Is this why you wish to see your papers? Yeah, maybe. You could go to America if you wished. <laughs> Before the war, my father and I dreamed of America. But? Well, the war is over. Maybe you'll have better luck now. No. I've been in Cairo three years, Mr. Jordan. There are many of us, and quarter numbers are few. Only you Americans can afford to be impatient. Ah, here are the five. Now, let me see. Jenkins, Johnson, Jopner, Judson. Hmm. Gone, huh? Why, ah, there we are. What? You mean you found him? Of course. A little out of place is all. Uh, yeah, everything's here. You act as though you didn't expect me to find him. Maybe I didn't. Better keep a padlock on those files. Next time somebody might drop a death certificate inside. I beg your pardon. Uh, see you later. I left the consulate twice as confused as when I went in. That made two sets of passport papers. One in the consulate, one found on the body of the man floating in the Nile. Both identical and in my name. I was halfway down the steps when I saw a tall Atlas-type guy in a pink robe that hung to his ankles turn and drift around the corner. I walked the other way, but about halfway down the block, I stopped to think. It occurred to me that Laurie Rothens had made it just a little too convenient for me to get into the consulate after hours. I wouldn't hurt to check on her. I waited, and she came out a few minutes later. I shadowed her down the Shariah Kamal, and finally saw her stop in front of a faded five-story sandstone building that passed itself off as the Hotel Lydia. It catered to the uprooted of the world at 25 piastres a day. It was filled with people waiting for a quota number, or people just waiting. Lori glanced back, and I dodged into the alley, and then he caught me. It was an arm that reached out first, followed by the tall Atlas-type guy in a pink nightshirt. His big hands reached for my throat. Ah, uh, you! No, I kill! Max, slow down! Dirty pig! You follow her! You follow my lovely Lori, my sweetheart! Get out! What's the bigger... Okay, you ask for this. What is this? You hit me? Have you no sense, pig? You can get hurt this way. And then we'll start all over again. You... Fool, you have struck the prince twice. This is an insult. So now I will make you suffer. Come back here. I will choose my own time to kill you. Later. Yes, later I will kill you. The tall man walked back to the street, stopped under a street light, shook his pink robe arrogantly, and strode off into the night. I stood under the street light, pondering whether or not to follow him when I saw a pink card lying on the sidewalk where it had fallen from his robe. I picked it up. It said, Pharaoh's Jive Palace. Well, I had the night off anyway, and maybe I could find some answers there. I headed down the street. The place was under two rug shops and what passed for a native drugstore. I took the stairs down into the basement. A glaring pink sign over a pink door shouted, Pharaoh's Jive Palace. I went in. Maybe it was too early for the jive crowd because the place was almost empty. In one corner of the smoke-filled room sat a small oriental version of Frank Sinatra laboring over a tobacco-stained keyboard. He was about 19 with black eyes, olive skin, and a white turban tilted rakishly on his head. Modern Egyptian, gone jive happy. I drifted over toward him. Ah, you like it, huh? Really solid, man. Like a rock. Listen, uh, you know an overgrown fellow who goes around in a pink nightgown? Oh, sure, sure. It's Hakeem, the doorman here. Well, then maybe you can answer a few questions for me. Oh, sure thing, Jack. Everything from Biderbeck to Boogie. Piano's only a sideline. I'm really a songwriter. Name is El Had Bay. But everybody calls me Moonlight. Moonlight Bay. Get it? Yeah, I'm trying not to. I've written lots of stuff. Till the Nile runs dry, baby, that's my tune. Also, the camel hump jump. My latest, Sahara Sioux. Real gone. I guess I don't listen to much music. Oh, well, you wouldn't have heard these anyway. Nobody to publish them. All these guys want to listen to is... Twang, 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 twang. Oh. Hey, what part of these states are you from, Jack? Oh, St. Louis. A little of everywhere. No kidding. Say, what's your handle anyway? Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan. 
Look, Jack. Last night I'm sitting here when in comes this guy. Looks a little like you, same size. Starts talking to me. What do you think his name was? Don't guess, I'll tell you. Rocky Jordan. Go on. What do you talk about? He wants me to run an errand for him. Take some stuff over to the radio station. Says if I will, he'll give me some old Benny Goodman records. Tells me to meet him at midnight at his hotel. Which hotel? The Lydia, room 309. So like a chump, I do it. You think he shows up? He does not. I sit there till four in the morning, some jerk. I hope he drops dead. Room 309, huh? Uh, that all? He tell you anything else? He, he, no. Well, thanks for the info, Moonlight. I'll be running along. Oh, hey, stick around. The van's coming in. Don't you want to hit him? Sure, but not now. If you meet any more Rocky Jordans, let me know, will you? Oh, uh, drop by the Cafe Tambourine sometime. I'll donate a record. Helen Morgan, St. Louis Blues. Now, at least one item was beginning to make sense. The Hotel Lydia. I hailed a taxi and we fought the evening traffic out of the native quarter. In 15 minutes, I was back at the Hotel Lydia. Just as the cab pulled away, I saw the tall shadow. He looked like he was holding up the building across the street. He and his pink robe again moved out of sight. Then, as I turned back toward the door of the hotel, I saw her. Why, Mr. Jordan, I didn't expect to see you so soon again. Hello, Miss Robbins. Who's your friend? Oh, of course. This is Mr. Disney. He also works at the council. Mr. Disney, Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan? Don't tell me you've got an uncle named Rocky Jordan. I, uh... I don't think I've ever heard the name before. Hey, Disney, you seem pretty upset. What's the matter? Mr. Disney suffers from a nervous illness. The war. It, it has a long name. I do not know it. Oh, well, that's too bad. Uh, Mr. Jordan, we were just going out to dinner. Will you join us? Oh, sorry. I've got to see a man about a room. Here? In the Hotel Lydia? Why not? Oh, oh, nothing. I'm sure you'll like living here, Mr. Jordan. Very much. Gloria Rothens drifted on up the street with Disney walking nervously alongside her. Maybe the doctors had a long name for what was wrong with them. I had a short one. Right. I went into the lobby and over to the main desk. Behind it sat a clerk, his nose buried in a magnifying glass over a piece of dusty parchment. I took a chance he wouldn't know one American voice from another without a program. I asked him for the key to room 309. He tossed it on the counter without looking up, and I headed for the elevator. I pushed the button, mark three. It started with a bounce. It stopped. It started again. And the sliding door opened on the fifth floor. I closed the door, pushed button three again, and hoped for better luck the next landing. Finally, it ground to a stop at the third floor. The room 309 was halfway down the hall. I unlocked the door, stepped in. The ashtray beside the bed was filled with the butts of yellowish Egyptian cigarettes. On a table in the corner of the room sat an American phonograph recorder gadget. And on a chair next to it was a small suitcase affair. I opened it and saw it was more recording equipment, only this was a portable outfit. I shuffled through a pile of records on the table. The third one down had no label. I'm a curious guy, so I put it on the turntable and took the switch. Hello, America. This is Bill Booth reporting to you from Cairo. I've come here on the trail of one of the biggest international rackets of modern times. Although the story is yet incomplete, I have learned enough to make both Cairo and New York sit up and take notice. I was reaching over to turn up the volume when it happened. My head made a sound like a sack of cement hit with a baseball I bat. When I again talk Before to you, I closed my eyes, you somewhere through the haze, haze, I saw a tilted white turban above a frightened that face. It is a for the me face to belonged to outrageous chances. Moonlight Bay. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. This coming Thursday is Thanksgiving. Be certain that for you and yours it will be a day of real thanksgiving and not one of sorrow due to careless driving. Take it easy. Drive carefully. Obey traffic signals and regulations. It may take a minute or so longer, but you'll be there to enjoy the turkey and the trimmings. Now, back to Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, The Man in the Morgue. <laughs> I 
I pulled myself to my feet and looked around the dingy hotel room. I sat down on the bed to think. It all started with a corpse with my passport, then a girl secretary and the consulate with a perfect set of duplicates. From then on, everybody began to react to Rocky Jordan like poison. A tall man in a pink robe, a jive-crazy songwriter named Moonlight Bay, a nervous consulate official named Tom Disney, and finally a reporter named Bill Booth, whose voice I'd been listening to on a record. I wondered how Moonlight Bay and the man in the pink robe fitted into the picture. Then I got an idea and headed for the door. Oh, why, Mr. Jordan. Laurie Rothens, I thought you and Disney were going to dinner. Why, yes, I forgot my purse. My room is right next door. Oh, but you have been hurt. Have I? Mr. Jordan, could I talk to you privately? Go ahead, I'm listening, lady. Come into my room. Well? The man who had the room next door. I know who he was. Great, that makes two of us. His name was Bill Booth. He was a reporter. Unless I miss my guess, it was his body that the police fished out of the Nile. But how do you know these things? I try to keep my ears open most of the time. I know why Bill Booth was here. Because he was too good a reporter, that right? Yes. You see, Mr. Booth came here to expose a powerful ring who had been smuggling aliens into the United States. At a very high price. The scheme was almost perfect, but the immigration officials had never discovered it. Simple trick with duplicate papers, maybe. Yes. Huh? Excellent copies were obtained from the original papers belonging to Americans in Cairo, who had no reason to need their own passports. So the aliens travel as citizens. Tell me, uh, where do you fit into this? When the American consulate learned of Mr. Booth's discovery, they asked me to assist him in every way. I introduced him to various people as an American who wished to return to his country, but could not, legally. Working him from the inside. Together we learned everything, except who was the brains behind the scheme. You uh, don't know who killed Booth? I think I do know. It was Prince Hawking. Come again? The Prince in pink. That's what he calls himself. Of course, he is not a real prince, only the doorman at Pharaoh's Jive Palace. You seem to know a lot, sister. Mr. Jordan, Tom Disney is my husband. He is a sick man. He tried to work with Mr. Booth and I, but he could not. We had established the headquarters of this gang as the Jive Palace. Tom was to go there, but... It was too much for him, huh? He was such a strong man when I first knew him. But now, my husband is a coward. You mean he gave up the chase? If this gang killed Bill Booth, they will kill us next. As you said... We know too much. Mr. Jordan, can you help us? What's wrong with the police? They have telephones, you know. No. The consulate has told us to have positive proof before we go to the police. We must be most cautious. Look, Laurie, uh, suppose you and your husband lay low for a while. Somebody planted me in the middle of this. Rocky, you are going to help us. Laurie, right, tell your husband he won't have to worry much longer. See you later. <laughs> Now, for the first time in a long series of blind alleys, things were beginning to make sense. I headed back for Pharaoh's Jive Palace on the double. I figured some of the final answers were there. But standing outside the door when I arrived was one more obstacle, which made me slightly over par for the course. Gordon, what do you come here for? Go away! Yeah, the prince in pink. Look, Hakeem, I don't want to play. Jordan, how often must I warn you? Well, I suppose I have to kill you now. Oh, why don't you come off it, Hakim? I got some questions I think you can answer. Second grade stuff. Jordan, now you insult my intelligence. This is too much. I know like Get you. Get your paws off my collar, Hakim. Ha! Maybe you hit me again? It might take me all night to carve you down to my size, but I'm in a hurry. Listen, about Laurie Routhen. I warn you to stay away from my love. I am upset now. You go. Go! Prince in pink towered before the pink door under the pink sign. My fist was already sore from hitting him the first two times, so I took another tack. I walked around the building and up the back alley. There was a small window that sent a shaft of light out into the darkness. It was open. I didn't wait around for an invitation. I let myself down through it and landed on a plush couch. The room wasn't as well lit as I thought, but over in the corner I saw one of the things I was looking for. His white turban was pushed back off his face and his eyes lolled toward the ceiling. He was listening to a piano that sent notes all over the room. 
The man in the turban was my ex-friend, Moonlight Bay. Hello, friend. Beat it, Jack. Oh, Rocky. Rocky Jordan. Moonlight, you and I have some things to chat about, and I don't mean Vic spider Vic. Uh, take it easy. Rocky boy. Wait till my man finishes his lick. Well, this is short wave right from the States. He sends me. No more licks. Especially like that one you gave me across the head. I didn't mean to do it. Honest, Rock. It's like this. When I read this other Rocky Jordan was dead, I remember. He's promised me those Goodman records. I just couldn't see them get shipped back to the States, so I... Oh, you broke into his hotel, though. Sure. Then you came in. I hid in the closet. I got scared. I was afraid you'd find me. So you slip up behind me and let me have it. Rock, don't turn me into the cops. Give me a break, huh? That depends on you, kid. Anything you say, Mr. Jordan... First, tell me about that character outside. The one who calls himself a prince in pink. Oh, him? Oh, the big dope. He's okay. But at least he was. Till he met that dame. What dame? I don't know her name. She used to come in here all the time. Looks like a kid. Blonde hair, done up in braids. Gee, she's got the prince jumping through hoops. But look, Rock, you mind if I turn the radio back on? I gotta get back with the band in a minute. I wanna hear this boy. So ends an interlude oh, of piano music, man, which replaced the usual playing. broadcast of Bill Booth and his up-to-the-minute news analysis. We repeat, our studio in Cairo informs us that the wire recording of tonight's broadcast has not been received. Mr. Booth is engaged in extensive research in the Middle East. Until tomorrow night, this is the Columbia... Moonlight started dialing for boogie music, and I went out the way I came in. It took me ten minutes to reach the Cairo morgue, and another five minutes to talk the sergeant into letting me into the place. I got to the corpse of Bill Booth, but the autopsy boys had beaten me to it. What I was looking for was no longer there. Then I got another bright idea. It was a long shot, but the kind you bet on in spite of the odds. Booth's clothing was neatly piled on a little table by the sink. Sure enough, there it was, under a corner of the water-soaked coat, neatly wound and marked Exhibit D. The long shot paid off on the nose. It was a coil of thin wire, a wire that had been wrapped around Bill Booth's ankle. It looked strong enough to tie a man with and bury his body in the Nile, but it wasn't. It was shiny and brittle, the kind of stuff you'd use only if you were in a hurry. Maybe it wasn't very strong for some purposes, but it might be strong enough to hang a man. Rocky Jordan brings you the ending of tonight's story in just a matter of seconds. If you enjoy adventure, mystery, and excitement, then reserve Sunday nights for CBS. For not only will you hear Rocky Jordan at this same time, but you will enjoy Dashiell Hammett's famous detective, Sam Spade, and The Whistler. But it's time now for Rocky Jordan with the ending of tonight's story. I felt sure now that the strand of wire found wrapped around the ankles of Bill Booth held the identity of his murderer. I grabbed a taxi and headed for the Hotel Lydia. When we pull up in front of the battered building, I didn't wait for my change. The key to room 309 was still in my pocket. I decided against another excursion on the temperamental elevator and took the stairs three at a time. I opened the door and quickly stepped inside. The little suitcase still sat on the chair. It contained the portable wire recorder on which Bill Booth had transcribed his broadcasts from the United States. I opened the recorder, took the strand of wire from my pocket, wrapped it on the spool, and put the spool in place. I plugged in the machine to a wall socket and turned it on. I might have known I'd get it on backwards first. I reversed the strand of wire and again turned on the machine. So tonight, I believe I can finally reveal the full details of this scheme. For tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I have a date with the ringleader of the group. The amazing part of it is that they themselves have led me to this person. And here is the biggest surprise of all. Turn it off, Jordan. For at this time, I say turn it I off. I am able to give... The door was open. Coming toward me was a little girl with braided blonde hair, a gun in her hand. Just behind Lori Routhen stood her husband, Tom Disney. I realize this is very dramatic of me, Jordan, but give me the wife. Sure. Doesn't matter. There was nothing on it I didn't already know. Booth had to be eliminated. Lori, you're telling too much. Maybe he doesn't know. Too late for that, Disney. 
My story's as pat as a full house. We're holding four aces, Georgia. The deuces aren't wild, lady. Booth had all the answers to the slickest little immigration racket in the Middle East. So you killed him. One mistake, Georgia. I did not kill Bill Booth. My stupid husband did it. But, but you, you made me. Your own stupid jealousy made you, and you bungled the job at that. But how was I to know he was he was the one with Jordan's papers? It was your job to know. And only a blundering idiot would have used the wire that... the family quarrel is very touching. One point I missed. How does Hakeem fit into this? Another one of her boyfriends. She wrapped them about her fingers like twine. Sometimes strong men come in handy. Let's get down to business. We will make sure, Jordan, that your body will not be found. I'm following in Booth's footsteps. Immediately. The Nile will swallow any traces of Rocky Jordan. I never argue with a lady with a gun. She directed me down the hall to the ancient elevator. Her husband, Tom Disney, fluttered nervously behind us. The door slid open and we stepped inside. She nodded to me and I punched the button marked basement. We almost jerked out from under our feet, but the gun in Laurie Rothman's hands didn't waver. Then things began to happen like I hoped they would. The elevator bounced twice, settled, bounced once more and came to a stop. The door slid open. The temperamental elevator had done it again. We had landed in the lobby. There, framing the doorway, stood Hakim, the prince in pink. But what made the picture complete? Standing slightly behind him, flanked by two of his men, was Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. Join! Well, one thing you can say for Sam Sabaya, he knows a grand entrance when he sees one. It seems Sam's leading suspect had been Hakim. So he followed Hakim, and Hakim followed me. Which led them both to the Lydia Hotel and Laurie Robbins. Well, Sam is happy. He got three new customers for the Cairo jail. Moonlight Bay is happy. He came by my cafe the next day and collected his record of St. Louis Blues. For an hour, he converted the cafe tambourine into a bedlam of jive. Now I'm happy, because he's gone. Real gone. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Down the street from my cafe tambourine, there's a place called Rakam's. You couldn't say Rakam and I were old friends. We were just old competitors. And somehow, we managed to stay out of each other's way until he hired Tasana. I'd heard about Tasana. They said she was tall, tan, and terrific. But when she danced, it was like a moving bronze statue, alive and sultry. Yeah, they said her dancing was out of this world. Well, that's what happened to a couple of people who watched her. They, too, went out of this world. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with a man named Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern life unfolds against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Count Me Out. My business hadn't been getting any better since Tisano went to work for Rockcom. I decided to find out why. It was a little after one in the morning when I locked up my place and strolled over to Rock Combs to catch the last show. I made two stops on the way. Once when Hinnock, one of the street beggars, collared me for a coin. And then, just as I was about to push open the door to Rock Combs, I ran into Barney Grogan. When he saw me, his big puffy eyes lit up like pumpkins on Halloween. Barney was a matte-burned ex-wrestler who'd taken more dives than an Olympic diving champion on exhibition. Well, every time you bumped into him, he had a new pitch. The kind you have to handle with fumigated gloves. I didn't want any part of him. Hiya, Rock. Hello, Grogan, and so long. Oh, now, wait a minute, Rocky. You ain't gonna give your old pal Barney Grogan a brush off, are you? How do you catch on so easy? Look, Rock, I got a deal for you. A real deal. Some other time, I got business. In Rock Arms? <laughs> Look, I'll give you a tip. 
You can't watch Tisana dance and think about business. It won't work. Oh, she's that good, huh? Sensational, Rock. Sensational. But look, why don't you give it the go-by for tonight? I got a red-hot idea. Money in it. A little proposition I want to talk over with you. Beat it, Grogan. I'm not in the market for any of your deals, hot or cold. Rocky, so help me if you'll just let me give you the inside. Uh-uh. Now remove that overstuffed fist from my shoulder, huh? Okay, okay, Rock. Go on in and give Tisana the once-over. But I'll be seeing you later. Yes, sir. You're going to be wanting in on this deal, so I'll be waiting for you. Well, don't do it around the tambourine. It's closed for the night. Closed, huh? Okay, Rock. Okay, I'll see you. A couple of Arabs in flowing white robes eased past us and went inside. But what was behind them caught my eye. There were two men. One walked two steps behind and to the left of the other. I got the feeling they'd measured it that way. Both wore pinstripe pants, well-tailored afternoon coats, and ascots. They weren't winking at me. Those were really monocles. I followed them on inside. Susana had just finished her number, and the customers were hanging on the ropes. Rakam was standing over by the bar, grinning like an undertaker on his day off. I worked my way through the crowd and found a small table in the rear. Rakam spotted me and came over. He slipped his round body into a chair and tucked his watch charm under the table. Well, Rocky, it is not often you honor me with your presence. Ah, uh, Rakan, I don't have to ask you how's business. Uh, no. Uh, no, you need not ask. Uh, is this not wonderful? Uh, and I owe it all to my little Tisan, my beautiful little flower, my adorable... Your adorable little gold mine. Yes, my adorable little gold mine. Stand by letting her do a couple of guest shots in my place, Rocky. Uh, Tisan, I should let her go to you. Rocky, you take me for a fool? Surely you must be joking. Yeah, sure, I was just joking. May I sit down, Mr. Jordan? Tisan, my dear, of course, of course, do sit down. Uh, Tisana, this is my old friend, Rocky Jordan. Yes, yes, uh, I know. I've heard much of you, Mr. Jordan. Well, I wouldn't classify you as top secret, Tisana. Uh, Mr. Jordan was just telling me, my Rakam, dear... Rakam, uh, would you mind leaving us alone? I would like to talk to Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Alone, Rakam. Oh, very well. Uh, but remember, Tisana, you, you must change your costume for the next night. I will not be long. Hey, well, I will see you later. Uh, don't hurry, Rakam. Oh, what's on your mind? I, uh, I need help, Mr. Jordan. I, I've been threatened. And what you need is a bodyguard or a private eye. I'm not for hire. Please, Mr. Jordan, listen to me. Why don't you take it to the police? No. No, I don't want the police involved in this. Uh, private matter, huh? Mr. Jordan, look, over there. You see that man sitting at the table near the door? The tall, handsome man with the monocle. He is Count Frassino. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hadn't recognized him before. You... You do not know him? I'll admit he stands out in a crowd. What's with the monocle and striped pants? He's an Italian nobleman, Mr. Jordan. A very old family. Who's the carbon copy with him, his brother? No, no. He's Count Frassino's personal secretary. They're always together. His name is Romani. Uh, what about the Count? Has he been sending you little mash notes? Mr. Jordan, I, I can't tell you now. Will you come to my dressing room after the show? Look, lady, I said I wasn't for hire. Very well. But I am certain we can make other arrangements. Uh, well, I... Uh... Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I'm so happy you like my number. If you would care to stay, I will dance especially for you. Huh? Oh, Romani's paying us a visit, huh? Okay. Yeah, I could use a floor show like you over at my place, Tisana. Business has been kind of falling off lately. I'm honored, Mr. Jordan, but my contract with Mr. Rakam, you know, I don't Good think evening. he... I trust I am not intruding. Huh? Oh, Romani, it's you. What do you want? Are you not going to ask me to join you? No. I wish you'd go away. No, really... I did not mean to offend, I only... Mr. Jordan and I are discussing business. Can't you see that? Uh, yes. Uh, then I will deliver my message and leave you. Very well. What is it? Count Frosino wishes you to join him at his table immediately. You will tell the noble Count that I do not wish to see him. Tisana, I beg you No. To... Now, I wish you'd leave me alone. Do you understand? Yes. Yes, I, I will go. I will go. Mr. Jordan... 
Will you come to my dressing room later? Well, I uh, said before I wasn't for hire, but... Uh... Then, as a friend, I will be most appreciative... Look, Tisana, your boss, Rakam's over there trying to catch your eye. I think the customers are getting anxious. Why don't you go get ready for your number? Yes, yes, I know, but... Uh, I haven't I... seen you dance yet, you know. You will wait here for me? Sure, sure. Now, slip into the seven veils, will you? Rakam's having a nervous breakdown. Tizana eased out of the chair and went back to the dressing room. Rakam took a handkerchief out of his pocket, mopped his brow, and scurried around to his customers, informing them that the beautiful Tizana would be out on the platform soon. I leaned back in my chair and waited. But I never did see Tizana dance. I happened to glance over to the front entrance and caught sight of Hinnock, the beggar. He was motioning to me, so I went over. Mr. Jordan! Mr. Jordan, yeah. you must go quickly. There is something wrong at your cafe. My cafe? What are you talking about? It's closed. Yes, yes, I know. But as I was walking by a few moments ago, I saw a light inside. And there was a shot. Shot? Yes, yes, I heard it. I swear, Mr. Jordan, it came from your cafe. Okay, Hinnock, come on. The beggar, Hinnock, and I ducked out of Rakam's place and ran down the street to my cafe. When we got there, the place was dark and quiet. We slipped around to the side door. It was open. I'd taken three steps into the cafe when a flash of light cut across the room. Hinnock and I hit the floor together, and then someone ran past us. A second or two later, I heard the back door slam. I got up, walked over, and turned on the lights. The cafe was empty. Hinnock had disappeared. A minute later, he came running out of my office. Mr. Jordan! Mr. Jordan, come, look! What's up, Hinnock? In here, Mr. Jordan, your office. Oh, I don't see anything. No, no, look. There on your desk, Mr. Jordan. Lying on the blotter on my desk was a gun. Not just any kind of gun. It was shiny and new and had all the earmarks of an Italian dueling pistol. I picked it up. It was a dueling pistol, all right. Hollow, made out of tin. The kind of a gun that would make a great duel between six-year-olds. Mr. Jordan. It is a child's toy. Stick around, Hinnock. I got places to go. But, 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 Mr. Jordan... I said stick around. I raced back out into the alley. It was dark and deserted. I whirled around at the sound. And then I saw him at the end, end of the alley. He stumbled as he passed under the street lamp. I went after him. When I got to the corner, he was gone. I moved on down the alley till I came to a half-open door. There was a light inside. It was the rear entrance to Rakam's place. I pushed it open and went in. I followed the red splotches on the floor to the far end of the corridor, where there was a door with a battered silver star nailed to it. Tisana's dressing room. Sprawled on the floor in a pool of blood was the muscle-bound wrestler Barney Grogan. Both shoulders were touching the floor. He lost his last decision to a bullet. <laughs> Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Yes, it was mighty good news when you listeners indicated by your letters that you wanted Rocky Jordan back on the air. So we've put him in one of the outstanding mystery lineups in radio. Over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's Great Private Eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour each Sunday evening will be the time for Rocky Jordan. Now, back to tonight's story, Count Me Out. Barney Grogan was dead, all right. You wouldn't need a certificate from the Cairo Health Department to prove that. I glanced about Tisana's dressing room. There was nothing there that told me anything. I closed the door behind me. The crowd out front was calling for Tisana. I skirted my way around the crowded tables and opened the door to Rakam's office. He was sitting at his desk. Across from him sat Romani, Count Frosino's right-hand man. They were surprised when I walked in, and even more surprised when I picked up the phone and dialed for the police. Rocky, well, who are you calling? The police? No, nothing to get excited about, Rakam. Just a small case of murder. Murder, did you say, Jordan? Yeah, Romani. The corpse is here. Here? Jordan, you are joking. Cairo police, Captain Sabaya. It Zavaya. is impossible there has been no Relax, murder. Relax, Rakam. Hello, Please. Cairo police, Captain Sabaya. Sam, this is Jordan. Can you come Rocky, on? Rocky, what is going on? You must tell Shut me. Shut up, Rakam. Hello, Sam. Yes, what is the matter? Speak up, Jordan. Sam, get out your notebook. Somebody's done it again. There's a body no, in Rakam's place. No, this is place. some kind of a what, trick of yours, Jordan. What are you Jordan. talking about? You want to ruin my business. Will you shut you, up? You, you... Jordan, 
What is going on there? Put on your open-toed sandals, Sam. Rock Com's place. Tell you about it when you get here. Rocky, what is this all about? There's a dead man backstage, Rock Com. In Tizana's dressing room. Tizana? In Tizana's dressing room? Yeah, Romani. Character named Barney Grogan. Oh, by the way, uh, where is Tizana? Is she... I don't know. She should be doing her number now. No, she's not. And your customers are getting pretty restless. How did you find out about this dead man, Mr. Jordan? It's a long story, Romani. Wait. Where are you going? Back to my cafe. I have an important matter to look into. Give my regards to Sabaya. I made it out the front door through a crowd of impatient customers. They were shouting for Tizana. I walked down the block to my place. As soon as I entered the tambourine, I knew something was wrong. The lights were still on, but Hinnock wasn't around. Then I heard it. The sound was coming from the closet under the stairway. I went over and unlocked the door. Hinnock spilled out. Uh, Mr. Jordan. All right, all right, Hinnock. What happened? I do not know. I heard a noise. I became frightened. I went to this closet to look for a stick, something to defend myself. Okay. Uh, While you were rummaging around in the closet, somebody came up from behind, shoved you in and locked the door. Yes, that is it, Mr. Jordan. I did not see who it was. It happened so quickly, but... Mr. Jordan, I heard something peculiar. It was the voice of a young boy. Wait a minute. On my desk. Where are you going, Mr. Jordan? Come on. The toy gun was gone. Hinnock and I searched the tambourine from top to bottom, but neither the gun or its owner was around. I locked up the cafe for the second time in one night and went back over to Rakam's place. Sam was already there. Found him in the hall just outside of Tisana's dressing room. Part of the crowd from the cafe had filled it in. They were milling around, trying to get a look at the corpse in the room. Rakam was there, wringing his hands. Romani was there, too. Well, Jordan, we have been waiting for you. Hi, Sam. A little important business to take care of in uh, my own cafe. You found the body, is that right, Jordan? Yeah, I found Barney Grove. Rocky, Rocky, my friend. Tell him I had nothing to do with it. All Tell right, him all I, right, I did Rakan. not... Simmer I... down. Uh, Jordan, let us go into the room. Romani, uh, you and Rakam, too. Sergeant Greco, you will clear this hallway. All right. Now, Jordan? From the uh, beginning, Sam? From the beginning. Okay. Somebody broke into my cafe tonight, not more than 20 minutes ago. Hinnock the beggar told me about it. Hinnock told you about it? Yeah. I was here at Rakam's, believe it or not, waiting for the floor show. Hmm. Go on. When I got back to the tambourine, the side door was open. I walked in just as the fireworks began. There were three shots. Who fired? I don't know. The place was dark. After the shots, I ran out into the back way and saw a guy weaving up the alley. I trailed him here to to Sana's dressing room. That's how I found him. Mm. What was Barney Grogan doing in your cafe? I don't know, Sam. Uh, Captain. Yes? When Count Frosino and I entered this cafe earlier this evening, I saw Mr. Jordan speaking to this man, Barney Grogan. Oh? Yes. They were standing in the entrance. Oh, I uh, knew you'd bring that up, Romani. What did Barney Grogan want with you, Jordan? I don't know, Sam. I didn't give him a chance to tell me. Some sort of a deal he had in mind. I see. I told him to take his business somewhere else. That was the last time I saw him alive. Mm Mm-hmm. Go on. Go on. What else, Sam? I told you I found him in here, and that's when I called you. Mm Mm-hmm. Rakam. Huh? Uh, yes, yes, Captain. This girl, Tisana, where is she? Uh, I, I do not know. I swear it. She she disappeared. Was this man, Barney Grogan, a friend of hers? I, I do not know, Captain. I have seen him here at my cafe a few times. He spoke to her, yes, but... Uh, Captain Sabaya, may I interrupt? What is it, Romani? Tisana. She also spoke with Mr. Jordan this evening. When I went to their table, she... she sent me away. She said they were discussing a private matter. Oh, you're a jewel. You're positively bubbling over with information, aren't you? Well, Jordan? Sure, Sam. Rakam introduced me to his little gold mine. How about it, Rakam? Uh, Yes, yes, but... But but, but what, Rakam? Well, I... uh, Rakam. All right, Rakam. What he's trying to say, Sam, is that Tizana brushed off Rakam. She told him she wanted to discuss something with me in private. Is that it, Rakam? Uh, Yes. And what was this little private matter she wished to discuss with you, Jordan? You're going to hate me, Sam. I don't know that either. She never got around to it. Jordan, just how much of a fool do you take Sam, me Sam, all she told me was that she'd been threatened. Threatened by a man named Count Frosino. That is a lie. Okay, Romani, it's your ball. You run with it. Well, Romani, don't you see, Captain? Mr. Jordan is only trying to confuse the issue. Count Frosino has nothing to do with this. And I fail to see how the girl Tisana is involved. 
just because this man's body was found in her dressing room. Just a minute. What was Count Frasino doing here this evening? He was here, was he not, Rakam? Uh, yes, yes. He has come to my cafe every evening for the past week. Why not, Captain? My noble employer is enjoying a holiday. Does it seem strange that he should want to visit the cafes of Cairo? Where is the noble character now, Romani? He has returned to his villa for the evening. I myself saw him to his automobile a few moments before you came into Rakam's office to call the police, Mr. Jordan. Yes, that is true, Captain. Romani was settling the check of Count Frasino when Mr. Jordan came into the office. Mm. Which brings up another important little item, Captain. After Mr. Jordan called you, he rushed back to his cafe. Should you not ask him why? I went back to stock up on toothpicks, Sam. Does that satisfy you? No, it does not. I didn't think it would. Well, I see no point in sticking around here. Where are you going, Jordan? Out to make a social call. Unless you have an official word to utter, Sam. No. But I would like to see you in the morning, George. you will write it down somewhere so I won't forget, Sam. Good night, gentlemen. Inside of five minutes, I was in the back seat of a cab heading toward the west end of Cairo. Between the bounces, I tried to put the loose ends together. A murder, a toy gun, a missing dancer. It all made an interesting puzzle. I figured the missing pieces might come from an Italian named Count Frasino. Shortly before 2 a.m., the cab pulled up in front of a 50-room shanty on the outskirts of town. I told the driver to wait, ran up the marble steps to the front door, and started leaning on the bell. A minute or so later, a prune-faced old native opened the heavy panel door. Yes? What is it, Effendi? Oh, just tell your boss that a man named Jordan wants to see him, huh? I am sorry, Effendi. Count Frasino cannot be disturbed. Oh, he won't mind just this once. No, wait, wait. You cannot come oh, in. Let's not be antisocial. No, I, I will call the guards. No. I said this was important. Please, Effendi, please, you must not disturb Count Frasino. Never mind the guard. You will let the gentleman enter. I looked up to see Count Frasino standing at the end of a long corridor. The striped pants and ascot had been replaced by a gray flannel sport coat and midnight blue slacks. But the monocle was still firmly in place. He nodded for me to follow him, and we worked our way past a display of marble statues that would put the Cairo Museum to shame. He opened a big oak door, stepped aside, and I entered what might have been either Grand Central Station or his study. Something caught my eye, and I unconsciously ducked. Towering above me in the center of the room was the statue to end all statues. Must have been 14 feet high. A marble woman, her arms outstretched. It occurred to me she'd make a good hat rack. Count Frasino closed the door. So, Mr. Jordan, this is indeed a pleasure. Uh, do sit down, won't you? Thank you. I don't like to barge in this way. Yes, but... yes, I know. Uh, you wish to speak with me, is that not correct? Yeah, I'm looking for a few answers. Answers? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I understand. Uh, proceed, Mr. Jordan. It's about... Dishonor. Dishonored, Mr. Jordan? Yeah. I don't suppose you know an ex-wrestler named Barney Grogan was found dead in a dressing room a little while ago. Dead? In Dishonor's dressing room? Uh-huh. How... Oh. Uh, how did this happen? I thought maybe you might be able to tell me. I? Oh, but how should I know that? You've been around Tisana's place quite a bit lately, haven't you? Yes. Well, yes, To but... see Tisana? Yes. She gave me the idea she'd been threatened by you. Threatened? Threatened by me? Oh, no, no, there must be a mistake. Why should I threaten her? I love her, Mr. Jordan. I love my wife very much. Your wife? You... You did not know, Mr. Jordan. Yes. Uh, Tisana is my wife. I'd better fall back and regroup right here. Well, that I didn't know, Frasino. Tisana and I were married several years ago in Italy. I'm afraid that life there was... Well, perhaps she was homesick for Egypt... There was also a misunderstanding. So she left you and came here to Cairo? Yes, that is right. I am willing to admit that the misunderstanding was perhaps my fault. I listened to the wrong people. Now I have bought this home in Cairo to be near her. Now you want to patch it up, huh? Yes. And I want my son back. Your... your son? When Tassana left me, she took our child. She Wait a minute. Had... How old is he? He's only six years old. But you see, he is my firstborn... And only son. He is to be my successor and heir. He's the only one who can carry on our family name. So you see, this is most important, Mr. Jordan. Count, I think we can do business. Business? About finding your son. You know where he is. Well, suppose I put it this way. Suppose I say... 
Frasino pitched forward, bounced against his desk, fell into the broken glass on the floor. I raced out to the terrace. It was deserted, and the lawn looked peaceful and quiet. I went back inside and bent over the unconscious form of Count Frasino. He was still breathing. Then the whole door banged open, and the prune-faced native rushed in, followed by a couple of Frasino's guards. From the looks on their faces, I could see they wouldn't wait for explanations. I flipped the table into them as they rushed me and ducked out into the terrace. I just crossed the lawn and reached the shadows along a row of trees when the guards opened up from the terrace. In the street, my cabbie had heard the shots and he started to get his hack moving. As he went past me, I jumped on the running board and we roared around the corner and headed back to Cairo. Rocky Jordan will be back in just a minute. Here's a note of importance to listeners who like top drawer mysteries. Rocky Jordan has joined Sam Spade and The Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery block on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and The Whistler. Remember this threesome in top-notch mystery adventure on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story. It was like Tassana's dance routine. You couldn't wind up the show without the final climax to keep the customers happy. And I wanted to give Sam Sabaya his money's worth. Now, when the cab and I had made it back to town, I pulled up at the nearest phone booth. The cabbie pocketed his change without a smile and roared away. I uh, did find some nickels. I don't believe Captain Sabaya. Jordan, Sam. If you want to wind up the Barney Grogan affair, I've got the missing pieces. What's that, Jordan? Meet me at the corner of Shariah Ramar and Delhi Road. Don't stop to bring popcorn. Never mind, Jordan. I believe I can wind it up right here. Say that again, Sam. My men picked up the dancer this hour 20 minutes ago. She was getting on the train for Alexandria. She, uh, wasn't alone, was she, Sam? No, as a matter of fact, Jordan. About, had... uh, six years old, huh, Sam? I'd even bet he was carrying a toy gun. How did you know, Jordan? I'll fill in the details later. Now get rolling, will you, Sam? Sam got rolling. In less than ten minutes, we were easing down the alley back at the tambourine. I brought him up to date on the affair, but I could see he still wasn't too sold on it. So this Barney Grogan kidnapped the child. Isn't that what Tassina, or Tassana rather, told you? Yes, but... uh... Works out that way, Sam. He was going to sell out to the highest bidder. He knew how much the account wanted the boy, too. Tisana could have shot Grogan in your cafe. But Jordan. she didn't, Sam. That's why Grogan staggered back to Tisana's dressing room. Since he knew it was all over for him anyway, he wanted Tisana to have a boy. He told her where to look. That is her story, yes. All right. So while I'm over at Rakam's calling you, she ducked back to my cafe, picked up the boy, and beat it. Now, if you... Just were... a minute, Jordan. What's up, Sam? A light in your cafe. I... I saw it a moment ago. Yeah, that must be... There it is again, Sam. It's upstairs. Come on. I pushed open the alley door to the tambourine. Sam and I slipped inside. As we crossed the darkened room, we could hear someone moving around up above. From room to room. Then the footsteps came closer. He was walking down the balcony. I switched on the lights. Romani stood there at the head of the stairs, his mouth wide open. Just as he brought his gun up, Sam fired. Romani folded in the middle, reached out for the banister, missed, and plunged headlong down the stairs. Well, that's the way it ended. Before Romani died, he filled in the missing pieces. He figured on killing Count Frasino, then taking the boy back to Italy. Once there, he could become the boy's guardian and also take care of the Count's king-sized estate. He hired Barney Grogan to do the job, but Barney held out for more money and Romani threatened him. Grogan got scared and came to me. When Romani saw the two of us talking in front of Rakam's place, he figured he'd have to act fast, so he caught up with Grogan at my place. He'd have gotten the boy then, too, if I hadn't walked in. Well, later at police headquarters, Sam still had a couple of questions. Jordan, uh, how did you know he was coming to your cafe tonight? Oh, it was a long shot, Sam. I figured the guy who had tried to knock off Count Forsino had overheard part of our conversation out there. From the way I'd talked, I 
Guess he must have thought the kid was still in my cafe and that he'd rush back to my place on the double. Hmm. Uh, there is one more thing, Jordan. Yes, sir. Eh? Why did you not mention this boy when I talked to you at Rakan's place earlier this evening? Sam, who ever heard of reporting a cap pistol to the police? Jordan. Look, this... Sam, the deal was earmarked kidnapped from the beginning. You know I don't like to become involved in those things. Jordan, I know you like to keep certain things to yourself. And I know that when there is a kidnapping, there is also ransom or a reward. You you did not have this in mind, of, of course. Sam, my boy, I haven't made a nickel on the deal, so help me. Not yet, anyway. But I've been around here long enough to know that when anyone comes out ahead on one of these deals, it is always Rocky Jordan. Tell me, why, why is that? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I dropped around to the hospital the next morning to see how Count Fresino was getting along. He was going to make it okay. Tassano was there, holding his hand and smiling. The Count was very appreciative of what I'd done, just as Sam figured he would be. Yeah, it was a sizable reward. I am now the only cafe owner in Cairo with a 14-foot marble statue of a woman with her arms outstretched. And I was right, too. She does make a good hat rack. Time now for Rocky Jordan. You can't always be right, but with the practice I've had, it doesn't take long to spot a phony. She had on low tan Oxford shoes, service weight hose that disappeared under the hem of a very new lookish tweed suit. Her hair was plastered down in a severe updo that left her ears sticking out as perfect resting places for the brown tortoiseshell arms of her glasses. She was carrying a brown leather briefcase, and the end of her nose was tilted just a little as if something smelled. I thought so, too. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter in sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men of the waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Up in Flames. <laughs> Yeah, from her hairdo to her round-toed Oxford shoes, she looked 100% businesswoman. I mentally turned up my sales resistance to medium and sat back. She learned her lines for the role by heart. Mr. Jordan, I am Miss Bates. I represent the International Fire Insurance Company with head office in New York. I am certain that you already carry fire insurance, but with the rising costs of building materials and good labor, is it adequate to replace your establishment if it were to burn to the ground? Oh, Miss Bates, I... am I... certain it is not, Mr. Jordan. My company, sensing the trend of the upward spiral and replacement costs, has decided to extend for this fiscal period an added inducement policy covering the differential in costs that has developed. Now, look, Miss Bates, no doubt what you say is true, but I'm not interested in any more fire insurance. Mr. Jordan, your attitude is typical. But under the current circumstances, don't you think it would be wise to reconsider... What circumstances, Miss Bates? Surely, Mr. Jordan, you must be aware of the unusual number of major fires in Cairo in the last three months. All right, sister, drop the act. What's the pitch? Mr. Jordan, you do me a great injustice. In all Oh, excuse me. Cases... Hello, Cafe Tambourine. Hello, Rocky Jordan. Speaking. Oh, Rocky, this is Lefty Miller. I met you in the back room of Gus Gimlick's snooker parlor, remember? Oh, yeah. How's the broken nose and cauliflower ear business? Same as always, Rocky. I'm in a semi-final bout tonight at the American Club. Coming to the fight? Oh, I thought I'd drop in. Why? Um, I'd like to have you come down to my dressing room before my fight. I got a little favor to ask. Why not ask me now? I can't, Rocky. It's something personal. It takes too long to explain over the phone. What do you say, Rocky, huh? Oh, okay, Lefty. I'll stop by. That's uh, well, Rocky. I'll leave a ringside ticket for your defamation test. Oh, thanks. Don't match it. See you tonight, Rock. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Oh, uh, you still here, Miss Bates? Here's my business card. Both day and night telephone numbers are on it in case you wish to reconsider. One never knows when a conflagration might cause irreplaceable loss. Oh, I'm certain one doesn't, Miss Bates. 
Well, if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Agrazian, who owned the frozen food lockers at 937 Kamal Street, Mr. Tanut, who owned the hotel at 3014 Shariel Motopar, and Mr. Shoup, who owned the drugstore at the corner of Bakil and Canal, felt exactly as you do. Now, since their establishments have been completely destroyed by fire, they are very glad they reconsidered and took out adequate protection with my company. You might check with them, Mr. Jordan. They might help you to change your mind. With that clincher, she closed the door and left. I decided to check up on her little game, so I ignored her card, looked up the telephone number of the International Fire Insurance Company in the phone book, dialed the number, and asked for the manager. This is Mr. Temple speaking. Who's calling, please? Oh, I want some information about fire insurance. I already have some, but I, I need more. Will your company issue additional insurance? Oh, indeed we will, sir. In fact, at this very time, our company, sensing the trend of the upward spiral in replacement costs, has decided to extend for this fiscal period an added inducement policy covering the differential in costs that has developed. Uh, that's fine. Now, if I wanted a salesman to call, uh, who might I expect? I will arrange to have our star salesperson contact you in the morning. Her name is Miss Bates. Uh, who is this calling, please? <laughs> That was what I figured was wrong with the deal. It was too pat. Everything fitted together too well. No flaws. Then maybe Sam could spot one. So I called him. Cairo Police, Captain Zabaya. Jordan, Sam. Well, what is it now, Jordan? How many bodies and where are they? <laughs> no bodies, Sam. Just me. Uh, is this a pleasure call? Oh, it could be. I was about taking the night off and going to the fights at the American Club with me. Oh, I would be delighted, Jordan. Only Commissioner Balomid takes a rather dim view of his men relaxing in such a manner while on duty. Oh, it's too bad, Sam. Some other time then, huh? Uh, oh, uh, Sam. Ah, uh -huh. now it comes out. All right, Jordan, let's have it from the beginning. <laughs> You're in a rut. All I want is some information. I'm waiting. You got any leads on who's been setting all the fires we've been having lately? Jordan, if you know something we... Calm don't... down. I haven't got a thing. What about all those fires? Well, every one of them, causes unknown, owners away at the time, no evidence of arson. Luckily, most of them were adequately insured. Uh, with the uh, International Fire Insurance Company, Sam? How did you know that, Jordan? With the claims paid? Every one of them, Jordan. What are you running into? A blank wall, Sam. See you later. I decided to forget about Miss Bates and her fire insurance. I had about two and a half hours to kill, so I did a very strange thing. I went out into my cafe, sat down, and had a steak on the house. It wasn't bad. Maybe I should do it more often. I picked up my ringside seat ticket at the information desk at the American Club. And the attendant told me Lefty Miller's dressing room was number seven in the basement under the gymnasium. The first preliminary was already underway upstairs. Lefty's door was open. He was sitting on his rub-down table, a faded purple dressing gown over his shoulders. His manager and his sparring partner in second were just finishing tying up his shoelaces. Rocky, come on in. Hey, look, Mac, you and Benny step outside for a while, will you? I want to talk to Jordan along. What's the idea, Lefty? You'll be on for me so. Never mind. You and Benny wait out in the hall. This won't take long. Okay, if that's the way you want it. Hey, uh, Rocky, uh, Gus Gimlick says you're a right guy, that you don't mind doing a favor now and then. Well, I'll return the compliment when I see him. All right, what is it? I came down to see the fights, remember? This won't take but a minute. Uh, Rock, my wallet's in my coat pocket there in the locker. Get it out for me, will you? Sure. Huh? Huh, this it? Yeah. There's 250 bucks in it. Take the dough out, will you? Okay. Now what? Quick, stick the dough in your pocket. They might come back in. Now, here's the favor. When you go back upstairs, I want you to bet it on tonight's... F oh, get the phone for me, will you, Rock? I got my gloves on. Hello? Hello, Jordan. Yes, sir. How'd you find me? I called the information desk to have you page on the loudspeaker. They said you were in Lefty Miller's dressing room. That's how. Uh, I'll buy that. What do you want, Sam? Jordan, if any of my men stop you as you are hurrying back to the tambourine, tell them you are going to a fire. What's that? I'm trying to tell you. It just came over the teletype machine. The tambourine, your cafe, is on fire. Thanks, Sam. I'm on my way. Hey, Jordan, where you going? I ain't finished. Now, no time to explain, Lefty. I didn't get to use Sam's advice. Nobody stopped me. I pulled up in front of the tambourine. Business was going on as usual, so I wheeled around to the back. There'd been a fire, all right. Seemed the trash barrel had caught on fire and smoked up the back wall of my cafe a little. Uh, if this was a practical hint to buy more fire insurance, I didn't like it. 
I went inside. Miss Bates' card was still on my desk. I called the night number. A man answered, but I didn't hang up. Hello, this is Mr. Temple speaking. Oh, uh, I called earlier today for some information. Oh, you're the gentleman who called. We must have been cut off or disconnected. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, would you please give me the phone number or the address of your star salesperson, your Miss Bates? Uh, who is this, please? And may I ask why you want that information tonight? Well, never mind, Temple. Just give me your phone number or her address. Who is this speaking, please? My name is Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine. I want to talk to you, Miss Bates, about a little fire. Mr. Jordan, can't the discussion take place tomorrow? Miss Bates is asleep now. What, at this hour? Wake her up and get her to the phone. Mr. Jordan, I am seldom abrupt with a prospective client. But I am afraid you're overstepping your bounds. This apartment is my home. Miss Bates is my wife, and she's worked very hard today. If I do not choose to awaken her, that is my prerogative. Good night, sir. Well, that was that. It was too late to go back to the fight, so I tore up my ringside ticket and went out into the cafe. About 45 minutes later, Lefty Miller's fight manager, Mac, walked in, spotted me, and came over. Jordan, I want to talk to you. All right, go ahead. Let's go in your office. Oh, real private, huh? Okay, come on. Hey, Jordan, why did you come to Lefty's dressing room tonight? I'm an admirer of muscles. I'm a smart guy. What went on in there? Look, if it's just 250 bucks you want here. He said he wanted me to bet him on the fight, but I left the club before I could make the bet. Well, what's sticking in your craw? You wouldn't be known that Lefty took a dive in the third round and didn't even make it look good. What? Look, Jordan, I don't appreciate guys getting to my boy. When I find out for sure it was you who did it, I'm coming back. Time's up. End of bout. Beat it, Mac. Take Lefty's dough with you. Mac took the 250, gave me a dirty look for a receipt, and slammed the door behind him. Now, things had been jumping all evening. I hoped they'd quiet down, but they didn't. They started happening two at a time. Hey, come in. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Jordan. Jordan, this is Savaya. Oh, hello, Sam. His name isn't Sam, Mr. Jordan. It's Timothy. Keep quiet, will you? What's that, Jordan? Oh, not you, Sam. No, go, go ahead. Go oh, wait, dear Mr. Jordan. Perhaps you did not know, but since I talked to you last, there has been another fire. Why tell me? Well, you seemed so interested earlier tonight. Is this a pleasure call, Sam? Indeed it is not. The American club gymnasium has burned down, and your prize fighter friend, Lefty Miller, is lying dead. Lefty's dead? Burned to death in dressing room seven. I am calling from the main building of the club. I want you to come down immediately. Okay, Sam. I'll, I'll be right over. Now, you there. What are you... Good evening, Mr. Jordan. When my husband, Timothy, here, told me how agitated you sounded on the telephone earlier this evening, I realized you must have reconsidered. So we got dressed and hurried right over. Now, Mr. Jordan, just how much additional fire insurance do you think you will need? <laughs> Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On New Year's Day, CBS will devote every facility to accurately bring you the happenings in Pasadena, all the beauty and color of the parade and the thrilling play-by-play -play description of the Rose Bowl game. Now back to Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Up in Flames. <laughs> It all started when Miss Bates, tweed suit, horn rim glasses, and briefcase had tried to sell me some extra fire insurance. I didn't like the deal. I couldn't put my finger on the spot where it left the straight and narrow, so it still bothered me. Item one, the prize fighter named Lefty Miller, who took a dive in the third round of his fight, and his manager blamed me. Item two, a fire in back of my cafe tambourine. Item three, and this is where things started happening two at a time, Sam Sabaya called me on the phone... And at the same time, at 11 o'clock at night, who should walk into my office but that certain Miss Bates and her husband, Mr. Temple? Subject, fire insurance. I said, Mr. Jordan, how much additional fire insurance do you think you'll need? Well, look, something has just come up that's going to delay my decision. But, Mr. Jordan, you see... The, the... American Club gym is bur burned down. Oh, what? good Lord, another one. And a prize fighter was burned to death in his dressing room. Oh, how awful. And Captain Sam Sabaya wants me to come right over, so if you'll both pardon me... We'll do more than pardon you, Mr. Jordan. We'll drive you down there. Come on. It came out during the ride that the American club was insured with International. I had a feeling it would be. There was still some equipment and a lot of people around when we arrived. 
Mr. and Mrs. Temple went looking for Bert Johnson, the manager of the club. I went looking for Sabaya. I found him with some of his men in the basement of the gym. He turned his flashlight on me as I came up. So, Jordan, you finally got here. Yes, Sam, now that I'm here, why were you so anxious for me to come down? I thought perhaps the atmosphere here might induce you to tell me what is going on. Sam, believe me, I would if I could, but, but I, I can't. But I can't. You mean you will not? Very well, Jordan, look around you. Sam began pointing things out with his flashlight. They weren't pretty, especially the body lying beside the burned rubdown table. Sam played his flashlight on the lockers, then over to the wall in the back. He held it steady for a moment on the electric light fuse box. A little metal door was hanging open. Is that what caused it, Sam? No. If there had been a short circuit, the fuse would have burned out. I checked them. None of them is burned out. Any ideas? Perhaps you would like to explain what you were doing here earlier this evening. Well, Lefty Miller phoned this afternoon and said he wanted me to come to his dressing room before the fight. He wanted to ask me a favor. Yes, go on. Well, it turned out he wanted me to bet 250 bucks of his money on the fight. You called before he could do it. That's all, Sam. Thank you, Jordan. I might have known you would not tell me the truth at this time. Sam's like that. This was once I didn't blame him. That didn't make much sense to me either. I knew I should get to Lefty's manager, Mac, before Sam did. I wanted to clear up a few things, so I took off. On the way downtown in the taxi, I figured Gus Gimlick would know where I might find Mac. I checked my watch. If things were running normal in the back room of Gus Gimlick's snooker parlor, they'd be getting the results of yesterday's races short way from the States. Now, we finally pulled up in front of Gus's place. I told the driver to wait, walked down in, and through to the back room. Things were running normal. They were waiting for the results of the fifth, the Tanforan. It wasn't hard to spot Gus, even in the crowd. He was all Greek and a yard wide. He weighed a little over 300 pounds. He looked up from a form chart as I walked over. Hello, Rocky. You'll have to hurry if you want to get the bed done. The fifth is about to start. Horses are entering the start. No, thanks. Just same, Gus. I'll sit this one out. Suit yourself, Rocky. You got something on your mind? Yeah. You know Lefty Miller's fight manager, Gus? His name is Mac. Yeah, they're all in the start. Yes, again. I know Mac. He's not very smart, but he's honest. Why? Well, I want to get in touch with him. You know where I might find him? And there they go. Yeah, the fifth race is started. Blue Flash is going to the front. Ernie Keltner is second. Maximilian is third. Days end is fourth. Flying Knight is fifth. And up in flames. Where can I find him, Gus? Later, Rocky. After, after the race. race. Blue Flash in front by a nose. Ernie Keltner is second by one length. Days end is pulling up between horses. It is now third. Maximilian is fourth. Flying Knight and up in flame. Who's the favorite, Gus? Days end. But most of these in guys the got bets on the long side. Up in flames. Up in flames. Ernie Keltner is third. Flying Knight is fourth. Maximilian is fifth. And up in flames. <laughs> up in flames. They said it was a hot tip, Rocky. Days and is second by half a length. Flying Knight is third. Ernie Keltner is fourth. Up in flames is fifth. And Maximilian. And there goes up in flames. He found a hole on the rail and is moving up between horses. God, Gus, your bankroll's going up in flames. It's Blue Flash, Days End, and up in flames. Now it's Days End and Blue Flash, and up in flames. They're in a drive and coming down to the line of finish. It's Days End, and up in flames. And up in flames gets up to win it by a nose. Days End is second, and Ernie Keltner is third in front of Blue Flash. Not too bad, Gush. Can't win all the time. Don't worry, Rocky. I'll get it back. There are still two races to go. Now they'll all bet on the long shots. I hope they do, Gush. But to get back to where I can find Mac. Oh, yes. I don't know where he lives, but he hangs around Lefty's apartment all the time. It's 847 St. George Street. 847 St. George Street turned out to be a medium-sized apartment house in a middle-class neighborhood. I paid the driver and walked up the six stone steps to the entranceway. The entrance light was burned out, so I scratched a match. The name Lefty Miller was on the mailbox, numbered 311. I started to flick out the match and stopped. Just under it on the mailbox, numbered 211, was the name Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Temple. It was a mild shock, but I'd been waiting for something like this all evening. Things had to tie together, and maybe this was it. I went upstairs and knocked on the door just under where it said 311. I hoped the door would open. It did. And I got another shock. This one gave me the full treatment. Well, Rocky Jordan, come in, come in. It was Lefty Miller. 
and very much alive. Come on, Rocky. Come on in. I went in. Lefty seemed glad to see me. While I stood there trying to believe my eyes, I noticed on a long table about five or six radios with their parts scattered all around them. I'm uh, glad you dropped by, Rocky. Did you get that bet down on me to lose? This may come as sort of a mild surprise, Lefty, but not more than an hour ago. I left your dead body lying in three inches of sooty water in what was left of dressing room seven after the fire. My dead body? Fire? What fire? You don't know that the American Club gym burned down? Well, no, Rocky, but what do you mean? There was a body in your dressing room that everyone figured was you. Good Lord, Benny. Benny? Yeah, my sparring partner in second. Rocky, this is awful. They'll say I killed him. Well, did you? No. I'll admit we had a quarrel. I, I knocked him out, but I didn't kill him. Wait a minute. You said just now, did I get the bet down on you to lose? That's what Benny and I had to fight about. I didn't tell him I was going to take that dive in the third round. Then it was a phony dive. Sure, I admit it. Benny bet on me to win. He was sore about it. He swung on me after Mac left. I let him have one on the chin, left him lying on the rubdown table. I turned out the lights, closed the door, and left. That's all. Hey, you didn't bet my money on me to win, did you? I didn't bet your money at all. I gave it to Mac when he came over to my cafe later. I said, that's where he went. Maybe he figured you got me to take the dive. Why did you? That was Gus Gimlick's idea. I owed him some money. Some horses, I bet, on decided not to come in. He said if I take the dive in the third round, he'd cancel it that. That's a quick way to end your fight career. As far as I'm concerned, it's over right now. I wasn't making any dough in a fight game. None of bouts. I've been making my rent money repairing radios. It's quite a hobby for a prize fighter. I picked it up during the war. Essential industry kept me out of the army. Oh. Hey, let me show you the combination screwdriver and solder nine I invented. Oh, uh, some other time. Hey, uh, what did you come here for, Rocky? I was looking for Mac to convince him I didn't get you to take the dive. I guess it won't be necessary now. No, I guess not, Rocky. Going already? Yeah, but you'd better stick around. I think you're going to have another visitor. An official one. <laughs> Lefty shrugged his shoulders, picked up his combination screwdriver and soldering iron, and turned towards the table with the dismantled radios. I closed the door and walked down three flights to the front entrance. The timing was perfect. Sam's limousine pulled up at the curb just as I was going down the six stone steps. Jordan! Jordan, what were you doing in there? Talking to a very much alive dead man, Sam. You'll find his story very interesting. No doubt, Jordan. The body is not that of Lefty Miller, but of his sparring partner and second Benny Myers. Miller was seen leaving the club quite some time before the fire. Yeah. Hmm. Jordan, a penny for your thoughts. You just rang a bell, Sam. See you later. Jordan, come back here! I guess Sam figured he knew where he could find me later, because he didn't follow me. I grabbed a taxi at the corner and headed for dressing room seven of the American Club gym. I didn't ask for permission, and nobody tried to stop me. Just as the fourth match was burning my finger, I found what I was looking for. Fourteen minutes later, I pulled up at 937 Kemal Street at the charred remains of Mr. Agrazian's frozen food lockers. The next stop was 3014 Shariel Motifar and what used to be Mr. Tanut's small hotel. From there, we wheeled around and went to what used to be Mr. Shook's drugstore at the corner of Bakil and Canal. Then I gave the driver the address of 847 St. George Street and settled back to count my evening's loot. Adding them up carefully, they would just come to the price of the new American airmail postcard. I told the driver to wait, ran up the six stone steps and went inside. This time I knocked on the door right under where it said 211. I figured when the door opened it'd be Timothy Temple. It was, and he was in a bathroom. Mr. Jordan. Uh, uh, Thanks for asking me in, Temple. What do you mean by forcing your way in like this? What do you want, Jordan? I'm on to your game, Temple. Did you ever see these before? You're asking me to identify four American pennies, Mr. Jordan? They're yours, aren't they? How would I know? Look, will you please go? Mrs. Temple and I were about to go to sleep. Who is it, dear? What is going on? Oh, Mr. Jordan. Well, you look quite different without your glasses, Miss Bates. Uh, Mrs. Temple. Mr. Jordan, I don't know why you forced your way in here like this, but will you please go? We would like to go to sleep. Uh, With that radio on in the bedroom? Sounds more like you were dancing. Mr. Jordan, that radio is not in our bedroom. It is in the apartment upstairs. 
That awful man plays his radio day and night. And what is more, he is a prize fighter, and when Timothy reprimanded him, he offered to knock my husband's block off. We are going to move just as soon as we can find another apartment. Uh, it's just possible I could be wrong about you two. What are you getting at, Jordan? Why did you want me to identify those four coins? Let me ask one, friend. Who besides you and your wife would know to whom you had sold extra fire insurance? It is odd you ask, Mr. Jordan. My husband and I have tried to keep that information a secret between us, discussing it only here at home. The number of our clients having fires is alarmingly high. The head office is quite disturbed. Well, what would happen if you could prove those fires were deliberately set just to collect the insurance? Why, we could force them to return the money and put the guilty persons in prison. Uh, but what makes you think the fires were not accidental? Fire. There's no proof. I've got the proof, Temple. Wait a minute. You stay right here. I've got an idea. I left Mr. and Mrs. T looking at each other without saying a word. I didn't count the steps between 211 and 311, but there weren't many. I tried the door of 311. It wasn't locked, so I opened it. And here they are. Lefty was gone. The music was coming from one of the radios. I walked over and turned it off. Mr. and Mrs. Temple's voices were coming out of a pair of headphones lying on Lefty's work table. It all fit now. I had my answers. I walked over to the phone and called Sam. Hello, police. Captain Zabaya. Uh, Jordan, Sam. Any of you boys around this time of night? Certainly. Why? If they want to know where you're taking them, tell them you're going to a fire. Jordan, what are you talking about? No time for details, Sam. Meet me at my cafe as soon as you can. Maybe we can catch the guy red-handed. I think somebody's getting ready to set fire to the tambourine. Hurry, Sam. <laughs> When we pulled up in front of the tambourine, there was no sign of Sabaya. I tossed the driver a five-pound note and reached for my keys as I crossed the sidewalk. Except for the little service light in the back of the bar, the cafe was dark. I opened the front door, started for my office. I figured I'd find him there. I was just about even with the foot of the stairs going up to my room over the office when the upstairs door opened and he was framed in the light. I started up the stairs after him. He met me halfway and proved the theory that what goes up must come down. And we untangled at the foot of the stairs and I swung on him. I should have known better. He was a trained fighter. He caught me right on the button and I went backwards against one of the service tables full of glasses and silverware. I got up and shot it for him again. His back was to the front door. Just then, Sam, with full siren, pulled up out front. My opponent turned. His chin was silhouetted against the glare and the headlights and I let him have it. And for the second time in one night, Lefty Miller took a dive. Only this time, it wasn't fate. Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. On New Year's Day, the Rose Bowl kickoff will be at 2 instead of 3 p.m. due to the return of California to standard time. Remember to enjoy both the Tournament of Roses and the Rose Bowl game on your local CBS station, New Year's Day. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. Well, I'll say this for Sam. When you really need him, he's right there. If there were more like him, the world would be much better off. But as usual, he wanted all the details. And from the beginning... All right, George, and how did you know we would find Lefty Miller here in your cafe? Well, Sam, I just figured. When I heard Mr. and Mrs. Temple's voices on the earphones in Lefty's room, I knew he'd been listening in on them. Mm. Maybe first as a gag, but he was the only one besides the Temples who could have known who they'd sold fire insurance to. So he was the one who had gotten the owners to agree to let him fix up the accidental fires. Exactly. He convinced them that he could do the job, and when they collected the insurance money, all he wanted was a percentage of the profits. Mm. Jordan, how did you figure out he did it? Well, first of all, Lefty was an electrician. Fixed radios. He also had invented a combination screwdriver and solder. Jordan, iron. keep it simple. Oh, I will, Sam. He went to those places and did a little work on a light switch. A couple of drops of solder in the right place. And he put a penny behind the fuse to keep it from burning out when the short developed. All the owner had to do was to turn out the lights, lock up the joint, go someplace where he'd have a perfect alibi. After a while, the short would develop, and the penny behind the fuse kept it from burning out. And there you have it. Fire. Cause unknown. Hmm. 
Well, you still haven't told me why you knew he would be here at the tamarine. Mm, it's the pattern, Sam. Lefty's sparring partner, Benny, must have caught on to him. So after Lefty knocked Benny out, he fixed the light switch in the dressing room, put the penny behind the fuse, turned off the lights, closed the door, and left. Perfect alibi. But the tambourine, George. Well, that follows, Sam. He'd fixed the light switch in my bedroom. I'd come in and figure I'd forgotten to turn the light off. Finally, I'd turn it off and go to bed. Then when I was asleep, the short would develop. No tambourine, no Jordan. Up in flames. Up in flames. <laughs> you don't miss a bet, do you, Jordan? I wondered what you were doing in Gos Gimlick's back room tonight. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was produced, written, and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Del Monte Foods brings you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Go around the front way, will you? The tambourine's open. The front door, I said. Rocky, let me in. All right, just cut out the pounding. Scrappy Sims. Rocky, help me. What's the matter with you? I can't. I... Here, I... open this couch. Now, easy does it. Oh, thanks, Rocky. Uh, yeah, bullet wound. That what it is? Yeah. I'll get help. Just give me that package. Oh, no, 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 Rocky. Oh, easy, fella. You're all right here. No, the, the beetle. The what? Tell me, Scrappy, what are you trying to say? Nobody gets the white beetle. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Yes, Del Monte, the best-liked brand of canned fruits and vegetables in the whole wide world, takes you now to the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The White Beetle. The heat had settled down over Cairo that afternoon. A good time for me to catch a nap in my tambourine office. That's when the big pounding had come at the alley door, like a wild horse put in the wrong stall. I'd no sooner got the door open than he came staggering in. Scrappy Sims. Somebody I hadn't seen in quite a while. And the bullet hole in his side wasn't doing him any good. I put him on the couch, but he clung to a package in his hand and kept mumbling something that didn't make sense. Beetle. No, no, Rocky. What about it, Scrappy? Clear it up, will you? The white beetle. Now, listen to me. Who shot you and why? You gotta tell me what happened. Rocky. Scrappy, listen to me. Scrappy. Uh, get me the emergency hospital. Rush it. Uh, emergency. Rocky Jordan, Cafe Tambourine. There's a man here that shot up bad. Get an ambulance over here the quickest way you can. I'll explain when you get here. Now, step on it. My next call was meant for Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. But I didn't finish dialing. Make that call later, Mr. Jordan. I turned and saw her standing right behind me. She was small and olive-skinned with dark, deep-set eyes. And lips held as tight as her white dress that fit every bit right. There was no fear there at all. Maybe because of the gun she held in her hand. Later, I said. Put down the phone as I told you. Hasn't anybody used the front door? I'm not here for pleasure, Mr. Jordan. Unless you like playing with guns. This is hardly a game. I'm doing only what is necessary. Like finishing up your job on Scrappy Sims? You're much too hasty with your conclusions. Just don't touch him, lady. I'm telling you, leave him alone. I'm interested only in what he holds in his hand. Get it for me. Oh, Scrappy wouldn't like that. Get it for me and don't open it. Huh? It's all yours. Lay it on the table and then keep back. Hey, uh, by the way, what good is a white beetle? No good to you, Mr. Jordan, I assure you. Now, be careful that you stay just where you are. 
This man's misfortune is quite enough for one day. I'm convinced. Sounds like you better get moving. But don't follow me. I'll shoot you if I have to. She was out of sight before the ambulance pulled up. I got my call through to Sabaya, and then I stuck around to answer some questions and stay with Scrappy Sims until they took him away. After that, I went to headquarters and briefed Sam on everything that had happened. He took it all down. As always, Jordan, you give me little to go on. Well, maybe Scrappy will be able to tell you the rest, Sam. You have not told me of your acquaintance with him. Mr. Customer I'd gotten to know real well. A construction worker of some sort. He hadn't been around to... Hey, just a moment. Yes? Yes, go on. I see. No, that is all for now. Thank you. Jordan, I have sad news for you. Scrappy Sims is dead. Yeah, I'm not much surprised. So now it becomes a problem of murder. You are certain that he said nothing more to you? All I could get was the white beetle. It had something to do with that package he had. What could it mean, Sam? Who can say? Of course, an Egyptologist who might have a theory. Well, the sacred beetle? Oh, you're reaching. No, perhaps, Jordan, perhaps. But such an insect was once a thing of worship in Egypt. Venerated as a type of sun god through the known history of the pharaoh. Sure, sure. All very interesting. Yes, I fear that we digress. Uh, about the girl now, Jordan. Who took the package from uh, Scrappy Sims? You do not know who she is. No, Sam, but if I see her again, I'll know. Yes, what is it now? Bannister? John Bannister. Inquiring about Scrappy Sim? Oh, very well. Send him in at once. Want me out, Sam? No, Jordan. I prefer that you remain. Captain, I'm sorry to be so impatient, but this is important. Very important. Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Bannister. Oh, Mr. Bannister, this is Mr. Jordan. Hello, Mr. Bannister. How do you do, Mr. Jordan? Captain, you must help me see Scrappy Sims. What do you know of this? Why, nothing, except that I heard just a short time ago he'd been shot. I can't believe it. Nevertheless, it is true. I went to the hospital as soon as I could, but they wouldn't let me see the boy. I'm asking you to help me, Captain. I fear that it would do you no good. But you must understand he's my dearest friend. He's almost like a son to me. Mr. Bannister, I regret then to inform you that Scrappy Sims is dead. Dead? Oh, but that's impossible. But we can hope that you might help us find the answer. Why, yes, anything. Did you know that young Sims was back in Cairo, Mr. Bannister? Yes, he'd been on a construction job up the Nile. New irrigation dam. You were with him? No, I have other work here. But why these questions? Don't you know anything? Only that after being shot, he made his way to Mr. Jordan's cafe. Well, then he must have told you something, Jordan. Nothing I haven't told the police. Sam, if that's all for me, I'll... That is all, Jordan. However, I would like to talk further with Mr. Bannister. Well, Sam was carrying the ball, so I went back to my own problems at the tambourine. Only the memory of Scrappy Sims stayed with me. I had a strong feeling a lot more was to come. And it happened that way when a stocky man with close-clipped hair and his young shadow invited themselves into my office without the formalities. Mr. Jordan, I am Dr. Eric Kleberg. This is my dutiful son, Hans. All right, Kleberg and son, what do you want? We want to know where it is. Well, what is it? We must be more specific, Hans. The scarab, Mr. Jordan. Scarab? Oh, sure, the white beetle. The same. And you do know. Scrappy Sims brought it here and it was not seen again. Do we get it, Mr. Jordan? Maybe. Just tell me why you should have it. Man likes to know those things. A fair bargain. Very well, I will tell you. We are wasting our time, Potter. Patience, Hans. Look, if you two'd like to argue this outside... Mr. Jordan, a short time ago, while working in an excavation on an irrigation project up the Nile, Scrappy Sims uncovered this scarab of the white beetle. Because of its size and remarkable preservation, he realized its value and brought it into Cairo, seeking a buyer. And I take it he found one? Through a friend, I contacted him at the Silvestri ceramic shop in Old Cairo. He showed me the scarab. I, too, realized its value. The finest example of the 18th dynasty. What about the law, Kleberg? It says Scrappy should have turned it over to the government. They'd have paid him. A nominal sum, yes. But he wanted more, and I was willing to pay it. You know, they call that black market. Regardless of that, I advanced him 2,000 pounds. And now the scary, please. There's just one little hitch, Kleberg. I haven't got it. Then where is it? 
I wouldn't know. Mr. Jordan, you might as well know that my son and I are fully armed. Oh, yes, the guns show through your coats. So maybe you put the bullets in Scrappy Sims, huh? I told you that talking was a waste of time, father. A man must listen to his son. We will find it then. And quickly, Hans. Yes, sir. Give it up, Junior. You won't find it that way. We shall soon see. And if we do not find it here, and we learn that you have lied, we shall return to try another way. Make very sure of that, Mr. Jordan. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Springtime's just around the corner. Yes, and with fine weather ahead, a man's fancy turns to thoughts of sports and baseball and things to do in the garden. And the women, well, they're thinking of snacks and sandwiches and picnics and things. Yes, Larry, and chances are they'll be thinking about catsup, too. Del Monte catsup. Seems as if there's nothing like its zippy, zesty flavor to make hamburgers and cold meats or a plain sandwich perk right up and come to the party. So many things taste so much better with Del Monte catsup. You see, that hearty, spiced tomato flavor of Del Monte catsup gives just the right lift to plain foods. And that marvelous flavor doesn't just happen. Del Monte takes red, luscious, field-ripened tomatoes, simmers them down with fragrant spices, and blends them all together with that wonderful new ingredient, pineapple vinegar. No other vinegar coaxes out all the very best tomato flavor the way pineapple vinegar does. And Del Monte catsup is the only catsup made with pineapple vinegar. Larry, every homemaker wants to know about price, too. So be sure to say that for all its goodness, Del Monte catsup actually costs less than many other quality brands. So catsup fans, get set for good eating. Enjoy Del Monte catsup soon. <laughs> And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The White Beetle. Well, Dr. Eric Kleberg and his dutiful son kept it up till they'd made my office look like a bargain basement after a dollar sale. They didn't find the White Beetle scarab because it wasn't there. Then they were gone. Right away, I started across town for Old Cairo to look in on Silvestri's ceramic shop. I got there before closing time. It was the usual dusty place, cluttered with every gym crack that ever lured an unsuspecting tourist. A little white-thatched Italian whose jaw muscles twitched too much came hurrying up. Could I help you, senor? Yes, if you're the proprietor here, Mr. Silvestri. That's my name. What could I show you, please? Well, let's start with the white beetle. It is... White beetle? If you mean scarab, senor, I got none in white. They're quite rare, but... Well, I... let's talk about Scrappy Sims. He brought it here to sell. Remember now? Sims? Sims? Oh, there's so many come. Sure, I... sure. All the best black market trade, huh? Who set up the deal here between Scrappy and Kleberg? Was it you? Senor, who sent you here? Dr. Eric Kleberg? Well, then there must be some mistake. Now, if that is all, senor, I, I am about to lock up for the night. All right, all right. We'll make it later. I turned to go, figuring to file Silvestri under active. That's when my eyes caught a big mirror on the side wall that reflected through the door to the back room. And the face I saw there sent me running back. No, not that way, senor! Senor! It was the face of the girl, the same one who'd come to my cafe that afternoon to take the package from Scrappy Sims. This time, she had no time to do anything. Mr. Jordan, Don't no. try for the gun this time, lady. Let me go. Stop with this, senor. What is Maria to you? Oh, so Maria's the name, huh? What's the last one, Silvestri? Yes, she's my daughter. Now, what's the meaning of this? It's nothing, Father. Well, we'll see what your purse says. Give it to me. Give it back to me. Not Mr. on your Jordan. life. Uh, have a look, Silvestri. A nice shiny 32. Marie. Father, you don't understand. But Captain Sabai will understand. He wants very much to see you. Come on. I go with you, Marie. No, please stay here, Father. Yeah, that's right. Stay here, Silvestri. They'll come when they want you. Jordan, what is the meaning of this? Yes, Captain. Let Mr. Jordan explain. 
He knows so much more than I. Quickly, Jordan, who is this girl? Maria Silvestri. She's all you want, Sam. Do I understand that this is the one who was at your cafe? One and the same. The whole answer to Scrappy Sims' murder, sealed and delivered. Is this true, Miss Silvestri? It is not. I've never killed anyone. Jordan, this is a serious accusation, one which must have good proof. All right, here it is. The gun, right out of her purse. Is this all you bring? What else do you want, Sam? Pictures? Jordan, you come dragging a girl into my office on a charge of murder and you call this evidence. Then you call it. This gun is a thirty-two. Scrappy Sims was killed by a forty-five. You didn't tell me. Nor did you ask me. Very well, that is all, Miss Sylvester. Oh, wait a minute, Sam. What is it now, Jordan? She stole the package with a white beetle from Scrappy. That's enough to hold her. You say it was the white beetle that she took? But are you quite sure? Sure as anyone could be. And are you willing to swear to it? That what she took was not hers and that it was the white beetle? Well, no, Sam, I'm not. But... Surely you know that we deal with facts here. And until you have them, I do not intend that you further embarrass this department. You are at liberty, Miss Silvestri. I knew my mistake, so I got out in a hurry. It looked like Maria couldn't have fired the shot that killed Scrappy Sims. So if I was ever to get back in Sam's good graces, I had to dig up the whole story. The John Bannister I'd met in Sam's office might shed some light. So I looked up his apartment address and paid him a visit. Mr. Jordan, I deeply appreciate what you're trying to do to get to the truth of this affair. You knew Scrappy pretty well, didn't you, Mr. Bannister? Yes, very well. There were close family ties. But no dealings with him in your line of work? No, there's no connection with my work. Not that I mind your asking. No, skip it. You never saw the scarab he brought back from up the Nile? Scarab? Oh, he called it the White Beetle. Oh, yes. Captain Sabaya questioned me about that. No, Scrappy never mentioned it. Then maybe you can give me something in his relationship with a ceramic dealer named Silvestri and his daughter, Maria. Yes, he did mention a deal with Silvestri. What kind? He didn't say, except that it was something, something that would lead to money. Sure. He was handling the sale of the White Beetle for Scrappy. Then it seems that Sylvester's quite deeply involved in this. Yeah. You wouldn't know where I could find a guy named Kleberg. I'm afraid not. Who is he? The buyer. Well, thanks, Mr. Bannister. I'll keep trying. I spent some time looking around for Kleberg without any lead. Then it occurred to me that finding the relic itself might smoke out the right people. Maria had taken it, and her father's shop would be a good place to hide it. I got there around 10 o'clock. There was a nightlight in back, and the front door was barred. I tried the lock on the back door, and it was easier. In a couple of minutes, I was inside the back room, about to move on to the front. But what I saw on the floor in the dim light stopped all that. It was Silvestri, his hair not all white now. A forty-five revolver was still clutched in his hand. The bullet hole was in his right temple. Jordan, have you forgotten that you were already wrong once tonight? All right, Sam, but that doesn't make it happen again. The bullet which killed Silvestri is from a forty-five revolver, such as you saw clutched in his own hand. I have no doubt that ballistics will report that the bullet was fired from that gun. With that, you close the books and call it suicide. It is all quite obvious. After killing Scrappy Sims, Silvestri took the easy way out by taking his own life. Only you've left a blank space. Why would Silvestri want to kill Sims? Will you come in here, please, Miss Silvestri? Please sit down. Whatever you wish, Captain Sapphire. Now, I want you to tell Mr. Jordan everything as you told it to me, beginning with the time Scrappy Sims approached your father with his scheme. He asked my father, with his knowledge of ceramics, to make an imitation of a white antique scarab. A phony? That's right. My father used a genuine scarab as his model. Sims was to make believe that he'd found the imitation while he was digging, and he would say it was real. The plan was to contact Dr. Eric Kleberg and sell it to him at a good price. With your father making all the arrangements? Yes. My father needed the money very badly, so he agreed. It wasn't until after the imitation had been made that I found out, and, and, and then I knew my father had done a very foolish thing. Continue. What did you do then? I tried to make amends by getting the imitation back from Scrappy Sims before the damage was done. But I was too late. The contact had already been made with Kleberg. Sure, and he'd made a 2,000-pound down payment. 
That complicated things. As she will tell you, Jordan. I saw Sims leave the scar- leave with the scarab this afternoon. He seemed very excited, so I followed him. A short distance from the cafe, I heard a shot. I, I didn't see who fired it. Sims was wounded, but he kept on going until he reached your cafe. And you showed up conveniently to get it away from him. Believe what you like, Mr. Jordan. I took it only to keep my father from being brought into this killing. Is it not clear to you now, Jordan? No, not all of it, Sam. You yourself told me that Sylvester had seemed nervous and despondent. And rather than bring his daughter into this mess, he took what seemed to him the only possible cause. So that's what you think. Well, I don't. And if I were a man such as you, I'd find out who killed my father and then Miss I... Sylvester, you must learn to face that which is obvious. Well, to you it is, Sam. Only where's the phony scarab? It's hidden in my home. If you wish me to get it for you, I will, Captain Sabai. I will trust you to bring it here, and as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, mind if I go with us, Sam? If you like, Jordan. I'm sure that Miss Sylvester will appreciate your company. Maria and I went out together. She didn't seem to care one way or the other. We caught a taxi that took us to her home in the Italian sector. There wasn't much conversation until I paid the cabbie, and we were going up a walk to the house. Maria... It happens I don't think your father committed suicide. It's difficult to know what you think, Mr. Jordan. I don't think he killed Scrappy Sims. No, he did not. Sam Sabaya doesn't think so either. Didn't you hear what he said himself? Oh, sure. The quick answer. When Sam acts like that, you can be sure he's thinking a lot more. Now he's a real careful guy. You know him better than I do. Just a minute. Here's the scarab, Mr. Jordan. Take it. Yeah. Your father did a real good job with this. He was an artist at his trade. Now, please... Wait, Maria. I got an idea. I'm going to take this and do some checking. But the captain's waiting. Well, he'll always settle for answers. There may be a lot more to this than we figure, Maria. Isn't there enough trouble with Sabai already? You said you'd like to know who killed your father. That still go? You know it does. But who could it be? Somebody who wanted the scarab real bad, maybe. Kleberg? He's a good bet. You wait here, Maria. By then, Maria was all for it, like I knew she'd be. She promised to wait. I was out on my own. In another half hour, I was pounding at the door of my friend, Professor Menouf, whose home was just off the campus of the Cairo University. A servant finally let me in, and I waited in Menouf's library until he came down, still pulling a robe around him. (laughs) The impatience of you Americans, Mr. Jordan. (laughs) What can it be this time? There's something that might interest you, Professor. Look this thing over, will you? Why... A scarab, white and excellently preserved. Unless it's a phony. That's what I want to know. I see. A a few tests will tell. If you will kindly remain here a moment. Professor Manuf took the scarab with him to another room, and I kept busy till I found a science who's who on his library shelf. I thumbed through the K's, and finally there the name was. Kleberg, Dr. Eric. University of Munich, University of Ankara. Authority on archaeology and antiquities. And I had all I wanted. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan, do you realize what you have here? Don't bother to tell me. I know now. This is a real scarab. It is absolutely genuine. Sure. Kleberg knew way too much about antiquities to offer to buy a phony. He knew he was going to get the real article. A remarkable specimen. 18th dynasty, I would say. There is only one like it in the Cairo Museum. Now, you better look there again, Professor. One of the museums a phony. What? Oh, you, you cannot be serious. Yeah. Scrappy Sims had it all figured. To get Sylvester to make a phony. But what he didn't tell Sylvester was that he had a further plan. That somebody else was in on the deal. I fear that I do not understand what you are saying. Somebody who switched the real one with the phony in the museum. So Scrappy could sell this one, the real one, to Kleberg. It, should I know what you are talking about, Mr. Jordan? Well, yeah, just find out about that one in the museum. You can read the rest in the morning papers. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. Have you ever been out in the field when the tomatoes are ripening? Ever seen a big red tomato so ripe it fairly begs to be picked? Then you know just how taste-tempting a tomato really can be. How wonderfully rich and full-bodied and satisfying the juice is. But if you've never had that experience, then the closest thing to it is Del Monte tomato juice. Yes, the real test of a tomato juice is how fresh and natural it tastes. 
That's why I keep several cans of Del Monte tomato juice on hand at all times. It is so fresh-tasting and natural-tasting. Dad, the children, the whole family enjoy it so much for its refreshing, clean taste. Yes, that's Del Monte tomato juice, all right. Fresh-tasting, natural-tasting, and refreshing. Pressed from the finest vine-ripened tomatoes. Packed fast under the closest quality control. It all means extra enjoyment for you. At breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or any time during the day, you'll find Del Monte tomato juice really hits the spot. Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. I left Professor Minoff's library knowing two more things. That the scarab that had already brought death to two people was genuine, and that Dr. Kleberg knew it was real when he moved to buy it. Now I was on my way for the clincher, and I didn't have to go far. I was being real careful of the dark steps to the street. Jordan. You like the dark? Lay the scarab down carefully, then go quickly. I don't see you, and I don't see a gun. Nevertheless, we're both here. I'm giving you your chance, Jordan. Even when I know who you are? John Bannister? Oh, that does make a difference. I had to guess the gun, too. Forty-five. You still haven't done what I told you. Ready to tell me where you work now? How about the Cairo Museum? In a trusted position, maybe. Where you'll have plenty of chance to switch stuff around. Mr. Jordan, I'd hate for the professor to have to find your body lying on his doorstep. But you didn't hesitate to kill your close friend, Scrappy Sims. Why? Because he found out he was playing with something too hot? Could he have gotten scared and started for the police? What should concern you is that he's dead. Sure. First Sims and then Silvestri. So the truth about the phony white beetle scarab had never been known. I could hardly stop now. Yeah, then you're going to be real busy. Maria knows. So does Professor Minuth. And you, Jordan. So I'll begin at once. The shot had come from the shadow of the wall. The next one was equally wild. As the figure of a small girl, that of Maria Silvestri, darted away down the street, Bannister swung around, yeah. taking careful aim. I took it from there. I came down on his hand, and a heavy gun clattered to the steps. He made a dive for it, but I kicked it away. I waited for his next move, but he just stood there as the Cairo police came in from all directions. No sugar in your coffee, Jordan? No, oh, no thanks, Sam. I like to drink my coffee, not chew it. <laughs> my people have been drinking coffee in this manner for countless years. You could get used to it. Mm, maybe. Some things I'll never get used to. Such is the problem of all mankind, Jordan. Learning to accept that which Allah decrees. I'm thinking about Maria. Oh? What about her? A try for revenge. Attempted murder. Hmm. What you say puzzles me. According to the notes in my dossier on the case, Maria fired the shots at Bannister only to save your life. Is that not how it was? <laughs> I say. Let's just leave it that way, huh? What does your dossier say about uh, Bannister? You were quite right about him. He was an employee of the Cairo Museum. Mm. He has confessed to switching the relics. The true one will be returned to its place. All this over a little white beetle. Was it worth it, Sam? Well, who can say? To Bannister, perhaps. This makes sense to me. Why should it? Remember, if all people's sense of values were equal, there would be little adventure in this world. You would not like that. Would you, Jordan? <laughs> For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte catsup and chili sauce. Del Monte tomato sauce and tomato juice. And Del Monte whole peeled tomatoes. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods.
Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jane Avello as Sam Sabaya, and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Remember you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is The Perfect Witness. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Red Stands for Blood. It gets cold in Cairo at night. Friday night was particularly cold, and the tambourine was doing well. I had just put in a session at the till, and it started over to my office when Chris called me to the phone. A man was at the other end of the line, and his voice wavered like a palm tree in a windstorm. Mr. Jordan. Yeah? Hey, this is... Uh, my name is Jan Melnick. I, I wish to inquire about renting your cafe tambourine for an evening. Oh, it can be done. I'm uh, expecting to have a big party, and I thought, well, if we could get together on certain details... Well, we could certainly try. Uh, could you come to see me? My address is 207 Sharia Nazim, apartment 3. Sharia Nazim? Yes, please come. I expect you later this evening. Mr. Melnick, Mr. Melnick! Uh. It sounded phony from the beginning. The Sharia Nazim winds through the poorest section of Cairo. Well, maybe Melnick won a lottery or something and was looking for a way to celebrate, so I decided to go out and see him. 207 Sharia Nazim turned out to be a wooden apartment building with a big lean-to. It was old and dirty, and it figured to be put together by a pile of scrap wood somebody fished out of the Nile. But I'd come a long way to see Melnick, so I wasn't going back. I went inside and started down a dark, creaking hallway looking for apartment three. It finally showed at the end of the hall, and I rapped on the door. Nobody answered, and I tried again. Then a voice came floating back at me from inside the room. Yes? Who is there? Jordan. I'm looking for a Mr. Melnick. Oh, all right. Oh, come in, Mr. Jordan. I'm most pleased to meet you. He had thrown open the door to let me in. I got my first look at him. He was short and fat, and he wore a hearing aid, the battery kind. He was dressed in a tight-fitting double-breasted suit, and a packed valise stood at his side. It figured he was ready for traveling. A nervous look covered his face, but somehow, when I came in, he relaxed. Yes, Mr. Jordan. Most pleasant to meet you. Haven't I seen you around Cairo before? Uh, perhaps you have. I've been in your city for some time. Uh, street photographer, isn't that it? That is correct. Take pictures of tourists against some Cairo backgrounds and sell them the shots for a few piastres. And that is the manner in which I have made my living since the last war drove me out of my homeland. Well, business must be pretty good if you can rent the tambourine for a night. Uh, be so kind as to sit down, Mr. Jordan. I can take it standing. Uh, may I offer you a cigarette? No, thanks, but you can't turn on some more lights. That would not be wise. Uh, all right, let's get to it, Melnick. Are you or are you not going to rent my tambourine? Uh, well, uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Jordan... You're not. It's just a lot of conversation to get me out here. It was the only way in which I could get you out here to see me. I hope it has not inconvenienced you too much. Oh, no, no, no. I do this all the time. I could have come to you if I possibly could, Mr. Jordan, but it would have been most unwise for me to leave this place without you. Look, Melnick, you may have a lot of time for games. I I'm sorry, Mr. Jordan, but this is no game. This is very important to me. And, and it may be profitable to you. How profitable? I am sure that we can arrive at an agreeable figure. For me doing what? Protecting me. Ah. I'm willing to pay a reasonable sum for you to protect me on a journey to Alexandria. Look, I'm a cafe owner, not a bodyguard. For a price, could you not be bought? Maybe. Who are you hiding out from? 
That I cannot tell you as yet. And then I don't figure we can get together. But, Mr. George... I want to know who you're hiding from and what you've done. Nothing that you need to be overly concerned about. Why not go to the police? They're in the protection business. Because this is and must remain a private matter. Well, then keep it real private, Melnick, and leave me out. Just a moment, Mr. George. Yeah? I was willing to pay 50 pounds. I can double it. Sorry. M- Mr. Jordan, this is more important to me than you can imagine. I need someone like you. I need a man who I can trust. And no deal, oh. Melnick. Just isn't my racket. Yes. Yes, of course. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Mr. Jordan. I'll be most glad to pay you for any inconvenience I've put you to. Now, forget it. I'll be seeing you. I hope so, Mr. Jordan. Yes, I hope so. A pathetic look came over his face as I turned from him, and he shut the door softly behind me. I took about two steps down the hall when things began to happen. <laughs> I threw open the door and looked inside. Melnick was hugging the floor and there was a face outside the broken window. It was big and it was red. It was topped off with a flock of red hair and a beard to match. And its owner was packing a smoking gun and an ugly look. When he saw me, his free arm came up to cover his face. I saw his gun move and I ducked back into the hall as he tried for me with the bullets he had left. Then it was quiet. I looked inside. The face was gone. Nothing was there. Just Melnick lying in a pool of blood on the floor, dead. I put in a quick call to Captain Sam Sabaya, the Cairo police. After two cigarettes and a lot of questions by the assorted lodgers of the apartment house, Sam got there with Sergeant Greco and a couple of his boys. Jordan, someday you must tell me why it is you always manage to be where there is trouble. Oh, I guess it's a gift, Sam. Yes, it must be something like that. Yeah. So this is the dead man. Now that's real observant. Show more respect to the captain of police, Mr. Jordan. That is all right, Sergeant. Let him have fun while he can. Who is the dead man, Jordan? His name is Jan Melnick. He's a street photographer. Mm, hard of hearing, I see. This is somewhat of a novelty for me, a corpse with a hearing aid. Sergeant. Uh, yes, Captain. You will examine the body and the room. Jordan and I will be in the hall. Uh, yes, of course, Captain. Jordan, come outside. We have some things to talk about. Oh, go ahead, Sam. You're in charge. What were you doing out here, Jordan? Drumming up some business. Jordan, I must ask you to cooperate. But that's cooperate. it, Sam. He called me up, said he wanted to rent the tambourine for a night. When I got out here, I found out that he was a fake. He really wanted me to take a trip with him to Alexandria. What for? Bodyguard. Who was after him, Jordan? Uh, he didn't say. Are you sure he didn't say? Oh, he's off, Sam. You're getting a lot of information. I think I can give you the killer's name. Killer's... Well, this is, as you would say... A switch? Yeah. Well, Melnick called out Kafka just before he was killed. Kafka? You can supply a description of the man? All I saw was his face. Looked like a stop signal. Red hair, red beard. And you can identify him if you see him again? Yep. Very well, Jordan. I will look through our files, and if I find a picture of a man who fits your description, you will get the opportunity to identify him. All right, you do that. And let us hope for your sake... That there is such a man. And I'll be home sleeping. Oh, just one moment, Jordan. Uh, What's it now? Since you are my only witness, let us hope you manage to stay alive. (laughs) Sure, Sam. I'll work on it real hard. I made it a point to keep my promise and went home to bed over the tambourine. I slept sound, but not for long. The light in my eyes that woke me wasn't coming from the window. It was still dark outside. It was the ceiling light. I wondered how I'd fail to turn it off. About then, I decided I was dreaming. And not a bad dream. She stood at the foot of my bed, looking at me with dark brown eyes. Her black hair was drawn slickly back from her slim face. Her lips were firm but full. I approved of the rest of her, too. All but the black automatic she held in her hand. I... I won't trouble you but a moment, Mr. George. Uh, manners, lady. We haven't been introduced. Here's your robe. Get up. Not that it matters, but just how did you get in here? That's beside the point. Look, I always wake up in a bad humor. Just what do you want? A photographic negative. You unlocked the wrong door, lady. Doesn't this gun convince you that I'm serious? Now get it for me, and quickly. Supposing I have it, uh, where did I get it? From Jan Melnick, of course. Melnick? I see. I'm quite sure he gave it to you. I didn't kill Melnick. I'm quite aware of that. 
I suppose you try waking up a man with a red beard named Kafka. I am interested only in you, Mr. Jordan. Are my eyes lighting up? I believe you understand me. Why would Melna give me a negative? What's this all about? I didn't come here to answer questions. Mr. Jordan, I'm becoming very impatient for the last I time. I haven't got it. I think you're lying. Well, come back in the morning. We'll have a cozy chat. Mr. Jordan, what are you doing? Opening the door. So long, lady. Not yet, Mr. Jordan. Ooh. Her pistol handle had come down over my right ear. My eyes looked at each other, and I went back to sleep for quite a while. But no more dreams. Only a loud ringing in my ears that got louder and louder. I reached out to shut off the alarm clock, and all I found was the edge of the rug. I was still on the floor. The ringing continued. I finally got up and stumbled over to the table. It was all I could do to lift the receiver from the hook. Yeah? Did I wake you up, Mr. Jordan? Who is this? My name is Kafka. Oh, I thought so. Sabaya is slowing down. I figured he'd have you by now. In the morning newspaper, I have been reading the things you have been saying about me. Well, if they're good, they're lies. They say I have killed a man named Melnik. They got it right. They say also that a man named Rocky Jordan saw me. <laughs> that is most unfortunate for this man. Yeah, you're telling me. It means he loses a lot of sleep while a redhead yaks at him on the phone. It means that such a man who tells such tales makes life uncomfortable for Kafka. So, what's he going to do about it? Kafka suggests that uh, if suddenly this man Jordan's memory fails and he can no longer identify the man who killed Melnik, then uh, this man Jordan may find himself somewhat richer. That no, doesn't appeal. I'm getting tired of money. I will give you a moment to reconsider. It's a waste of time. You also took a couple of shots at me, Kafka. That doesn't make us friendly. Jordan? Then I don't like getting pushed around because somebody's looking for some sort of negative I'm supposed to have. Or, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Might I suggest, Mr. Jordan, that you do not go back to sleep? I am thinking that you have such a short time to live. You should enjoy yourself. Yeah. The whole thing was beginning to irritate. I threw on some clothes and headed down to police headquarters to do a little screaming at Sabaya. It was a little after seven when I got there. As Sabaya rocked back and forth in his squeaky chair, he looked tired. It figured he'd spent the night there. Sergeant Greco stood by his side. Well, Captain, mm? look who has come to visit us. This isn't a visit, Greco. It's business. Yeah, we have some with you too, Jordan. Looks like you two boys have been hatching up something. <laughs> Jordan, Sergeant Greco and I have spent the night looking through our files to find a picture of the man you say killed Jan Melnick. Uh, yes, Mr. Jordan. Just a moment, and, Sergeant. Uh, 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 Jordan, this is the picture we found that fits the description you gave us. Look at this. Mm, sure. Is this the man? Yeah, that's the one. Red face, red beard, and hair. You are sure, Jordan? We do not want you to make a, a mistake. Oh, I'm sure, all right, Sam. Nobody else would come that ugly. There you are, Captain. I told you, Just Mr. Just a moment, uh, Sergeant. Jordan, you do not wish to change your decision that this is a photograph of the man who killed Melnick? What are you getting at? What is it you're trying to do, Jordan? But Sam... Why are you lying to us? Hey, what's going on? This is a photograph of a man who has been dead for two years. Jordan, I think perhaps that we had better keep you here until you decide... To tell the truth. You're listening to Red Stands for Blood, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Here's a quick summary of Adventure Mystery on CBS Inner Sanctum on Monday, Mr. and Mrs. North, and Mystery Theater on Tuesday. Suspense, crime photographer, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, and the FBI in peace and war on Thursdays. Gangbusters, Philip Marlowe, and Escape on Saturdays. Don't miss Mystery on CBS. And now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Red Stands for Blood. When you see a man with a gun throwing slugs your way, you have to remember what he looks like. I'd have bet my last piaster I could identify the red face, red hair, and beard of the man I saw kill Jan Melnick. 
And when Captain Sam Sabaya pulled that man's picture from the police files, I said he was the one. I was still sure of it when Sam pulled the clincher. According to police records there at headquarters, the killer I had identified had been dead for two years. I didn't like the way Sam and his number one boy, Sergeant Greco, were looking at me. Now, Georgian, perhaps you will be more careful with your information. Who killed Jan Melny? That's his picture, Sam. Mr. Jordan, Captain Sabaya just told you that man has been dead. Yeah, I heard him, Greco. What's the lowdown on Kafka, Sam? He was a native of Turkey, an international thief who would stop at nothing. Not much, I believe. What makes you so sure he's dead? I have the complete report here. Two years ago, the Turkish authorities finally caught up with him. Kafka's speeding car went off a cliff into the Bosporus. It was very deep there. They recovered the body? It was hardly necessary. I thought so. That's where they made the mistake. There has been no mistake, Jordan. Kafka doesn't think so. Now what are you trying to tell me? He just called me on the phone. Kafka knows I saw him kill Melnick. Jordan, cannot I make you understand? There's something else to think about. A black-haired dame with long eyelashes wandered up to my room last night looking for a photographic negative. She thinks Melnick gave it to me. What was his dame, uh, the, this lady's name? I don't know. But I think the negative fits into this case. Uh, and where do you suggest that we look for it? Uh, that's your problem. All I want you to do is get those two people out of my hair. You will be quite safe in one of our cells, Mr. Jones. Look, We Greco. have no reason to keep him, Greco. So now, Jordan, if that is all you wish to say... Well, what about Kafka, Sam? Let me repeat. This report on him is quite clear. I am inclined to believe it. Okay, if you don't find him, I will. I don't want him on my tail. There was a photographic negative somewhere in Cairo that was hot enough to set up a murder. Jan Melnick had died for it. I might be next. I wanted to know why. I went back to the place on Sharia Nazim where I had found him in his room. I found out two things. He had rented the room a short time before but hadn't lived in it. And he had a wife. Their home was down on the Nile waterfront in the worst part of Cairo. So I looked it up. You could call it a home if you like. It was worse than a shambles. Not fit for one of the starved dogs that roamed the dirty streets. Who is it? Mrs. Melnick? Yes. I'm Rocky Jordan. Oh, you are the man who saw my husband killed. That's right. I'm sorry, but there are a few things I'd like to ask you, Mrs. Melnick. Well, I... Won't you come in, Mr. Jordan? Please, please, please be seated. Thank you. I, I, I wish I could serve you something, Mr. Jordan, but no, you that see, that isn't I... necessary. Mrs. Melnick. You, you know Jan well. Not before he called me yesterday. I had seen him on the streets. On the streets, yes. Mr. Jordan, it, it was not always as you see here. We had a good home in Prague. I'm sure you did. Jan was a good husband, but we lost everything. After we came to Cairo, it, it was hard for him. Always he dreamed of taking me away from this. Mrs. Melnick, any idea why someone would want to kill your husband? No. Only that he said he must make a trip. He said that when he came back, there would be enough money for our old age, and there would be no more worries. And now he... You suppose he took the room on Sharia Nazim to hide out from something? It is possible. I, I do not know. Miss Melnick, your husband worked for a photographic company, didn't he? Yes. Tourist Pictures Incorporated, he told me. He ever tell you about a certain negative he wanted to protect? Negative? No. Um, what about a good-looking brunette girl with sleek hair and long eyelashes? I, I know of no such person. Did he ever mention a criminal named Kafka? A criminal? No, Mr. Jordan. Jan was a good man. He, he worked hard. Sure, I know. Being hard of hearing must have made it difficult, too. What do you mean, Mr. Jordan? My husband was not deaf, not at all. I see. Now, Mrs. Melnick, there are a few of your husband's effects down at police headquarters. I wonder if you'd like to get them. Oh, yes, yes, I, I, I do want them. Well, then suppose we go down now. I'll take them. Uh, you're most kind, Mr. Jordan. Uh, will you wait a moment while, while I get ready? Surely, I'll be right outside. I went down a few steps and looked out across the river. I never know why, but in a split second, I glanced back to see the flash of a knife. It clipped my ear and sailed out into the Nile. When I saw where it came from, I saw red. All red, face, hair, and beard. 
and Kafka came from my throat. I was braced for him, and we rolled together across a narrow landing and into the river. I was underneath, and he held me there in the shallow water. My hand found his beard, and I dragged him down with me. He couldn't take it too long. His fingers loosened, and we were up. I hung onto his beard and flailed away at his ugly face. Then he slipped loose, and his boot heels sunk in below my stomach. When I came up, Kafka was halfway up the bank and running. Get a good look at that guy, Mrs. Melnick. He's the guy who killed your husband. I saw him. He was trying to kill you. Yeah. All right, now, let's keep our date at headquarters. Up the hill away, we caught a taxi. And in 30 minutes, we got out at headquarters. Captain Sabaya wasn't there, but Sergeant Greco sat behind the desk. Well, Mr. Jordan, been swimming in the Nile? Uh, for once in your life, you're right, Greco. Never mind the small talk. We came to get Jan Melnick's effects. Why should I give them to you? Easy, Greco. This is Mrs. Melnick. Jan Melnick's wife. Oh, uh, I am at your service, madam. Sergeant Greco, my husband had only a few things, but can I have them now? Your identification, Mrs. Melnick. Look, Greco, I'll identify her. Like you identified Kafka's picture, Mr. Jordan? Uh, will, uh, will this letter do, Sergeant Greco? Uh, let me see it. Very well. Now, will you sign here, please? Okay, now get it, Greco. Cut the stall. Uh, one moment. Here you are, Mrs. Melnick. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Greco. Thank you. But wait, this... Come on, Mrs. Melnick. Let's get out of here. She put her husband's effects in a little bag she was carrying, and I hurried her out. None of the stuff looked worth bothering about, but I didn't want Greco sniffing around. I took her down the street a ways, and then we stopped. Uh, Mrs. Melnick, do you mind if I see those things now? If you wish, Mr. Jordan. These, uh, these did belong to your husband, didn't they? Oh, yes, yes, the watch, and, and, and... But this, this is not his. What is it? It's a hearing aid. He was wearing it when I saw him last. Jan had no need for this, I... Let's have a look. What are you doing, Mr. Jordan? He had some reason for wearing this, Mrs. Melnick. Maybe something inside. Yeah. What is it? It's a negative. But, but it, it is so tiny. Uh, it's microfilm. Uh, too small to make out anything. Will you take it to the police? Uh, let Greco get it. I'll I find out what this is all about. Miss Melnick, suppose you go to my cafe temporary. If you wish, Mr. Jordan, but, but why? Just wait for me there. When I see you again, I figure I'll be able to explain everything. You're listening to Red Stands for Blood, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Mystery ranks high at CBS. Here's an example. Tomorrow night at 9, the door creaks open on the inner sanctum and a story told the way you want to hear it. Suspenseful, exciting, and with a sound plot. Don't miss Inner Sanctum tomorrow, Monday night at 9, on your CBS station. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Red stands for blood. That tiny bit of microfilm had the answers, and I had to find a photographic shop to see what they were. And why not the place where Jan Melnick had worked? Tourist Pictures, Incorporated. I located the place on a side street off Solomon Pasha Square. As I went in, I saw a face start from behind the curtains in back. A slim face with dark eyes, framed by sleek black hair. She was just as pretty and just as scared as the night before. I got back there on the double. Ah. No gun this time, lady? I, I don't have it now, Mr. Jordan. I didn't get your name. I'm Marta Helwig. Now let's have some more answers. Why are you here? Returning the visit, maybe. You left in a hurry last night. Oh, Rocky, I, I'm sorry. I didn't want to hurt you, but I had to. Sure, they always have to. Believe me, Rocky. I didn't shoot. I could have. Oh, forget it. My head's clear enough now. You were looking for a photographic negative, Marta. Yes, I must find it. Why? If I don't, I'll be killed. By a redhead named Kafka? 
Yes. Yes, Rocky. If you know anything Here, about... Here, take a look. This the one? Why, perhaps. I, I don't know. Where'd you get it? From where Melnick hid it? Oh, Rocky, please let me have it. I'll do anything, Rocky. Anything. Yeah, no deals till I see what's on it. You got a projector here? Yes, over here. All right, turn it on. All right, Rocky, but we've got to hurry. Yeah, wait a little bit of focus. Rocky, that's the one. Taken in front of the Grand Theater. Who's the Egyptian? I don't know, but you see who's in back. Sure, no surprise at all. It's Kafka. Yeah, but he looks a little surprised. You understand now, Rocky. Yeah, everything. Jan Melnick just happened to snap this picture, and Kafka was in it by accident, along with the date of the next picture showing at the theater. So he's located in Cairo, date and all. That's right. When Melnick developed the negative, he must have recognized that ugly face. So he put it on microfilm and planned to get it to Turkey, where there was a price on Kafka's head. Only Kafka found out. Where do you fit? Well... Kafka came to me, offering me a price if I would get the negative and return it. Seemed the easy way for him. That bump in my head didn't pay off, Mother. But, Rocky, that wasn't all. He said if I didn't get it for him, that I needn't plan my breakfast for this morning. You see now why I was desperate. Did he show up? No, not yet. But now we can give it to him. No, and... nothing doing. Get your coat, Mother. Oh, please, Rocky. Get it. We're going to Sam Sabaya to prove that Kafka's alive. All right, Rocky. I'll be right back. Now, just take this film. Just leave it there, George. Huh? Leave it in the projector. I will get it. Kafka. Yes, now get back. I use a pistol better than a knife. You showed up a little too late. <laughs> in time to get what I want. Mission accomplished, huh? No, not yet. I warned you to lay off, Jordan. You know too much. Now what do I get? This, Jordan. I braced for the slug, but it didn't come. Kafka just looked at me. His gun dropped from his hand, and he went limp, like the hump on a starving camel. Marta stood in the doorway, the color gone from her dark eyes. Oh, I see you found your gun again. Yes, I found it. Who was it for, Kafka or me? Does it make any difference now? No, no. Now you're in the clear now, baby. You can relax. Suddenly she did, but I got to her before she slid to the floor. From then on, things were more pleasant. When she was steady again, we paid Sam Sabaya a visit. He was real pleased. But Greco wasn't because he got the job of taking care of Kafka. I made a date with Marta to meet her later, and then Sam and I went to the tambourine where Mrs. Melnick was waiting. So... So that is what Jan was trying to do. But why? Mrs. Melnick, your husband had only the highest motives in his effort to get Kafka's photograph to the Turkish authorities. He knew he was asking for trouble. He figured the risk was worth it. For your sake, Mrs. Melnick. Unfortunately, he was dealing with a desperate criminal. The whole affair is most regrettable. However... There is one consolation. Yes? The Turkish government had a price of 1,000 pounds on Kafka's head. I am sure Jordan will agree that the money goes to you. Of course, Sam. Kafka would never have been found if it hadn't been for Jan Melnick. Yes, that is true. I only wish he'd realized that my own comfort was not so important to me as our life together. But Jan thought only of me. He was a good man. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Two O'Clock Men. It was 
around five minutes till two o'clock in the morning. I was in bed trying to catch up on some sleep when I heard noises out front. I rolled over, ready to forget the whole thing, when the sound became too loud and too familiar. I slipped on a pair of trousers and headed for the bar. It was dark, but not empty. Somebody was playing Halloween out of season. From somewhere behind the bar, I could hear his breathing as he scratched around in my register. I moved around the end of the bar toward the short, panting breaths. Then he saw me and made a dart. Don't go in no place, buddy. Let me go! Let me go! Sure, buddy, you're going. Ow! I hit him and he crumbled like arches on a fat man. I flipped on the light to see what he looked like. He was small and wiry. He wasn't Egyptian or Arab or European, but he seemed like a mixture of all. He coughed a couple of times and then sat up. His big black eyes stared angrily at me and I could see that he was very young. You are pig! Infidel! All right, Sonny. Sorry I hit you. Come on, up on your feet. Let me go! I can get up myself. Come on, kid. What's your name? What are you doing here? My name is Joseph. And it is obvious what I do here. Yeah, I guess it is. But you're not very smart about it. People don't leave money in their cash registers at night. That's what they got safes for. Well, what do you think I ought to do with you? Whatever you wish. I am not afraid. You're too old to be spanked and too young to be slapped. You know, you ought to give up this second story work while you're still an amateur. It's got no future. I will worry about my own future. You're not very talkative, are you? I am of the sacred family of El Rakam. I do not talk to infidels. Great, but you steal from them. That is my business. It's mine, too, when you start picking the tambourine. Talk, talk. Do with me what you will and stop talking. Look, Sonny, I've seen kids like you all over the world, starting with a little petty snatching and winding up in jail. You are a pig! I... Why, you little... (laughs) You will die! Sure, we all will. Now, come on. Where do you take me? Some place where you'll have a chance to brush up on your manners. The police station. Inside half an hour, we pulled up in front of the Cairo police station and got out. Joseph, member of the sacred family of El Rakam, whoever he was, hadn't spoken. We went inside. Sergeant Greco, underling to Captain Sam Sabai, was sitting behind the desk dozing. When he heard us come in, he snapped to life real fast and became very official. Oh, Mr. Jordan, I was not expecting you. Yeah, I could see that. Did you have a pleasant dream? I was not sleeping. I was simply resting my eyes. <laughs> sure. I bet she was a brunette. Will you please show some respect for a servant of the people? <clears throat> now, what may I do for you, Mr. Jordan? You can get me Sam. Captain Sabayas had a very difficult evening. He is very tired. He is preparing to leave for his home this very moment. What may I do for him? I told you, get me Sam. Mr. Jordan, I have just I got someone I want him to meet. This boy? Yes, this boy. Now, turn up Sam for me, or do I have to go in and get him myself? What is going on out here, Sergeant? It is uh, Mr. Jordan. Jordan, what are you doing here this time of night? Business, Sam. He has uh, brought this boy for some reason. I told him, Captain, that you are too tired. Yes, 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 Sergeant. Yes, that is enough. Now... What is it you want, Jordan? Sam, I caught this boy doing a one-man floor show at the tambourine about an hour ago. Jordan, I am not interested in your entertainment problem. You will be, Sam. This kid dropped in after hours on his own. I found him scratching around my cash register. Oh, I see. What is your name, young man? You are a pig, too. I... What? Of all the... I, uh, forgot to tell you he had a nasty habit like that. Never mind. If he does not choose to talk, we can wait. Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. Lock this youth up until morning. We will interview him then. Hey, yes, Captain. Come along, boy. You do not have to push. Now, Get come along, boy. Off of me. I uh, wanted you, Sam, because I didn't want to leave the kid in Greco's hands. He's over eager. Yes, Jordan, I know what you mean. You do not like taking children to police stations, do you, Jordan? What do you think? I, I think that I am very tired. Hey, uh, he said he was a member of the sacred family of El Rakam. That mean anything to you? El Rakam. Oh, does not. But suppose we discuss this young man's family tree in the morning. Oh, but Sam... Jordan, you are concerned for nothing. This boy is what you Americans refer to as a juvenile delinquent. There there is nothing more to it. Now, please go home and get some sleep so that I may do the same. Yeah, I'll do that. Good night, Sam. I walked out of the police station and started up the street. I'd taken just about six steps when I heard it. It started from somewhere inside the police station and sounded like a cyclone on a weekend spree. By the time I'd taken a few more steps, 
The door of the police station flew open and Joseph came running out fast like a super chief on a holiday weekend. He darted toward the corner full blast and Sam and Sergeant Greco came running ten paces behind him. I followed. We were halfway to the end of the block when the kid turned the corner. The three of us stepped up our pace, turned the corner after him, and Greco pulled his gun. Before I could yell at him, the thunder broke. <laughs> kid dropped to the sidewalk and was still. When we got to him, Sam bent over to look. Joseph, member of the sacred family of El Rakam, was dead. Hold you! There was no need to shoot! Since when does the Cairo Police Department shoot down kids? But, Captain, I did not shoot the boy. What? I did not shoot him. Look, my gun. All the shells are there. It has not been fired. Uh, let me see that. Uh, that's right, Greco. All the bullets are here. There you are. Now, might I suggest, Captain, that since I did not shoot him and since you did not even draw your gun from the holster, we examine Mr. Jordan... You know I don't carry a gun, Sam. We know no such... Sergeant, Sergeant, you will call the coroner and you will arrange for the photographer to take some pictures of this scene. We will begin an investigation immediately. Yes, Captain. And you, Jordan, go home. Look, I brought the kid here. You don't wash me off that easy. Jordan, this is no affair of yours. The Cairo police will do everything possible to unearth the killer. I don't like going to bed with a dirty taste of Jordan, mouth. this is an order. Now leave at once. We, we do not need your help. Uh, maybe not. But you may be getting it anyway. <laughs> I left, headed back to the cafe tambourine, and went to bed. But I didn't sleep. The sight of Joseph, a fresh kid, crumbled in the street, stayed with me. It was a long night. I got up around nine and had breakfast. But the strange death of Joseph was like too much salt on my eggs. Along about ten o'clock, Chris, my bartender, told me there was a visitor in my office to see me. I went over and opened the door. The smell of Emir caught me. She was blonde and tall and slim, except where she shouldn't be. She was wearing a white linen suit and a white hat. And it was all there. All very nice. So... You are Mr. Jordan. I uh, didn't get your name. The name is Ilya Renault. Oh, what can I do for you? It is not what you can do for me, Mr. Jordan. It is what you have already done. I'm afraid you'll have to start over. A boy, a young boy was murdered last night. In case you don't remember, Mr. Jordan. And it seems pretty clear to me you are responsible. Hey, now, wait a minute. I will not wait for your lies and your feeble excuses. There is no alibi for murder. A boy was killed needlessly. And their blood is on your head. Hey, hold on there. I'll admit I feel at least partially responsible, and the whole thing was pretty unfortunate. Unfortunate? But... Oh, yes, unfortunate. That is your only answer. Where do you fit into this? Where I fit? Mr. Jordan, that boy, Joseph, was my brother. My half-brother. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Renault. If you had not taken poor Joseph to jail, if you had what not... What if he hadn't broken into my cafe? Have you thought of that? I'll admit the boy was wrong. Joseph was not himself. He was not a bad boy. These, these past few months, we had grown so far apart. He, he behaved so strangely. Nevertheless, you are not vindicated in having him murdered. Joseph was not shot by the police. He was not shot by me. He was killed by a person or persons unknown in the official language of the police. And I suppose that makes it all very proper look, and usual. Look, look. Both the police and I would like very much to know who killed Joseph. Captain Sabai will do everything he can to find the murderer. And you, Mr. Jordan, what about you? What are you doing? Well, I... Just as I thought, nothing. Except being sorry. Miss Renault, perhaps you have an idea who might have wanted to kill Joseph. No, I have no idea. Joseph and I were, were never that close. His father divorced my mother many years ago. Joseph's mother was an Egyptian noblewoman. For the past several years, I've been in France... Then I moved back to Cairo to take care of Joseph. Doesn't it seem strange to you that he'd turn to a robbery? That he'd break into my cafe at two o'clock in the morning? Of course it does. I told you it was not like him. I, I just cannot understand what made him do it. Uh, you're not much help. Then, then you are going to do something. You really are interested. I sort of have to be, don't I? Oh, thank you, Rocky. Please forgive me for... 
for misjudging you, for saying the things I did. <laughs> You'll hear what some other people say about me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm living at 65 Sharia Nefar. Mm. Well, I'll, uh, I'll let you know when I get something definite. She left, and later in the day, I had visitor number two. A man I wanted very much to see. His name was El Rakam. He was tall, lean, and dark. He wore purple robes and a silver chain with a fancy emblem around his neck. And he had a muscle man with him. Peace be unto you, noble sir. My card. Oh, thanks. Uh, have a seat. My assistant is known as the Turk. He will join us. Yeah, sure, Jim. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. Oh, what's on your mind? My name, as you know, is El Rakam. Master of all that is worthy. Leader of the new light. Bestower of the sacred learning. Your card doesn't say all that. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, a member of my sacred family was slain early this morning. I understand you were present at this deplorable occurrence. You would tell me how you are involved and exactly what you have done. Do I make myself clear? Joseph was one of your boys? Joseph was a member of the sacred family of Rakam. A disciple in the way of the advanced learning. You call breaking into the tambourine advanced learning? Mr. Jordan, I shall try to be patient. When a member whom I hold in high esteem dies, I must have the complete knowledge of his death. Okay, the boy was shot trying to escape the police. Only the police didn't kill him. They don't know who did. And this you call the complete knowledge? Yeah. Mr. Jordan, these facts I have learned from the police myself. I would like to know your connection, please. Also, why you found it necessary to take Joseph to jail. Look, Rakam, I've told you all I know. I'm a busy man. Maybe you better talk to somebody else. Mr. Jordan, I had hoped I would not have to come to this. However, you obviously refuse to cooperate. It is the desire of El Rakam and his followers that all matters be settled in peace. Violence is barbarian and uncivilized. Yet you force me to act. When, when El Rakam acts, the world can feel the repercussions. You're a pretty big man, Rakam, according to you. Far too big to waste your time talking to mere peasants like Rocky Jordan. Mr. Jordan, I hold you responsible for the death of a member of my family. There is no greater crime, and the punishment is quick and certain. Eat well, my word. Okay, Rakam, take your words and get out. You're disturbing my customers. As I am Rakam, leader and omnipotent head of the sacred family, as I am this and more, so shall you, Mr. Jordan, so shall you die to avenge the death of Joseph. You are listening to The Two O'Clock Man, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. If you like radio mystery, thrilling stories, exciting characters, and the kind of suspense that keeps you absorbed until the final gripping moment, you'll want to spend your radio listening time with CBS. Because at the CBS spot on your dial, you'll find that kind of mystery. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the two o'clock man. It all began when somebody shot down a kid who I had turned over to the police for breaking into my cafe tambourine. Then a couple of people showed, saying I was responsible. The kid's sister, Ilya, and a guy who called himself El Rakam. That joker was thirsting for revenge. Well, El Rakam and his silent sidekick, the Turk, made a grand-type exit out of my office. Just outside the door, they were joined by two burly-looking bodyguards who could have passed for the Tarzan twins. Then the four of them marched out of the cafe. As far as I was concerned, El Rakam, spelled backwards, was phony. And it also spelled answers to questions concerning murder. I decided to follow. It was as easy as tailing an elephant in a clothes closet. The purple robes drifted down Sharia El Reyes, turned left three blocks up, and entered the lobby of the Hotel Continental. 
The two bodyguards split off, and Elric Kahn and the Turk took the elevator to the fifth floor. I waited and caught the next car. The trail ended before a door marked 505. I was debating my next move when suddenly the door opened. Come in, Mr. Jordan. We have been expecting you. Standing in the doorway was six feet four of man, Elric Kahn's right-hand man, the Turk. I went inside. He was there alone. You were a fool to be trapped so easily, Jordan. You were led here as one might lead a sheep for slaughter. Maybe, friend. Time will tell. No, the time is now. We will teach you to murder. The big man was on top of me like a tent in a windstorm. His hands grasped at my throat and his fingers dug in. I gave him a kick and another one, but the fingers dug in deeper. I was seeing red and then blue and then purple. I brought my knee up and caught him in the belt. He rolled back from me. Then a shiny object came flying into the room. Turk doubled up, grabbed at his middle and pitched forward to the carpet. Everything got suddenly quiet, like visitor's day at the morgue. I bent over him. He was dead. Protruding from his stomach was a knife, an ordinary kitchen knife, but one I'd seen before. It was from the cafe tambourine. Oh, it was too perfect, too well set up to stick around. Everything neat and in place for Rocky Jordan to take the rap. It took me two minutes to decide where to go next. A guy named Bill Morley, a reporter at the Cairo Record, might be of some help. Inside of ten minutes, I was sitting across from him at his desk. Nothing but trouble when you walk in here, Rocky. What's up? You know most of the characters in this town, Bill. I need some information about one of them. Yeah. Name's uh, El Rakam, the sacred family of Rakam. You know him? You know him? I wouldn't touch him with a ten-foot pole. He's dynamite. Oh, why? Look, Rakam arrives in town a couple of months ago. One of the papers gets a front-page interview with him. They play him for all he was worth. And what happened? Rakam slapped a million-dollar libel suit on him. And he'll probably collect. He well, doesn't like publicity? Wants no interference at all. Not like the rest of these phonies who do anything to get their photos on a big spread. This guy works in the dark, and he does better that way. And that's all you know about him? Well, what he's got isn't a new religion or even vaguely connected with it. It's pure mystic and pure hokum. He just talks to the customers and they shell out. They never know what hit him. That good, huh? The two o'clock man is darn near perfect. What'd you call him? Two o'clock man. That's what the papers have labeled him. He holds his meetings in an old temple at two o'clock in the morning. Nobody has anything on him? Well, just once. They got a picture of him and a kid during a riot in Alexandria a few months ago. Cop was killed. El Rakam had a gun. That sounds almost too good. What happened to it? Yeah. Take a look yourself. You'll see why nothing happened. Ah, I see what you mean. Everything about it points to El Rakam. Except he happened to have his back turned. Sure, it's Rakam, all right, but you can't see his face. And no court in the world would count that photo as evidence. Uh, what about the kid in the picture? Well, that's Joseph, the kid who was shot the other night. You knew him. Yeah. How about letting me borrow this photo, huh? Just for a day, I'll, I'll bring it back. Sure, it's no good to me. Oh, excuse me, Rocky. Sure. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah? What's that? The Turk? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, yeah, I'll be right there. One of our reporters calling in a story. Elric Combs, right-hand man, a guy named the Turk, has just been knifed in the Continental Hotel. Really? Yeah, you want to come down with me and take a look? No, no, I'll buy a paper. Uh, thanks for the photo, Bill. Oh, and by the way, if I should happen to run into the murderer, I'll let you know. It was after 11.30 when my taxi pulled up in front of a small sandstone apartment house on Shari and Afar. Ilya Renault's apartment was 2C, and it took a little while for the door to come open. Rocky, what, what are you doing Let here? me in, Ilya. I want to talk to you. Oh, no, 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 Rocky, I can't. I, I've heard on the radio the police are looking for you. If I let you come in, I would have to phone Ilya, you. Ilya, listen. The police are looking for me. It's all tied in with Joseph's murder. Now, there's some things you'll want to know. About Joseph? You, you found out about Joseph, Rocky? I didn't say that. Please, let me in, Ilya. No, but, Rocky, I'm not dressed. I, I've been asleep. Oh, oh, very well. Just a moment. Uh, you may come in now. Rocky. Rocky, did you have to lock it? Ilya, I think I know why Joseph was killed. Yes? He was mixed up in a phony cult racket. 
Now, the head of this outfit is named El Rakam. He took Joseph on as one of his assistants. El Rakam? I think I've heard Joseph mention that name. El Rakam has been bilking the local citizens for some time now. He tells them he's giving them a new way of life or some such. In the meantime, they're giving him their dough. And and Joseph was connected with this? Uh, Joseph was on the inside until last night. Maybe he decided to quit. I don't know. That's my guess. Rakam couldn't let him, undoubtedly, because the kid knew too much about Rakam's activities. Then, then Rakam murdered my brother. Either that or he had one of his followers do it, which is more likely. Rakam had an assistant named the Turk. I think he's our man. The Turk? But, but this is the man the police say you killed, Rocky. Right. Rakam or somebody planned it that way. They get rid of the Turk and me at the same time. William, here, I want you to take a look at this photograph. Here. Yes. Yes, it is Joseph. And, Rocky, who is this man in the long robes? El Rakam. But here, it shows clearly the gun in Rakam's hand. No, William. It shows a man in a robe firing a gun. Another man is being shot, okay. But Rakam has his back turned. And the, there is nothing. Ilya, I think I've got a way to break Rakam. Anyway, it's worth a try. Open in the name of the law. Rocky, it is the police. Shh, shh, shh. Joseph, it's Sergeant Greco. I know you're in there. Open or I shall fire through the door. You'll do it, sir. Rocky, Rocky, the back door. If you do not open the door at once, I shall shoot away the lock. Do not be a fool, Jordan. Come peacefully. Rocky, the back door leads to an alley which will take you to the Sharia Shama. All right, Ilya. I'll see you later. Do not say that I have not won. <laughs> As Greco came through the door, I went out the window and down the alley fast. Greco yelled at me to halt, but I wasn't stopping for anything. I had a date for a showdown with a two o'clock man. You are listening to The Two O'Clock Man, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The time has come for us to help the Red Cross. Great numbers of our people are suffering from the worst cold wave in 50 years, and the suffering doesn't end with the cold. You can help by contributing to the Red Cross today. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the two o'clock man. Well, it was one o'clock when I wandered into El Rakam's temple, an hour before the big meeting, and the place was almost deserted. El Rakam's dressing room showed at the end of a dimly lit hall. I went inside and waited for him to put in an appearance. It came sooner than I expected. A few moments later, from outside the door, I heard the voice of Rakam giving instructions to a couple of his bodyguards. I ducked into the shadow so he wouldn't see me when he first came in. You can come out from your hiding place, Jordan. I know you are here. Ah. You must have your own special brand of radar. You were observed entering the temple. One of my guards has been following you all day. Don't I bother you at all? Why should you, Jordan? The police will find you and then you would no longer be any bother to me. Now say what you have come to say and leave. All right, I'll say it. You will not mind my preparing myself for tonight. Uh, never mind the gun, Rakam. The gun? I was not reaching for the gun. I was going for my makeup. Now then, uh... I'll just hold it, if you don't mind. It is yours, with my compliments. Now say what you have to say and go. You're through, buddy. That has been said to me many times before, but it has never been the case. That's all being changed. Remember the photo of you killing a cop in Alexandria? Oh, yes, that one again. The police have tried to prove with that once before that I was guilty of murder. But you see, it was a failure. My face was obscured. That's what's changed. And all because of a kid named Joseph. You see, there was another photo of you killing that cop. A photo Joseph had. But you know that, don't you? You know that Joseph had a clear picture of you killing the cop, and that's why you had to take care of the kid. If you were finished, Jordan, go. Well, what you don't know is that Joseph mailed that clear photo to his sister, Elia, before he was killed. She has it, and I just saw it. If you really had your boys tagging me, as you say, you know I just came from her house. You think I'm a fool, do you not? Look, Junior, I don't care whether you believe me or not. So by your will, and that's what counts. You're lying, Jordan. It is nothing but an attempt Think so? To okay, I'll show you. This telephone. You think the cops want me for murder, huh? I'll just pitch my murder rap against yours. 
We'll just see who the police want. Uh, hello, Captain Sabaya, please. Sam? Jordan. Now, uh, now, wait a minute. Quiet, will you, and listen. Ilya Renault is on her way over to the station right now with Joseph's photo of Rockham's killing. Yeah. That'll give you all you want. Uh, no, I'm with him now in his dressing room at the temple. <laughs> Don't worry, Sam. Looking right into his own gun. So if you want him, come and get him. Relax, buddy. It'll be a few minutes yet. Jordan, uh, uh, perhaps we could discuss this under more favorable circumstances. Not interested in talking. I'll read about it in the papers. Jordan, I, I am a wealthy man. Something could be arranged. Your forehead's getting moist. I did not kill Joseph. And you had the Turk do it, and you killed him. That does not matter. Come, let us leave here. Let us go out. Kind of anxious to get me to use that door, aren't you? Have, Could it be that you got your boys out there ready to throw a knife into me when I walk out? Jordan, this is not the place to talk. Let us step and out. I'm laying ten to one. The first guy out that door winds up with a knife in him. No, no, you are wrong. Why don't you go out? There's nothing here for you but me with a gun. And the police are on their way. I don't believe it. You didn't even call them. It was a fake. You would be too frightened to call the police since they are after... Sounds like Sam, all right. The police will never get to El Rakam. No, it is I, El Rakam, your leader, master of the Libya. Uh, 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 leader in the path of new light. Uh. Well, that was it. El Rakam got it from his own men. And that was the end of his organization. Sabaya showed up in a few moments and rounded up the knife throwers and everything was cleared up. The Turk killed Joseph on orders. Rakam killed the Turk to set me up and then his followers took care of him. It was a regular round robin. Sam wanted to know about the photo I told him about on the phone and when I said it was a gag, he didn't mind. His case was closed. Well, the only unfinished business was Ilya. I went over to her place to tell her how things worked out. Yeah, I guess it must have been a long story. It took me quite a while to tell it all. Rocky Jordan. Every once in a while, a dame walks into your life. You never know when she's going to show or how, but all of a sudden she's there. And that life of yours that went so straight before begins to wheel and turn like a racing car with a bad tire. Well, one moved into my life not so long ago. She brought with her a nice pair of legs and warm lips and dark eyes that held a story. But she brought something else. A couple of dead men. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, clouded with the smoke of oriental tobaccos, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Escapade with Paula. It was a hot night. The desert air had moved in on Cairo and hung heavily over the city like garlic over a chef's salad. The fans were working hard trying to throw a breeze but getting nothing. A couple of people were working on cold beer and a red-headed member of His Majesty's Navy sat in the corner up to his eyeballs in hard liquor. He'd wandered in looking for salt water and got into a mix-up with a bottle of gin. By 1.30, all the customers had gone except the sailor. And I decided to throw an early latch on the front door. So I had Chris help me lift him and walk him out. All right, Chris, 
Easy with him. Yeah. yeah. Come on, Red. Wake up time. Yeah, Rock Rocky, I want you to know this is the best brewing cafe in the world. Yeah, sure. And I've seen them all. Hong Kong, Calcutta, my son. That's the best brewing cafe in the world. Now walk him down the street a little, Chris, till he gets his underpinning. Yeah, all right, Rocky. And go on home. I'll lock up. Uh, right. Come on, Red. Yeah. I saw Rocky. I see you in the I went up the flight of stairs leading to my room just off a balcony overlooking the main floor. When I opened my door, I saw her. She was standing by the window looking out onto the Cairo street. She was tall and a little too thin. She turned when she heard me come in, and the light from the street lamps caught her face. It was white, accented by a pair of dark eyes, and topped off with a flock of black hair. It figured she'd make someone a swell birthday present. Mr. Jordan? What's the matter, lady? Get lost? I've been waiting for you. Well, you got the wrong place. The Café Tambourine? That's downstairs. I thought it would be better up here. I don't remember giving out with an invite. You did not? Maybe you better pick up your heels and move out the way you come in. Mr. Jordan, I came up here earlier in the evening when no one was looking. I have been waiting for you ever since. The least you could do is listen to me. Yeah, all right. Who are you? May I have a cigarette first? Sure. Thank you. All right, let's have it. My name is Paula Dupre. I am new to Cairo. Well, lots of people are. I've come here for something important. Everybody comes to Cairo for something important. Or else to get away from something important. I'm looking for somebody. There's nobody here. He's my husband. <laughs> What's the matter? You walk out one day for a loaf of bread? Something like that. He disappeared a little while ago. Well, why come to me? Because they say you know Cairo like nobody else. The police station is close. They're not interested. Well, there's always your consul. They are not interested either. Well, what makes you think I'd be? I think I can make you interested. Uh, how? I pay if you help me to find him. How much? Twenty pounds. You see my face lighting up? I'll double it. No sale. How much do you want? Sorry, lady, I'm not missing persons. Mr. Jordan, I've got to have somebody's help. You are the Who'd only Who'd you one talk can... to at police headquarters? Well, I... What about the consul? Well, you see... All right. I did not go to them. I could not. I have to find him this way. Why? I cannot tell you. Now, what say you go now, Mr. Dupre? All right. Mr. Jordan, I won't be. But I'm at the Hotel Sinbad. You may change your mind. Well, maybe, if you learn how to tell the truth. Goodbye. Oh, just a minute, lady. You always carry a gun? What do you mean? Next time, don't put it in a cloth bag. It shows. I walked her downstairs and opened the front door. She started down the street with a slow, easy walk. I looked after her, trying to figure it. That's when I saw something else. A black Fiat pulled away from the curb and started after her. She turned the corner and so did the Fiat. And I knew right then and there that wasn't the last I was to see of Paula Dupre. Chapter 2 came the next morning. I was on my way to Sharia El Alfi to check on a consignment of Turkish liquor. The street was fairly crowded, and at first I didn't see the two men sidle up to me. But when I saw the flash of sunlight reflecting off a piece of steel, I knew I had company. To the right of me walked a small Egyptian with a nose like a bent cruller carrying a shiv. On the other side stood a tall Arab wearing a pointed black beard and a banous. He figured to be top man because he did the talking. Good afternoon, Mr. Jordan. It was until you showed. Please, step into this archway, Effendi. We have something to talk about. You're making a mistake, buddy. Our interests are different, Mr. Jordan. Perhaps you did not see Hasim's knife? In Tafaimni. Van Marid. Yeah, I saw it. Now, let us step off the sidewalk so we do not disturb the people. All right, buddy. What are you selling? 
Wisdom, Effendi. You got the wrong boy. I wouldn't know what to do with it. A young lady came to see you last night. So you pick over transom. She was a very lovely young lady from France. Well, don't get jealous. She doesn't mean anything to me. She is looking for someone in Cairo and wishes you to help her find that person. You drive a black fiat that follows girls at night. Hasim and I both wish that you do not join her in the search. Want to tell me why? Hasim and I also suggest that there are many other girls in Cairo. You do not have to see this one again. Well, that's a lot of advice, Buster. What if I don't take it? Then I shall be impelled to call upon Hasim and his knife. <coughs> and you will take the place of that wooden post, Effendi. They left the knife sticking in the post, and then they were gone. Well, that was okay with me. I went back to the tambourine. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, was waiting for me. His horn-rimmed glasses had slipped down on his perspiring nose. Sit down, Jordan. I've been waiting for you. Oh, thanks, Sam. What are we having? This is an official visit, Jordan. It concerns this slip of paper. A name and address written in pencil. Look at it. Okay. <laughs> are the heat getting you, Sam? Jordan, may I repeat? It's my name and my address. You came here to show me that. This slip of paper was found in the purse of a young lady, Jordan. Rather tall, slim, dark hair and eyes. Was that a crime? Please, allow me to continue. This lady was discovered this morning lying unconscious in an alley off the Sharia Bengen. Her name is Paula Dupre. You know her, Jordan? Maybe. Then perhaps you can suggest why anyone might wish to knock her out. Why don't you ask her? Well, unfortunately, she was unwilling to tell us anything. What do you know about her, Jordan? Oh, very little. I never saw her before last night. She came to me with some sort of pitch about helping her find somebody. One moment. Find who, Jordan? I didn't ask. I just said no dice and showed her out quick. Mm. She was alone? Yeah. Uh, where is she now? At her hotel. Well, perhaps now she will know better than to wander the native quarters of Cairo. <laughs> Sam walked out, and as his limousine pulled away from the curb, another car took its place. A little black Italian Fiat. Exactly like the one I'd seen following Paula Dupre down the street the night before. A short, fat man wearing a beret got out, mopped his brow with a silk handkerchief, and came in. Uh, they're warm, is it not, monsieur? Uh, sells a lot of beer. Yes, yes. Which remind me that I am thirsty. But perhaps something a little stronger than beer. Uh, we got it. Here, yeah, I'll set you up. Well, it be. What does this stranger know about drinking in the tambourine? You make the choice, monsieur. Okay. Is this the uh, first trip to Cairo? Uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Business? Yes, you might call it that. Yeah, try that. Mm, a pleasure. Mm. Ah, excellent, mon ami. Ah, life for you, monsieur, must be quite simple. You have a nice cafe, and all you must do is see to it that it is in order. Sure, sure. It is the people who stray from the simple ways who are unhappy. N'est-ce pas? What are you getting at? I'm trying to tell you in my clumsy way, mon ami, that you should confine all of your activities to the cafe business. Ah, a most delicious drink. What do you put in it? Portuguese rum and coconut juice. I will remember that. Now it's my turn for the questions. At your service, monsieur. Why are you following Paula Dupre? Hmm. Why does any man follow a pretty girl? Somebody followed her to Slugger. Say something about that. Je dis facile de les salaire. Why? Suddenly, I have lost command of the English language. Bonjour, mon. <laughs> You'd thought a lot of representatives from my insurance company were running around loose in Cairo. Everybody was interested in my health. Well, guys don't shove you around in the street, and fat men don't tell you to go the other way without piquing a little interest. So I went over to the Hotel Sinbad to see Paula Dupre. The place was a three-story white affair, all equipped with balconies hanging over the edge of the Nile. Paula Dupre's apartment turned out to be 308, and I rang her bell. Like a dame, she kept me waiting. When she opened the door, she wasn't surprised to see me. She looked as good in the late afternoon as she did at night. I'm glad you came so soon, Mr. Jordan. Won't you come in? Thanks. Sam Sabaya, the Cairo police, told me what happened. Are you all right? Yes. Thank you for asking. 
You shouldn't walk around the Cairo streets alone at night. I would enjoy company. What were you doing over on Sharia Ben Gen? Looking. Why there? The last letter I got from Michel came from a boarding house with a Ben Gen address. You know, a lot of people seem to think I ought to keep away from you and stick to my cafe business. What do you think? Uh, you know a tall Egyptian with a hook-nosed sidekick who carries a knife? No. What about a porky Frenchman who drives a Fiat? He has been following me. I do not know who he is. How about clearing up a few things for me, huh? Very well. My husband is a deserter from the army. He came to Cairo to hide out. Go on. We had a code arranged. He wrote me letters every two weeks. Suddenly, the letters stopped. I came to see if something might have happened to him. Like what? You know Cairo better than I. Um, how far south on Sharia Ben Gen did he live? Past the old Rasmus Tower. That's not a very nice neighborhood. Yes, I found that out. But you can see why I cannot go to my consul or to the police. I have to find Michel myself. Why find him at all? What do you mean? You don't love him. If you did, you'd have been hiding out with him. So why are you looking for him? He's my husband. One looks for one's husband. Um, all right, I'll give you a hand. I'll pay you whatever you ask. Within reason, of course. Well, we'll talk about that later. I'll give you a picture of him. Okay. Mr. Jordan? Hmm? It is almost supper time. We could have it here. I'll make some sandwiches and we open a bottle of wine, huh? All right, lady. You got yourself a boy. In a little while, I was calling her Paula, and she had dropped the Mr. Jordan. She spread a table by a big window overlooking the Nile. She brought out some sliced chicken and meats and found a couple of candlesticks someplace and put a fire to them. Then she cracked open a bottle of Chablis, and we made an evening of it. We watched the lights come on along the Nile, and the band of river got blacker and blacker as the night wore on. She told me all about herself, about the French town where she was born, and about her family. She didn't say anything about her husband, Michelle, and I didn't press it. And the lights along the Nile started to go out, and it was time to go. Thank you, Rocky. For what? I enjoyed this evening very much. Did you? Yeah, it beats spending it at the tambourine. <laughs> From you, I take that as a compliment. Tomorrow, then? Tomorrow. Good night, Rocky. Good night, Paula. Rocky. Yeah? Aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? Shots came flying in out of the hall. They missed and went through the window. I rolled Paula to the floor. A second went by and I heard footsteps running down the hall. I looked. There was nothing. Then I went to the window and I got there just in time to see the black Fiat pull away from the curb and barrel down the street. Listening to Escapade with Paula, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Monday night at 6, CBS Radio Theater will present The Velvet Touch, starring Rosalind Russell and Sidney Greenstreet. Don't miss this hour long version of The Velvet Touch at 6, Monday night. And after Radio Theater, you'll want to laugh with my friend Irma. But more about that later. We take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Escapade with Paula. It all began when a girl named Paula Dupre asked me to find her husband. Then a tall Egyptian with a hawk-nosed sidekick and a puffy Frenchman moved in to warn me off. Paula proved a little more intriguing than the scare boys. But when the shots began to fly, she caught a slight case of the shakes. I knew the Hotel Sinbad wasn't the place for her, so I found her some rooms at the Continental and moved out to do a little searching. The Sharia Ben Gen address Paul had given me turned out to be an Egyptian flophouse, a pile of wood so old the termites had given it up. Cleopatra's grandmother was the reception committee. We have many rooms left, Effendi. I'm not looking for a room. We have whatever you are looking for, Effendi. Information. For money, you may have anything. That is the way of the world. A Frenchman named Michel Dupre lived here once. He may have changed his name. Many Frenchmen live here, Effendi. And they all change their names. 
That is the way of the world. Oh, here. Here's his picture. Ah, a fine-looking man. A rich man, yes? There is a big reward if you find him. And you are willing to pay much for information. Five pounds. Ah, but it is the luck of this old woman to know nothing of the Frenchman. All right, I'll make it ten pounds. My luck is getting worse. I have a one-eyed Greek. Perhaps we could pass him off as the Frenchman. Ah, no deal. What do you know about a big Egyptian who walks around with a buddy who's got a nose like a bend in the Nile? I do not know such a man. The ten pounds will buy a lot of kush-kush. Go. Go away. Now, my name's Rocky Jordan. You can find me at the cafe tambourine when you change your mind. Imshe. Imshe. Take it over, Grandma. I will think nothing. You want them to find me floating in the Nile with a knife? Find out anything, Jordan? Sam. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. You ought to sleep nights instead of following me around. I would prefer that, Jordan, but I have much to do. We found Miss Dupre in the alley back of the boarding house here. I am investigating. A lot bigger things happen in Cairo than a slugging. You're sure putting in a lot of time on that girl. So are you, Jordan. <laughs> Come on. Where are we going? My car is right around the corner. Oh, thanks. I'll take a taxi. That is not necessary. We are going to the same place. Oh, where's that? The morgue. I have something to show you. This way, Jordan. The third table. Observe, Jordan. This man is fat. And short, and he is a Frenchman. I bet he drove a Fiat. That is correct. We found him out in the desert past the ruins of the Third Dynasty. He had a knife in him. Come upstairs. We have some things to talk about. Now, Jordan, what have you to tell me? I don't know who killed him, Sam. But I can tell you this. He's the guy who's been following Paula ever since she got in town. Uh huh. He tagged her from the tambourine yesterday. I saw him pulling away from the Sinbad this morning after he threw a couple of shots at him. Jordan, that is interesting, but it is not possible. What do you mean? Jordan, this man would not shoot at you. Do you know who he is? No. His name is Henri Duval. He is a representative of the French military. He was in Cairo looking for someone. A deserter. Well, you won't find him now. Someone has already found him. Jordan, do you think that this man and Miss Dupre were looking for the same person? Anything's possible. Is it not also possible that she killed Duval so that she alone could find the missing man? Like I said, anything was possible. But this fogging on Duval was a new wrinkle. All I knew, if I could turn up those two boys in Bernouces, they could supply a lot of answers. But finding them in Cairo was as easy as turning up a penguin in the Sahara. I went home and slept for a couple of hours, shaved and threw on a clean suit of clothes. I picked Paula up in the late afternoon and showed her Cairo. I waited, but she didn't say anything about Duval's murder. Toward evening, we found ourselves in a little cafe off the bazaar. What is this place called? Oh, the uh, Dibban. It means the flies. It's <laughs> sure full of them. Oh, I think it is very nice. Yeah? Oh, I've had a grand time today, Rocky. I could stay in Cairo forever. Some people do. What does that mean? Duval's not leaving. Who is he? The man in the black fiat. He was with the French government. He was looking for Michelle, too. Oh. Somebody killed him. You know anything about it, Paula? No. Sabaya thinks you might have done it. And what do you think? I don't know. You still don't trust me, do you? It's usually easier not to trust a person. But you want to trust me? Isn't that it, Rocky? Something like that. Buy me a drink. Just a minute, Paula. We thought Duval was the one who shot at us up at the Sinbad, but it wasn't. It was somebody else. Like who? One of those two crummy Egyptians who bumped me on the street, or your husband. Why would Michel shoot at me, or you? You tell me. I do not know. Maybe he doesn't want to be found. You ever think of that? Yes. Sometimes I even wish there were no such men. Yet you still want to find him. I have to. Why? One looks for one's husband. You tried that out on me before. It doesn't have much power. What's the real reason? I can't tell you now. When can you? When we find him? All right, Paula. I'll hold you to it. Pardon me, Mr. Duval. 
me, Effendi. Uh, does the gentleman remember a poor old lady who runs a boarding house on Shari Bengen? A poor old lady whose luck was so bad that even for money, she did not know a Frenchman who disappeared? Who is she, Rocky? Just a minute, Paula. Has your luck changed, Grandma? I have been thinking over the ways of the world. I cannot give you the Frenchman, but for money, I can take you to that tall Egyptian with the pointed beard you are looking for. The ten pounds still hold. But, Defendi, the ways of the world are more expensive. Twenty pounds. I pay it, Rocky. Okay. Come then, Effendi. I shall take you to him. I want to go with you, Rocky. Go on back to the tambourine and wait for me. I'll bring him to you. But, Rocky, I want to... Come on, old woman. Let's find our friend. The old woman led me through the bazaar, then away from the crowds, down the winding Sharia Namus. Just where it turned down toward the river, went into a decaying brownstone house, up a flight of stairs and down the dingy hallway. Then she suddenly stopped, pointed to a door. Ran away fast. I raised my hand to knock, then changed my mind and kicked the door open. Man, what is this? He was there, Shabbat, the big native with the long burnous and the pointed black beard. He was just shutting a drawer. Rocky George. Hello, Shabbat. How did you find me? Usual way. Ah, quite a hangout you got here. I do not know why you came here, but I warn you again, Jordan. Did you warn Henri Duval before you killed him in the desert? This affair is not for you, Jordan. You told me that. Now tell me what's between you and Paula Dupre. Get out of here quickly. Keep out of the drawer, Jordan. Whiskey, Shabbat. Well, what's a believer like you doing with alcohol? Oh, uh, you've lived too long. I was set for a swing in the bottle and I went down. You don't expect an Egyptian to use his fist, but Shabbat used them well. I found that out when I came up from the floor. I bounded back and drove for his stomach. Then I went to work in his face. His beard was turning a bright pink when a wild swing caught me flat on the jaw. Before I could shake out the cobwebs, he was on top of me. I yanked his burnous tight around his neck, but his knee came up and everything gave way. We were back on our feet again, slugging it out. Another one in the stomach loosened him up, and then I hit him with all I had. He sprawled back over the table and onto the floor. This time he didn't get up. No, Jordan. That is enough. This is where we begin, Shabbat. Come on, get up. What do you want? We're taking a walk to the Cafe Tambourine. Fifteen minutes later, we slammed in the alley door of the tambourine. Paula Dupre was waiting. I pushed him and he slumped into a chair. There he is, Paula. Who is he? Don't you recognize him? He calls himself Shabbat, but he's no more Egyptian than I am. He uses his fist too well. Michel. Oui. That's right, Paula. He went native, but he forgot a believer doesn't drink alcohol. I said I would find you, Michel. You needed help. Your friend has brought me here, what now? I'm going to pay you what I owe you. Oh, put that away. Paula, you don't know how to use that. Paula! Paula! Her gun spit and three slugs plowed their way through Michelle. He lurched forward, grabbed a chair, then toppled over like a tent in a windstorm. He was dead by the time he hit my rug. And Paula stood over him with a smoking gun in her hand, and her face looked like she was going to break out crying. You are listening to Escapade with Paula, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. After Radio Theater, Monday night at 6, My Friend Irma brings you a new, fresh comedy approach. You'll pity Irma, who gets dumber and funnier each week. You'll sympathize with Jane Stacy, Irma's roommate. My Friend Irma is an hilarious show. Don't miss it. Monday night, following Radio Theater at 7. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Escapade with Paula. Put the sucker tag on me. Chase all over Cairo for a dame to help her find a man, then find him and bring him back just so she can blow some holes into him. Well, Paula finally turned away from Michelle and I threw something over him. Then she spoke, and her voice was strange. I wondered and wondered if when the time came I would have the nerve. Well, you can stop wondering. You did a good job on him. Here, give me the gun. Here. 
This changes a lot of things, does it not? What do you think? Well, I knew it would, but I had to do it. Sure. We had some fine hours together, Rocky, eh? I think I had more fun in those few hours than ever before. Well, you took care of ending it. I guess we could have had a lot more fun. We just met too late. Something like that. I'm sorry I had to use you as I did. But it was the only way to find him. At least it was the way you picked. You, you want to tell me why you did it? It was no good. In what way? In lots of ways, no good. But I owed it to him for what he did to me and to my sister. She lived with us after we got married. She had no other place to go. She was young. She didn't know very much. Michelle was my husband. But I guess it didn't mean much to him. She slashed her wrists one day because of what... I see. The law couldn't do anything to him. Her death was a suicide. I had to do it by myself. What now, Rocky? Oh, I don't know. Are you going to turn me in? I haven't worked it out yet. You will not have to work it out, Jordan. I will work it out for you. How long have you been there, Sam? Not long enough to prevent the shooting, but long enough to understand what has been done. Miss Dupre, you will please come with me. Uh, Sam. Yes, Jordan. Uh... Sam, send over some men right away to clean up my place. That I will do, Jordan. Come, Miss Dupre. Goodbye, Rocky. So long, Paula. You think about me a little, huh? Sure. There's a blood spot on my rug to remind me. now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Big Ditch. Maybe there's a reason why I happen to settle down in Cairo. Maybe because it's on a great river like the Mississippi that flows down past St. Louis. Only the Nile's somehow different. Egypt lives by its rise and fall. And when it starts to run low in summer, the spirits of the people seem to go down with it. That includes me. And the best thing to give me a lift is to see an old friend. Even a guy like Matt Gallagher. I'd had a big Saturday night in the tambourine, and along about 11 in the morning, I got the receipts out of the safe and sat down to front table where I could be under a fan while counting up. I was just finished when there was a knock at the door. I shoved the money bag out of the counter. As I threw the latch on the door, I saw his face through the window. It hadn't changed much in five years, except for a few new scars picked up in some waterfront brawls. He barged in like a big battered freighter riding out a storm. <laughs> Well, uh, Rocky, me boy, the saint be praised. Well, what wind blew you in, Matt? A good wind it was, lad, for the sight of you again. Let's see, now, where was it? Uh, uh, Calcutta, Frisco, Singapore? Oh, no, don't make me remember. <laughs> if you're thinking of the set to we had with the Sultan's daughter in Istanbul, we rode it out, didn't we, lad? Sure. Uh, by the way, how much money did I loan you to get out of town? Uh, uh, bygones, Rocky, bygones. Come now, uh, set me up with a nip, will you? Sure, just add it to your bill. You say, that's an idea. Hey, and bring it around in the bottle, me lad. We'll be drinking to all times. Uh, just leave a little of the cash customers, huh? yeah, Never worry, me lad, never worry. One day you'll be marking my account paid in full. And, and plenty to boot. Well, I won't hold my breath till then. Rocky, there are two of us. That calls for another, eh? All right, just one more. You two this time. Yeah, I got an answer to that, lad. 
to Francie Bayon, as lovely a lady as ever set her dainty feet on the streets of Cairo. Who? Uh, up with it now, Rocky. Don't be insulting the lady. All right. <laughs> now, who's Francie? Not a new girlfriend. Aye, aye, sir. And there'll never be another. With eyes as blue as the lakes of Killarney. Uh, you never learn, do you, Matt? Ah, oh, Rocky, I know what you're thinking. But never again. This is the real thing. Now, tell me, when did a girl ever come into your life that there wasn't trouble? Lad, I won't have you saying that about Francie. She ain't like the others. Sure, okay, okay. You say uh, Baby Blue Eyes is here in Cairo? At the Shadrach Hotel, pining her heart out for me at this very minute. Oh, there's nobody like her, me lad. You got it bad again. Aye, and we'll be settling down if all goes well. And that's what I'm wanting to talk to you about. Okay. How much? Well, the fact of the matter is this, that uh, I, I, I will be needing a little money. I wondered when you'd get around to it. But it, you don't understand, lad. I'm cutting you in. On what? Rocky, how would you like to own the Suez Canal? <laughs> Great. How about it, lad? The Suez? Sure. <laughs> I'll put it right alongside the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you, you think I'm lying to you? Uh, no more than usual. But I'm telling you, Rocky... Look, I Matt, this is a touch, and we both know it. It's nothing of the kind. You only show up once every four or five years, but every time I end up with less money. Now, come on, how much do you want? No, uh, no, that's more like it, me, lad. Uh, uh, 150 pounds will swing it. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'll let you have 20. Only 20 pounds? But the deal, lad. You're lucky I had a good night. I tell you, Jay, to touch now, Rocky. All right, call it a wedding present, then. Here. Well, you want it or not? I'll take it. But are you... Uh, uh, there's a phone in my office. I'll be right back. I'll be waiting, Rocky. You can later that. It was a call asking for a contribution to the home for indigent goat herders. Oh, I brushed it off, naturally, and went back front. First thing I noticed was that Gallagher was gone. Second, he'd taken the bottle from the table with him. That's when I made for the money bag behind the bar. Oh, it was there. And so were a few loose piastres. But that was all. I yanked the front door open, but the street was deserted. Matt Gallagher had made a smoother getaway than the super chief. The little figuring told me that along with the 20 I'd given him, he'd gotten off with a total of 150 Egyptian pounds. Which comes to exactly 600 good round American dollars. Well, that's what you get for helping a guy. I don't like being suckered, so I didn't tell anybody, just waited around. He didn't turn up among the other million and a half people around Cairo, so I decided he'd lit out for places unknown. I was sure of it after a couple of weeks went by, but I still hadn't cooled off. Then I got a call from Captain Sam Sabaya. Jordan, is it possible that you know a man named Matt Gallagher? Sure I know him, Sam, and I'm looking for him. For what purpose? I'm going to dig 150 pounds out of his hide that he owes me. I fear you will have trouble collecting, Jordan. Yeah? Why? Come to the morgue and you will see. Matt Gallagher is on a slab. Well, you can't stay sore at a guy on a slab. I wanted it over with and forgotten, so I caught the first cab that came along for headquarters. Sam was waiting for me and led me downstairs to the morgue where he drew back one of the sheets. Gunshots, as you can see, Jordan. Uh, where'd you find him, Sam? Lying in some out-of-the-way ruins near the old uh, Babylon Roman fortress in the old part of the city. He had been dead for several days. How'd you happen to call me? A match pack from the cafe tambourine was in his pocket. There was this small chance you might have seen him there. I've known Gallagher off and on for a long time. When did you see him last? A couple of Sundays ago at my cafe. He, uh... Borrowed a pocket full of money while I wasn't looking. And you did not report this to me, Jordan? Oh, it was a personal affair. Personal affair, indeed. Too often you take matters into your own hand, but someday you will learn. Sure, sure. Uh, what else was in his pocket, Sam? There was no money, if that is what you mean. What about identification? You know, this passport and Seaman's card. You may see them if you like. Thanks. Also, a few other personal articles, if you care to look at them. No, oh, no, I've seen enough. Now, Jordan, if there is anything more you can tell me about this man... Nothing at all, Sam. 
is all yours. Very well. But, Jordan, give it some thought. I intend that this murder be disposed of very quickly. I could feel Sam's eyes on the back of my head as I went out. He generally figures I'm holding something back. And this time he was right. To begin with, I'd never seen that man on the slab before. It wasn't Matt Gallagher at all. Besides, Gallagher was a seaman. And this was a fair-skinned man with soft hands that had never done a lick of rough work in his life. Now, I wondered if Sam had noticed that. Well, I had a hunch now that Gallagher was still kicking around Cairo with my 150 pounds. And I wanted first crack at him. What he had to do with the murder and the switch in identity was anybody's guess. Looking in on Matt's girlfriend at the Shadrach Hotel was one thing I'd avoided up to now. But this is where I had to see her. It turned out she was sharing a suite with somebody, so I got the room number and went on up. The door was opened by a friendly-looking little guy with a mustache and his gray hair parted in the middle. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, what can I do for you? I'd like to see Francie Bion. Name's Jordan. Oh, of course, of course. Please come in. Thanks. Who is it, Uncle Julius? It's Mr. Jordan, Francie. Oh, so you're Rocky Jordan. That's right. Matt Gallagher mentioned my name? Yes. Bosom pals, he said. A big oaf. Yeah. Uh, Francie, perhaps Mr. Jordan will be able to tell us... Give him time, Uncle dear. Oh, uh, yes, of course, of course, uh, my dear. Well? I'm looking for Gallagher. Where is he? I haven't seen him for weeks. What's your guess? From what he told me, you ought to know everything about him. What did he tell you? Oh, something about you and him settling down. Real cozy. (laughs) Fine chance. He'd better show up in a hurry, that's all I got to say. What's he up to, Francie? He's up to his gills in Irish whiskey, if you ask me. Uh, what else? Oh, I don't know. He's been acting crazy for the last month. A lot of wild talk. Brother, what he wasn't going to do for me, buy me minks and sables and yachts... Did he say what with? (laughs) Who cares? It wouldn't make sense. What do you want with him? 150 pounds, due and payable. Did he steal it from you? Well, he didn't exactly sign a promissory note. Uh, Francie, my dear, this is just as I told you. I expressly do not approve of that man for you. We've been all over that, Uncle Julius. But a girl of your culture and refinement, I cannot understand what you see in a person like that. Then stop trying. Where do I look for him, Francie? You might take a swim in the Suez Canal. He says he's going to buy it. Oh. Gallagher told you that too, huh? (laughs) That's what he's telling everybody. And the more he talks, the crazier he gets. All he needs is a little dough to swing it, he says. Then it's big times for us. (laughs) Can you beat that guy? Well, let me know when he shows up, will you? Better be in a hurry. We're washing out of this town plenty quick. Okay, thanks. Don't mention it. Oh, Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Mr. Jordan. Yeah, Julius? Uh, about this, uh, robbery. Have you mentioned it to the police? Not yet. Why? Well, it's for Francie's sake. She's such a sensitive child. Well, don't worry, Julius. What I've got to settle with Matt Gallagher is between just... Him and me. I finally shook Uncle Julius from my lapels, got out of the Shadrach Hotel, and back to my tambourine. As I walked into the cafe, Chris flagged me down from behind the bar and handed over a package wrapped in old dirty paper. It's for you, Rocky. What is it? I don't know. Messenger said he was supposed to give it to you personal. Only got tired waiting. Did he say who it was from? Yeah, Matt Gallagher. Gallagher? Let's have a look. It ain't wrapped up so good. Uh, I'm interested in what's inside. Oh, careful. It's coming apart. Oh, here. Help me here, will you, Chris? Yeah. Great jumping Jehoshaphat, Rocky. What's that? The bundle had come apart in my hands, and a lot of strange-looking pieces of paper lay scattered all around me. While Chris was getting them together, I picked one up and had a look. Like all the rest, it was old-looking and yellow, with everything written in French. At the top, in real fancy lettering, it read, Compagnie... One of a cell du canal maritime de Suez. I began scrambling through the others, and they were all the same, except for a different serial number. I didn't need to know much French to realize that these were shares of stock. Yeah? Where I stood, I, Rocky Jordan, now own part of the Suez Canal. You 
are listening to The Big Ditch, an adventure with Rocky Jordan. You'll find mystery to your heart's content on CBS, fine yarns woven by some of radio's top mystery writers. But you can also vary the fare with music and comedy. Here's a comedy you won't want to miss. Monday night, on CBS Radio Theater, Mickey Rooney stars in Merton of the Movies, a satire on the movie-making industry. Remember, CBS Radio Theater, tomorrow, Monday night, at 6. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, The Big Ditch. What would you do if somebody sent you a whole stack of shares in the Suez Canal? Paper the wall with them or ask a few questions first? Well, my curiosity got the best of me, too, so I wrapped up the bundle again and headed for the Cairo Securities Exchange. I didn't expect to find the answer there to why a murdered man was found with Matt Gallagher's identification on him, or why Gallagher had sent the shares to me. That was something else. I finally got to the right man at the exchange, gave him my name, opened up the bundle on his desk, and waited for him to start laughing. Yes, Mr. Jordan? Oh. What about these things? Hmm... It's the Company Universal de Suez. I say, Mr. Jordan. Yeah? Uh, this is most remarkable. You're bringing such valuable securities in this fashion. Now, wait a minute. Don't tell me they're the real thing. Authentic in every detail. I've seen many of these. The man is indeed fortunate to possess Suez Canal shares. But what are they doing here? A big pardon. I mean, doesn't the Suez belong to a government? France or England? Oh, a common error, Mr. Jordan. True, the British Crown owns seven sixteenths of the Suez Canal, thanks, of course, to the brilliant statesmanship of Disraeli when he purchased them from the Khedive of Egypt. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, a great man, Disraeli. A credit to the empire, Mr. Jordan. Uh, look, getting back to these shares. Oh, oh, oh quite. <laughs> Carried away, you know. Sorry. Um, are you trying to tell me that private individuals can own shares in the Suez Canal? Most assuredly. Many people are fortunate to own stock in the Suez. Uh, the fact of it is, thousands of shares have been lost through the years. The company is nearing its century mark, you know. Well, how much are they worth? Uh, they sold originally for 250 pounds a share. They now run as high as 20,000 pounds. Each? Yes, you have 200 shares here. It's possible that dividends have accumulated. All in all, these are worth, uh, in your currency... Approximately uh, sixteen million dollars. May I ask where you got them? I bought them for hundred and fifty pounds. Oh, I see, Mister Jordan, you're pulling my leg. I wouldn't dare. Uh, now, now, of course, these must be transferred to your name. Oh, yeah, sure, but uh, some other time. Uh, you mean you're taking them with you in this manner? Yeah. Thanks for everything. Uh, but why? I've decided to get my money back. I put the bundle inside my coat and came out of there with a great education on the Suez Canal. Enough to know that there was a sweet setup for a neat little racket. Only it gets too big when a man's murdered and the stuff's planted on me. And right then I knew I had to find Gallagher and shove the whole bundle down his throat. It was already evening and I moved along the street, not noticing the beggars or anything else, till a little native water salesman started getting under my feet. Effendi, I have the pure fine water for you. Water like crystal. All right, move along. Him, she. Oh, but it is not of the Nile, Effendi. My water is from the hidden springs of the desert. One piaster is all. Allah, your cheek. What's good now? Uh, two centimes, then. Only for you. No water. Him, she. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Where did you learn the name? This concerns another matter. The Afranki would be wise to listen. All right, get it out. Mr. Jordan, there are certain people with money. They will bargain well. What people? What do they want? I cannot tell you who they are, but they are interested in certain pieces of paper. You tell certain people that certain pieces of paper aren't for sale. Get it? Alwa Effendi. Uh, you know where Matt Gallagher is? The name I do not know. Yeah. This helps? Uh, but perhaps there is another who can help you. Who? The street of many knives up the hill past the rug weaver's hut. I'll need more than that. I have the water. Hey, wait a minute. Very pure water, like fine crystal water. 
I could have followed the water cellar, but already night was setting in and I had another errand. It took a lot of asking around and some strange looks, but I was finally in the street of many knives. Nothing more than a passageway that winds up through the desolate native quarter to the east. It's a place a foreigner doesn't go around even in daylight, much less at night. And I could guess how it got its name. The wild dogs were out, but they'd found something else and didn't bother with me. Just before the street ended at a hill, I found the rug weaver's hut and a door just beyond. There was no light, but I knocked. I thought I heard a quick movement inside. So I knocked again. Then I tried the knob. It was locked. I put my shoulder against the door and one shove was all it took. The lock snapped and I was inside just as a hulking figure lunged from the shadows. He had powerful arms around me and we went down. My knees came up and we went on over. Then I was on top with my hand in his face. And Matt and the smell of Irish whiskey cut it short. Matt! Rocky. Rocky, lad, I didn't know. How'd you find me? Yeah, we'll skip that. Oh, let's get some light in here. There's a candle on a corner table. But do you have to light it now, lad? Why not? Oh, Rocky, boy, am I glad to see you. Yeah, you won't be, Matt. Not till you hand over my money. Oh, now, 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 Rocky, lad, go easy on me. I've been in for a rough time of it. Why the hideout? Well, I'll admit it to you, Rocky. I'm scared. Of what, the police? Uh, not exactly. But I, I'm in a bit of trouble. Why not run to Francie? She's getting out of Cairo. Well, uh, I, I tell you, lad, I, I'm giving her up. Francie's too good for the likes of me. Uh, anyhow, I've learned me lesson, Rocky. There's been a bit of strike north of Johannesburg. I'm going there and dig for gold. Come on with me now. I uh, start clearing it up, Matt. What about the guy down in the morgue? Uh, in, the, in the morgue? You know he's dead. He was carrying your seaman's card and your passport. Sure. Sure, I, I know. But you don't think I killed him, lad. You couldn't think that. I, I value life too much. Spit it out, Gallagher. Who was he? Uh, Walter Logan. He used to work for the Suez Company in Paris. You get all those shares from him? Right, me boy. He offered a quick sale for 150 pounds. Well, they'd be worth thousands. Why a price like that? Now, Rocky, you know I don't bother with trifles. Ask a lot of embarrassing questions. Go on. We had a little rendezvous and I bought the shares. I left him and I wasn't more than a block away and I heard the gunshots. I ran back and found him dead. See anybody else around? No, Rocky. But I knew people would be accusing me. They always make things tough and poor, Matt Gallagher. Come on, come on. Why the switch? Well, I had to think fast. If they thought I was dead, they wouldn't be looking for me. So I put my stuff in his pockets. And why send the shares to me? That was our deal, Rocky. Anyhow, uh, I was sort of hot and I knew you'd take care of them. Yeah. All that over a stack of worthless paper. Worthless? What do you mean, Rocky? A lot of Suez shares have been lost. Nobody knows what happened to them. You say Logan worked for the company in Paris. He could have found out the serial numbers of the missing shares, made up some to match the real ones. Counterfeit? Sure. He turns up with a bunch of lost shares, and if he's lucky, no one's the wiser. Only, he wasn't so lucky. What now, then, lad? I still want my 150 pounds. But, Rocky, I'd give it to you if I had it. Hold it, Matt, hold it. Maybe I heard, or maybe I just felt it, but I knew there was somebody at the door. As I opened it, a barefoot native ducked away. I was after him fast, and just as I was on him, he whirled and faced me. Mr. Jordan. All right, what is it now, Buster? You don't sell water around here. Uh, no, it concerns the other matter, Effendi. Uh, you ready to tell me who sent you? I cannot, uh, but about the certain pieces of paper, uh, my master offers you 5,000 pounds. Uh. Is that all? Oh, but Mr. Jordan, he is prepared to go higher. Possibly six or seven thousand pounds. I'll go the other way. The other way? Yeah. Tell your master he can have the pieces of paper for 150 pounds. You will give them to me? Not on your life. I'll deliver them in person. Well, I meet your master. At the ruins of the Minya Tower in Old Cairo. Uh, there you will not be disturbed. I'll be there at 11 o'clock. <laughs> The little water cellar vanished in thin air, and I was back dragging Gallagher into the street and down the hill. I figured as long as he'd started this thing for me, he could be in at the finish. He complained like a dyspeptic camel all the way, but I finally got him with me to the tambourine, and there I put in a quick call to Sabaya. What are you trying to say to me, Jordan? I told you, the guy you have in the morgue isn't Matt Gallagher. But you saw him yourself. Why did you not tell me? You didn't ask me, Sam. I didn't. You... 
Of all the incredible... Then who is this man? His name's Walter Logan. Jordan, listen to me. You have completely upset my investigation. You have come dangerously... Sam, do you want to find Gallagher or not? Indeed I do. Then put on your snowshoes and mush on out to the Minya Tower in Old Cairo. Jordan, you will first explain this to me, Jordan. See you there, Sam. Gallagher heard every word of the conversation and he was crying real tears as I tucked the pieces of paper under my arm and shoved him into a taxi out front. Between him and the lazy taxi driver, I had myself a time as we rolled south into Old Cairo. Finally, we drove through what once, centuries ago, was the gate to the Roman fortress called Babylon. A little farther on, the cabbie pulled up and he wouldn't go an inch farther for all the fish in the Nile. So, we walked it from there. In another quarter hour, we were nearing the crumbling Minya Tower, surrounded by ruins. Just a few minutes before 11. A full moon was out now, almost white against the ancient sandstone walls. It was quite a sight, but Gallagher wasn't impressed. Rocky. Rocky, I, I don't like it at all. Ah, we're early. There's nobody here. It's right there that Walter Logan was killed, don't you see? Yeah. Somebody might repeat themselves. Look, Rocky, this is not for me. Let's get out of here. I, I'm sorry for getting you into this land. I'll make it up if it takes the rest of my life. Might not be long enough, man. Now, Rocky, me boy, that's exactly get back what in I the mean. shadows. We'll wait here. Matt dug for a dark corner, and we waited. Not more than three or four minutes. And we heard footsteps along the passageway from the way we'd come. Whoever it was kept to the shadows on the far side. The steps were confident, with no trace of hesitation. Passed. And then the figure stepped out into the moonlight beneath the tower. Francie! Matt, what are you doing here? He came with me, Francie. Gallagher's in on the deal. All right, let's get it over with. Oh, I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. When did that muddled head of yours ever understand anything? But all this time you... Yes, yeah, playing you for a sucker. Oh, Francie, darling. Oh, no, no, Let no. Let Rocky I... explain it. He's a smart one. Uh, later. Your little water boy mentioned an offer for... Uh... Certain pieces of paper. Five thousand pounds. Why did you make it a hundred and fifty? I'm satisfied. You have them? Yeah. All right, give them to me. Oh, let's keep it honest, Blue Eyes. Hmm. Here's your money. Now hand them over. They're all yours. Thanks. Now we'll get a few things straight. Skip it, Rocky. Come on out, Julius. Yes, I'll take over now, Francie. Julius. It's Uncle Julius. I've been wanting... Careful, Matt. That gun in his hand, he'll use it. You're quite right, Mr. Jordan. Oh, I'm getting it now. I should have known why you didn't like me, Uncle Julius. Always come between Francie and me. What's bothering you, Julius? Matt and I know too much. You've still got a lot of phony shares to sell. You could quite well interfere with our plans. So I'm going to kill you. Just like you did Walter Logan. Yes. Well, he fixed you up with his stuff. Why drop him? He was a little man. Our methods frightened him. He began trying to dump the shares at quick prices. There was no telling what he would do next. I had to kill him. That leaves just you and Francie. Great team. I give her full credit. It was she who masterminded our plan. It ain't true. It ain't true at all. I'll not have you saying that about Francie. Shut up, you stupid ox. You fostered her into it. You never liked me. And I don't like you either, Julius. Matt, keep back. You'll be poisoner of mind against me no more. Stop, you fool. Stop. You or nobody can stop Matt Gallagher. Matt stopped two slugs head on and kept walking in. Then his big gnarled hands were on the man's neck and dropped him back. Julius had no more chance than a day-old kitten. All at once it was a snap and he dropped like a wet bar rag. Matt stood over him for a full second and then he piled on top. <laughs> Francie was suddenly wild and running, and I didn't follow because just then I saw Sam Sabaya and a couple of his men coming up to meet her. Well, there was a lot of talk and explaining for a while. Then Uncle Julius was wheeled off to the morgue, Matt Gallagher to the hospital, and Francie off to a cell. Sam kept the package, and about an hour later, he and I were resting at a table in my cafe tambourine. Jordan, you you make very good coffee. Sounds that way, Sam. Mm. You should confine your activities to just such things as this. Oh, I'm willing. 
But when a poor sucker like Gallagher comes around, what are you going to do? It is possible there will not be another time. Uh, <laughs> takes more than a couple of slugs to knock out a guy like him. What Francie did to him will hurt him worse. Mm, perhaps. By the way, Jordan, I'm wondering now what I should do about you. Me? What for? You are guilty of selling counterfeit shares for 150 pounds. I uh, think it's about time you looked in that package, Sam. What do you mean? My deal with Francie was for certain pieces of paper. That's just what she got. All torn out of the Cairo Gazette. It's CBS at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The St. Louis Blues. <laughs> I was trying to wake up over a second cup of coffee in my cafe tambourine, glancing through the morning paper. A picture on the front page didn't mean much at first, but a second look and I recognized the face. It was Ted Polanski, an old friend. I hadn't seen him since the early days in St. Louis. The printing underneath brought me wide awake. U.S. naval hero found lying near the Mahudea Canal with knife in back, victim of an attempted murder. Victim seemed unable to identify assailant. No relatives or friends to be found. Polanski was taken to the Cairo General Hospital. Well, maybe I was just curious, or maybe I wanted to recall old times. Anyhow, I went to the hospital right away to see Polanski. The nurse showed me into a hot little room that had an overhead fan. I found Polanski's bed behind a screen. Hello, Ted. Rocky Jordan, remember me? I remember you. It's been a long time, Ted. All right, it's been a long time. What about it? Well, I'm just sorry you didn't look me up when you came to Cairo. I'd have warned you they play rough with knives around here. I don't need your help. You or the cops or anybody else. What do you want with me? Well, not a thing, Ted. Then leave me alone. Listen, Ted, I know my way around Cairo a little. I don't know what this is all about, but somebody tried to kill you. Maybe if you told me... Why don't me... you mind your own business? I've got nothing to tell you. Okay, if you don't want to. Am I asking you why you left St. Louis? We'll skip that. Then shut up about me. Just leave me alone. Get out of here. That suits me fine, Polanski. Don't bother to come back. I took a good long walk to cool off. Ted Polanski had changed a lot, and that was his affair. That's what I told myself. So I tried shaking him out of my mind. Too many times you try remembering things, and then you get hurt. I was behind the bar at the tambourine early that afternoon when I had a visitor. And for the second time that day, my mind went into reverse. She was American, smartly dressed, but not too much, with just a touch of platine and a soft, clean face like something I'd known before. Mr. Jordan, I'm Mrs. Saunders, Cora Saunders. What can I do for you, Mrs. Saunders? I believe you were at the hospital this morning to see Ted Polanski. That's right. I'd like to ask a favor of you, Mr. Jordan. Now look, before you go any further, I'll tell you I don't know who tried to kill him or why. I just happened to drop in and see him, that's all. You're a friend of his? 
Uh, I was once, back in St. Louis. I'm from St. Louis, too. Well, lots of people are. I'm, I, I'm sorry I'm bothering you, but I've got to know about Ted. Why? I was once his wife. Sit down, Mrs. Saunders. Thank you. Why not go and talk to him? I wanted to. I've been trying all day to see him, but he won't talk to me. What makes you think he'd talk to me? I was hoping he would, Mr. Jordan. Ted and I were very happily married before the war, but the war seemed to change him. Yeah, wars have a way of doing that. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was that episode in the Mediterranean, but Ted never came home to me and our child, Linda. That was five years ago. I've never seen him since. Maybe you ought to keep it that way. I was able to trace him for a while, the Riviera, Casablanca, Alexandria, but it was as though Ted had turned his back on everyone who had ever meant anything to him before. I... I couldn't wait forever. I... I divorced him and married Evan. All right, you got a husband. Why don't you forget about Polanski? You know things aren't that easy. Yeah. Did you uh, come to Cairo to see Ted? Oh, no, Mr. Jordan. My husband is here on business. He's in textile. He's here to organize a company, a new cotton process, I believe. I had no idea Ted was here until I saw the paper. Mr. Jordan, would would you please get Ted to let me talk to him? Oh, sorry, lady. I don't have any drag in that direction. Oh, but Mr. Polanski Jordan... doesn't want to see me, and I don't want to see him. Let's keep it that way. Please, think it over, Mr. Jordan. I'll be back later this evening. I'm certain that what I'm trying to do is best... Well, I watched Cora leave and tried to wash the thing out of my mind. But somehow I kept thinking of Polanski and kept wondering what would make a guy foul up his life. Trading a sweet little number like Cora and a kid for a knife in the back. Well, my day had been ruined already, so I knocked off and went over to the U.S. Embassy to ask the naval attaché a few questions. Well, there's plenty here on the files about Polanski. Not that I have to look it up. You mean he's been in Cairo before? Yeah, off and on. You say you knew him back in the States? Yeah, quite a while ago. What do you got on him? Yeah, here we are. Sit down, Jordan. Oh, thanks. Now, let's see. Uh, Theodore Robert Polanski, Lieutenant Junior Grade. Decorated March 7th, 1945. Heroism over and above the call of duty. Delayed parachute jump from burning reconnaissance plane to save valuable photographs which enabled allies to advance on a broad front at minimum loss of life. Anything wrong with that? Uh, for a guy like Polanski, yes. Got too loaded down with metals. He cracked up under the strain. I, I still don't get it. Well, look at it this way, Jordan. Polanski's just a nice guy from the Middle West with a wife and kid. He goes off to war and suddenly he's a hero. Headlines everywhere, big shots hanging ribbons on him, dames with soft shoulders falling all over him. It went Hollywood, you might say. Well, that's the way we figured it. He began to like it too much. So now he's a celebrity. Couldn't he be forced to go back home? We tried. But when a guy gets that big, he can pull strings. Oh, his wife almost drove us nuts for a while. But she's lucky to be rid of him. He's gone from bad to worse, knocking around in scrapes with the police, women, and now they find him on the streets with a knife in his back. Yeah, that brings me up to date. You got any idea why someone would try to kill him? I don't follow him that closely. Well, thanks. I'll be seeing you. Well, I left the U.S. Navy going through a racing form of some sort and went out into the street. One of the big questions the naval attaché couldn't answer, why the knife in Polanski's back? I was working on that, walking up the Sharia Nauru, scouting for a taxi, when a shiny red car with plenty of chrome pulled up to the curb. The back door opened just a little. Step over, Jordan. I knew the native in front with a gun was covering for the voice that came at me from the back seat. The voice must have had a face, but I couldn't see it. All I saw was a shoe wearing spats and a hand filing fingernails. Been keeping busy, Jordan. With my business? Maybe I don't like your business. Forget it, then. Wait, Jordan. We going somewhere? That all depends. Well, let me know when you decide. That's up to you, Jordan. You've been having a lot of conversations today. I know a lot of people. Like Ted Polanski? Maybe. You had quite a talk with him at the hospital. All sorts of questions. He's an old friend. Polanski's got no friend. I'm way ahead of you. What did he tell you? Nothing. Let's keep it that way. He don't want you talking to him. Neither do I. About what? Keep away from him, Jordan. Stop asking people questions that don't concern you. If I don't? You know what'll happen? 
Come here, Jordan. Little closer. Yeah. Here's a sample. He gave the door a quick shove right into my face. I went back and down like a kingpin in a bowling alley. My breath was gone, and for a second I couldn't move. When I got my eyes open again, there were a million sleek red cars pulling away from the curb. Cars that finally narrowed to one and roared down the street, not a sight. And I knew right then and there, Ted Polanski was a hot article. You are listening to the St. Louis Blues, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The day of miracles is not done, and one way to work miracles today without leaving your home is to contribute to your Red Cross. Your contribution will go out doing the yeoman's service to your fellow humans that you would like to do yourself but cannot. Your contribution will perform miracles of aid for the homeless, the wounded, the hungry. Send your contribution out today to work miracles. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the St. Louis Blues. When I learned an old St. Louis friend named Ted Polanski turned up in the hospital after a knifing, he didn't want to see me or anybody else, including his former wife. That was the end of the line for me, till a man with a homemade manicure and spats moved in and warned me to lay off Polanski. Advice like that just doesn't sit well with me. I was back at the tambourine patching up my face when Chris told me I had company. When I came down, I spotted him at one of the tables. Slightly bald, friendly face. Before he introduced himself, I knew who he was. Cora's husband, Evan Saunders, St. Louis. Mr. Jordan, being frank about my personal affairs isn't easy for me. Well, then maybe we can just have a drink. Why, yes, of course, thank you. Uh, straight, if you don't mind. Couple straight, Chris. Mr. Jordan, you'll pardon me if I come right to the point. First, I'd better tell you that your wife was here ahead of you. Yes, I know. That's why I'm here. Cora keeps nothing from me. she tell you why? About Ted Polanski. Mr. Jordan, I... I don't want Cora to see that man. She seems to have ideas of her own. Oh, thanks, Chris. Set him down. Then you must understand. Cora's gone through too much already. Waiting all those months. Look, if you're worried about Polanski, you can forget it. No, it's Cora, Mr. Jordan. I've always known that she was never quite able to close the chapter. Never quite sure. She thinks a lot of you. But it's not the same, and I know. I was well aware that she married me, not out of love. But because she needed a home for herself and her child... It was all right for me, Mr. Jordan. I loved her deeply enough for both of us. And we've had a good life. I'm not arguing. Now I found it necessary to come to Cairo on business. Organizing a new corporation. Revolutionary cotton process. Yes, she told me that, too. And now we run across that man again. Stirring up all those old memories. I know you're an old friend of Polanski's. And that you've talked to both him and Cora. And I'll not stand for any meddling. Hey, now, wait a minute. Mr. Jordan... I'll not stand by and allow you to bring them two together again. He has no right to her. There's something good about our marriage. And I tell you, Mr. Jordan, I'm willing to fight to protect it. You better take that drink, Mr. Saunders. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Jordan. You understand, I, I feel very strongly about this. I'll protect her against that man at all costs. <laughs> After I got rid of Evan Saunders, I broke my rule and had another straight one during business hours. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought Saunders had a point. So I was off again on my way to the Cairo Hospital. This time I didn't wait for the nurse to show me in. I got to Polanski's bed and drew aside the screen. I told you not to come back, Rocky. Maybe I didn't hear you. I've been talking to some people, Ted. One of them is Cora. Or oh, don't you remember? I can forget her. Sure. But she doesn't find it so easy. Get out of here. Not yet. Lousing up your life's your own business, Ted. But this concerns Cora. She's got a good thing with Saunders. Best thing you can do is have it out with them and wash yourself out of their lives. Rocky, what do you know about me? Enough. Being a hero made you too good for her. If 
Bunch of medals and headlines meant more to you than a wife and child. You think so? Rocky, I'm going to tell you something I've been living with for the past four years. Maybe it's time I unload. I'm listening. Ted Polanski lay back in his bed, closed his eyes and turned his face away. Finally, he started talking. You despise me, Rocky. But not as much as I despise myself. But believe me, I've always loved Cora. That's why I could never go back to her. You see, I, I'm not a hero. I never was. It's not the way the papers got it. Sure, sure. I heard the same story every time somebody pinned a medal on me. I risked my life to save top drawer photographic information from a burning plane. Delayed parachute jump. Want to know why I delayed that parachute jump, Rocky? Go on, Ted. Because my parachute was torn to shreds. The other guy on the plane was wounded. So I took his parachute. He died in a crash. I parachuted to safety. I killed him, Rocky, as sure as I'm lying here. Now you got it all. Yeah. Somehow I, I couldn't go back to Cora and the kid knowing in my own mind I'd kill somebody. Well, you know how I spent my time since then, bumming around. I was never going back because I, I, I just wasn't right for her. All I knew was that the best thing to do was to keep away from Cora. But now it's not so easy. What do you mean? Her life's not what you think it is. That husband of hers, Evan Saunders, the big cotton man's a crook. He's rotten crooked and so is that phony corporation he's setting up. Where'd you get that? That's what's behind that knife in my back. He's in with a crumb named Vance Marco. Shiny car, West Bats? That's a guy. They're promoting a phony cotton refining process, starting a company selling a lot of stock, and after enough money comes in, Saunders and Marco pull out with their pockets full. How do you know all this? Because there was a third guy in the organization. Ted Polanski. Only I pulled out when I found out that Saunders was Cora's husband. I hoped I could stop the deal before Cora got hurt. <laughs> All I stopped was Marco's knife. Now I'm flat on my back and can't do a thing. But there wasn't anything to keep Rocky Jordan from doing something. I wasn't flat on my back yet. So I started out spoiling for trouble. And I didn't mind when a native started tagging me after I left the hospital. It was the same one who had covered me with a gun in Marco's car earlier that day. So I let him follow for a while... I took him down a dark side street a couple of blocks. Then I suddenly doubled back and he ducked into a doorway. This was a good time to let him make his move, so I kept coming. I reached the doorway. It was the flash of a knife, but I wasn't there. I had him by the wrist, twisting it back. I, I killed him, killed my friend. Drop that knife or I'll slap your brains against this wall. Oh, drop it. There now. Let's talk. No, 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 no. Let, let me go. That the knife he used on Polanski? No, no, I, I do not know what you mean. Polanski knows. He got a good look at you. He, he, he told you? Yeah, everything. Well, but, but it, it, it was an order. Sure, Vance Marco's order. He sent you to get me, too? Fendi, Where do I find I, Marco? I, I cannot tell. Think real hard. Come on. Yes, yes. The Athens Hotel, Sharia, Rocky. Oh, it's better. But, Fendi, what will I do? Marco, here. Ah, never mind. Where you're going, you'll get all the protection you need. I dragged him back down to the square and turned him over to a cop, along with a message to Captain Sam Sabaya. Then I was on my way to the Athens Hotel. Vance Marco had a big suite on the fourth floor front. I was about to knock when the door opened. Marco was inside with a couple of his men, and coming out was Evan Saunders. Well, Mr. Jordan, I, I didn't expect to see you here. Oh, I bet you didn't, Saunders. Uh, Mr. Marco, it's been a pleasure. I'll see you in my suite at the National Hotel tomorrow morning. Goodbye, Mr. Saunders. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Jordan. Yeah. I still don't like your face, Jordan. You did your best to change it. I was just giving you a friendly tip. It didn't pack, did it? I forget easy. You got a couple of muscles for help. Want to try again? Maybe I will. What's on your mind, Jordan? Great big deal, Marco. With a lot of little investors pouring their money into a phony corporation. <laughs> Either one of you guys know what Jordan's talking about? Got it, Marco. Polanski told me everything. 
What happens to those investors when they find out they bought into nothing? A new cotton process nobody can produce. Why ask me? Or better yet, what happens to you and Saunders? The police aren't going to like it. Let them talk to Saunders. He's on top of the deal. President, chairman. Yeah, how do you fit in? Me? I just helped out a little on the financial end. Yeah. Always works, doesn't it, Marco? Hasn't failed yet. What's your interest, Jordan? Trying to cut in? I'm giving you a chance to call it off. Well, you got the chance. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan. Corporations closed. Anything else? Yeah, a lot more. Well, I don't want to hear it. Throw him out, boy. Sure, boss. Come, come on, on Junior. Junior. And don't come back, Jordan. Next time we drop you down the elevator shaft. I picked myself up and got out the back way just in case he had somebody waiting for me. Well, even though I knew the deal, Marco felt pretty safe. I figured there was more to it than what I'd worked out. When I got back to the tambourine, it was almost 7 o'clock and Cora Saunders was waiting. I haven't changed my mind, Rocky. Okay, Cora. I think Ted's ready to talk to you. You've seen him again? Yeah. Please tell me. How is he? I think Ted Polanski's going to be all right. Thank you, Rocky. Cora? Yes? How well did you know your present husband before you married him? Well, I... I didn't know him so long before I married him. I met him in a summer resort where I was waiting tables. Oh, what I mean is, what did you know about him personally? All I know is he's... He's been very, very good to me and my child. He's a wonderfully kind man, Mr. Jordan. How about this, uh, this cotton deal he's in? Oh, he has great hopes for it. Evan thinks it'll make a lot of money and help a lot of people. Why do you ask, Rocky? Oh, no, no. Just curious. You better go talk to Ted. What are you trying to tell me? Visiting time's 8 o'clock. Ted will be waiting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Rocky, maybe you could come along. Oh, no, sorry, Cora, but I'm going to be real busy. I walked Cora to the front of the tambourine and saw that she got a taxi. Then I caught one for myself. I wanted to see Evan Saunders just once more before he pulled out for St. Louis. At the National Hotel, I got Saunders' room number and went on up without being announced. I found his door open. Saunders was there, pacing the floor. Oh, Mr. Jordan, come in. Yeah, that's my plan, Saunders. Where is Cora? Where's my wife, Mr. Jordan? You're real worried about Cora. Aren't Don't you? evade my question, Mr. Jordan. She went back to your cafe this evening. I have her message. Did she tell you where she was going from there? That's what I'm asking you. I demand to know where my wife is. Where she is at this minute, I don't know. But in another hour, she'll be at the Cairo General Hospital, talking to Ted Polanski. Mr. Jordan, I told you I don't want her to see that now man. Now tell me why. I explained that to you. I made it perfectly clear. He's hurt Cora enough. Any other reason, Saunders? Isn't that enough? Try it my way. You don't want her to talk to Polanski because you're afraid of what he might tell her. Why, he got that knife on his back, for instance. What happened to him has nothing to do Cut with... Cut it, what... Saunders. It happens Polanski told me everything. What did he tell you? Everything. The phony corporation you and Marco were setting up. Now, he moved in to spike the deal before Cora got wind of it. So you had to get rid of him. Mr. Jordan, I don't understand what you're talking about. I think you do. Didn't you wonder what I was doing at Marco's place a while ago? Certainly not. Why should I? He admitted the whole deal. The investors have been taken for every cent they put into your crooked racket. I don't believe Marco said any such thing. Ask him. Get me Mr. Vance Marco at the Athens Hotel. I'll wait. Yes, thank you. Vance Marco just checked out of the Athens Hotel. No forwarding address. Looks like you're on the griddle, buddy. Mr. Jordan, I'm not a swindler. I've been taken in by Marco just ah, like... That's a pretty good act. It's not an act. I'm innocent. I can prove it. Well, Evan Saunders started out to prove his innocence and prove that my thinking had been wrong. Mine and Ted Polanski's. He made another phone call, and then we went over to a building on Abraham Pasha Square. We went through a door marked Allenby and Allenby, attorneys. Allenby, number one, was there waiting, and Saunders told him the whole story. I said, this is a beastly affair, Mr. Saunders, beastly. I brought Mr. Jordan here, Mr. Allenby, to prove that I couldn't possibly have profited by the venture. Well, under the circumstances, perhaps it's wise. I have a folder here. Uh, oh, yes. Here you are, Mr. Jordan. 
This is a duplicate, of course. The original's been filed. Uh, just give me the quick once-over, Mr. Allenby. What's it all about? Well, <clears throat> with this document, Mr. Evan Saunders hereby assigns and grants all funds and income from his share of the Cotton Processing Corporation to charitable organizations. The Association for the United Nations, the International... Uh, wait a minute, Red wait a minute. And what? Saunders was to receive nothing from the corporation? Oh, absolutely nothing. Mr. Jordan, I hope you're convinced now that I was acting in good faith. Mr. Saunders could have had no possible motive for promoting a, a crooked venture such as this. Uh, just a second, Allenby. Yes? Why didn't you know it was a phony? You're the attorney. Oh, not for the corporation, Mr. Jordan. Vance Marco had that all set up with his own men. And he set it up very well. I was made president. My name was put on everything. And I'm left holding the bag. Right, Allenby? Yeah, fr frankly, you are in a bit of a pickle, Mr. Saunders. Your reputation will suffer and all that. No, I'll not have that. I'll repay every cent to the investors out of my own pocket. Clear up this mess as soon as possible. Well, it sort of makes things look a little different. Forget it, Jordan. We all make mistakes. Going, Mr. Jordan? Yeah. I got some clearing up of my own to do. It wasn't yet 8 o'clock, and I had to talk with Ted Polanski just once more. I got to the hospital a few minutes before visiting hours started, and Cora Saunders hadn't arrived yet. It took a little convincing, but I got to Polanski's bedside right away, and I talked fast. I made him see that Saunders was okay, that he was a good husband for Cora and good father for their daughter, that if Cora had a chance for happiness, it was up to Ted. And it was 8 o'clock, and Cora was standing at the foot of his bed, her face pale and tight. Hello, Ted. Hello, Cora. How are you feeling? All right. Uh, Cora, I'm glad you came. There are some things we can clear up. I'll wait outside. No, 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 Rocky. That's not necessary. This won't take long. Cora? Yes? I want you to know I'm glad you married Saunders. Oh, but, Ted... The thing that bothered me was that I left you flat with no one to take care of you. Take care of me. Is that all I meant to you? Somebody to be taken care of? Yes. But I was your wife. Mother of your daughter. What about her? I'm sorry, Cora. The child was just a weight around my neck, too. I stopped loving you long ago. Going away to war was just a good excuse for getting away. After it was over, I just couldn't go back to you. Well, I... I guess there isn't much you can do when there's no love left. I'm just sorry it took so long for me to find this out. Well, now you know. I never felt so good as when I left you in St. Louis. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for what? I, I never realized until this moment how... how fortunate for me it was that you did leave. I see now how lucky I was to find a man like Evan. He's a strong man and an honest one. And he loves me and our child like you never could. Oh, goodbye, Ted. I don't think there's anything more we have to say. Goodbye, Cora. Uh, goodbye, Rocky. I won't be bothering you anymore about Ted Polanski. So long, Cora. Have a nice trip back to St. Louis. Well, Rocky, how did I do? Okay. Sh she'll be all right now, won't she? I think so, Ted. In fact, I'm sure of it. Thanks, Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I left him. Later that night, I found out that Marco had been picked up boarding a plane at the Cairo airport. There wasn't much they could do to him about the phony cotton deal. He kept his nose pretty clean. But his knife man had talked, so they salted Marco away for the attempted murder of Ted Polanski. Before I turned in that night, I checked back on my day. Pretty unusual. Not a single dead body. I felt real good about it. Hi, 
time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Portrait of Rocky. It was the stifling sort of night when you expect people to stay at home and out of trouble. Later on, it got a lot hotter. I wasn't exactly done in oil, but I was plenty burned up. The night air out of the desert was thick and depressing, and the windmill fan and the tambourine made it even worse. At 11 o'clock, I sent the help home, figuring to close up early. The only trouble was a couple of customers. One was over in a corner nursing some cognac, a big shaggy specimen, dark eyes, gray showing in his beard. Might have been American once. The other one was easier. He hung onto the bar and let you know about himself. Ah. ah, tell you right to Monty I'm signing to his nose. Oh, I get the idea. You and Montgomery, like that, huh? Yeah, just let me tell you a week before Tobruk what I'm saying. I'm standing in the tanks. How about finishing it off, huh? Closing time. Oh, wait a minute, Governor. I haven't told you. Hey, hey, hey now, cut an eye full of that bloke, would you? Oh, the beard over there? Staring at me, he is. Why does he get off staring at me like that? Oh, take it easy. It's me he's looking at. You, me, what's the difference? He does it every night. Why does he get too fast? Hey, put down that bottle. A man's got a right to his privacy, ain't it? Now, go, me. I said take it easy. I'll teach him and we broke his eyes for All him. All right, Aussie, you asked for it. Let go, me. Don't you go. Come oh, on. I'd wipe the floor with you two. Good night, Aussie. Pleasant dream. <laughs> Don't bother to come back until your tank's empty. <laughs> Don't worry, Governor. I ain't bad for the last couple of drinks, remember? Waltz in Matilda, Waltz in Matilda. Oh, <laughs> What's so funny? All of it. Anger, drink, man. Yeah, well, you're next, you know. I'm closing, do you mind? Ambition is funny, too. Hatred? Well, sort of. And love? <laughs> That's the most humorous of all. Look, philosopher. Sit down, sit down, Jordan. Have a nightcap with me. Thanks. I'm having a cold shower alone. Just a friendly little cognac. You know, friendship isn't so funny. Look, pal, what's it all about? Who is he? The Australian? Yes. You heard him, a buddy of Montgomery's. Tell me, Jordan. I told you, I don't know. No, you don't, do you? Now, let me lock up, huh? Jordan, would you like to make ten pounds? That's all I have. How? Find out about him. Uh Uh-uh. Please, Jordan, I need your help. I must find out. You tell me why? I wish I could tell you, Mr. Jordan. It's just a a feeling. That man... I don't know. Then skip it. Doesn't make sense anyway. The guy's been in here once, and you've been in three or four times. Only every night you stare at me. Oh, that. You have a face, that's all. Don't most people? Most people only have... License plates. Here. Here, I'll show you. A pencil. You know, there's something in your eyes that belongs to you. One ear's a little larger. Now that's it. You're an artist, huh? You draw pictures of everybody you meet? A mouth that's for chewing instead of advertising. Yes, yes, I'm an artist. Jeffrey James. Jeffrey, not Jesse. You've never heard of me, have you? Don't let it worry you. Renoir, Michelangelo, and Rembrandt, that's all I know. Here. Here, keep it. A souvenir. Ah. It's not bad. You sure you won't reconsider? About checking on the Australian? I don't like trouble unless I know what it is. You're smarter than I thought you were, Jordan. Thanks for the picture, Mr. James. Good night. Well, he hunched his shoulders and shuffled out the door. I watched him until his dirty white suit rounded the mosque at the corner of Ben Geza. The street was empty, except for the night. 
Then I heard a motor start across the alley. Against the low yellow moon, I could see it moving. It was one of those army surplus jeeps that are all over the world. It kept its lights off, and it slowly rounded the same corner, tailing Jeffrey James. Exactly one minute later, before I'd barely started to get the place cleaned up for the night, I heard something else. Hey! Hey, Australia! Eh, Governor? Uh, come in here, will you? I want to talk. Huh. Ain't that a coincidence now? There was something I forgot to say myself. Huh? This... Well, it figured I made my mistake when I thought he was drunk. He wasn't. Neither were his brass knuckles. I came floating back to life maybe half an hour later. I was alone on the floor. The door was open and all the bugs in Egypt were holding a filibuster around the bar light. Everything else seemed to be okay. Nothing was missing. The cash register was still full. I still had my wallet. Yeah, nothing was missing except one thing. That pencil sketch the artist had drawn. A pencil sketch of me. I'd been rolled before for a wallet or a wristwatch, but never so someone could steal a pencil sketch of me by some down-and-out artist. But I never did like getting rolled, no matter what the reason. Well, I finally got my cold shower and tried for some sleep. I was awakened way too early by someone banging on the front door of the tambourine. It was Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. Good morning, Jordan. Sam, I'm not entertaining. What's the idea? A small matter. Well, let's save it till later. One moment. A beggar saw a man in your cafe last night. Eh? Is that unusual? An Australian talking to you at the bar. Sure, name's Bertie. Short, shifty eyes, seersucker suit. Why? Your memory is rather sharp, Jordan. It ought to be. Got a little noisy. I threw him out, and a few minutes later he came back with some brass knuckles. I took the count. And you did not notify the police? You want me to call you every time somebody gets rough in my cafe? Jordan, this is more serious than you think. The man you call Bertie was just found back of the tambourine. He's dead. What'd you find on him, Sam? Very little. Why? Did he take something from you last night? Uh, no money. Only a picture. P what kind of a picture? Pencil sketch of me. Uh, <laughs> of you, Jordan? Are you suggesting that a picture of you is motivation for murder? All I'm saying is he knocked me out, took it from me, and it's gone now. Mm. Well, perhaps when this Bertie sobered up and got another look at your picture... Okay, and... have your laugh, Sam. But think about it. I have much more important things to occupy my mind. Come on, Jordan. We had a look at Bertie. That didn't help my morning any. And Sam kept asking the same questions, but always kept leading back to the missing pencil sketch of me. So when Sam left, I decided to dig a little. The artist, Jeffrey James, figured to be information pleased, so I tried to run him down. A couple of art stores knew nothing about him, so I put in a phone call to somebody named Tuga Bey, Egyptian art critic on one of the newspapers. Yes, this is Tuga Bey. I'm uh, trying to locate a guy named Jeffrey James. He's a... Uh... Jeffrey James. I'm afraid I do not know. Uh, he's an artist. Oh, that James. An artist, you say. <laughs> bah, bad, no style. Uh, look, I'll read about it in your column. All I want to know is where he lives. Well... He used to have a studio at number 16, Street of Many Moses, but I don't know. Thanks. I didn't have any trouble finding it. It was down a dusty, narrow street full of flies and herb smells and peddlers. And up some outside steps to the top floor of number 16, Street of Many Moses, a peddler was doing a sales job and a very sleek young lady standing in the doorway. Madame, wait! Do not shut the door. I have the samples. Many samples. Please, no. No, go Brushes, away. Brushes, postcards, neckties, snake balls. Take your foot out of the door. Sample for every human need. Oh, Effendi, for you too, a man, I sell something. No, I'm not buying. Brushes I got. Oh, careful, mother. My foot is still there. You heard the lady brush. Uh, Effendi. Go on, if she beat it. Oh, but Effendi, if you went but look, it's <sighs> Thank you, sir. Oh, skip it. Now, now you go away, too, please. I want to come in. No, please, no. I'm looking for Mr. James. So? I'm Rocky Jordan. I'd like to see him. But, but your name means nothing to me. Mr. James is not here. Where is he? And, and the studio is so dirty. It's so poor. Well, that's it... all right. He told me he wasn't selling like Renoir. He... He said what? Oh, never mind. Oh, wait. You know, uh... Wait, I must cover the paintings. What's, uh... 
What's the matter with them? Only that they're of me. You're his model? Yes. Oh. This morning, I, I came to work on time, but how do I know I can trust you? Well, you don't, but uh, he says I got a nice face. Yes, I can see that for myself. Come on, tell me. What is it? This morning, I found a note. I, I have it here. Cheney, I'll not need you this morning. I may never need you again. Stay here. You'll hear from me once more. Well? His bed wasn't slept in. Uh, what do you know about him? I've been modeling for Mr. James for almost a year, but I know so little about him. He He's such a strange man, so so alone, so tragic. Yeah, he thinks he's a failure, but he's got some friends, some enemies, something. No, no, there's just me. I, I'm like a daughter to him. Uh, a guy in a Jeep and an Australian. You ever seen them? Why, no, I don't think so. Okay, then I'll call the police. <gasps> the police, no. Why not? Well, it, if, if something's wrong, don't you understand? It, it would only be worse for him. I see, all right. I see nothing. Please, please, for my sake, have faith in him. I just need you to help, Rocky. Well, what's your suggestion? Wait with me, please. It's only hot outside. You could draw the blinds to the window, and it's cool here. I'm not so bad to wait with, am I? Some other time, sister. I'll see you later. Hey, hey, you toothbrush. Oh, Effendi, get away, Effendi, get away. Keyhole boy, huh? <laughs> yes. Look at what you are looking at. The rod, artillery, pistol of Listen, brush boy. Brushes? Oh, a disguise, Effendi. Now we are the musing before she sees us. Okay, okay, quit shoving. Uh, hurry, please. This way. This way, Effendi. This way for a little ride with me. Oh, so that's it. You drive a jeep. All the modern appliances, Effendi. Uh, in, please. In. Where are we going? You do not ask questions. This is a caper. You know all the words, don't you? Hmm. On the shortwave radio, I am listening to Sam Spade. I know myself. So beware. Now I heard everything. Uh, permit me to present myself. Ali Ben Seamus. Seamus? Egypt must have her national character. Seamus. I am calling myself the private eye of the desert. All right, what's it all about? Why have you been following me? Well, if you please, uh, tail and plant. Last night you were following the artist, James. Why? Oh, but uh, I lost him. Uh, that is why I follow you. So you don't know where he is? Uh, no, Effendi. Some lessons I have not learned so well yet. You're not good at a lot of things. Oh, all I am trying to do is to, to raise business. I find a caper, I get myself a commission. Doing what? Well, that is the only thing I do not know. Look, Buster, spit out the sand. Who hired you? Where are you taking me? Uh, your name is Jordan Effendi, and I think maybe you will hire me. Uh, I already got a dishwasher. No jokes, please. We are going into the Royal Galleries, room 12, left wall. You will hire me. Now, uh, out, please. Sure. Well, somebody else is here, too. Look behind you. <laughs> Look behind you. Even Sam Spade is not falling for that one. Uh, have it your own way, but I happen to recognize Captain Sabaya of the Cairo police. Uh, 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 goodbye, I think. Hey! Well, Jordan, who is your hasty friend? Oh, he's a nut, Sam. If you want to crack him, you better get going. I have done enough chasing for a hot day. The one I want is you. Me? Why? A few more routine questions. Okay, just stay with me. Come on. Jordan, where are you going? Into the Royal Galleries to get you some answers. I grabbed Sam's arm and pulled him into the Royal Galleries. It was all crazy, but I had to take a look at what had been in the Seamus' mind. He'd said, room 12, left wall. I found it all right. It wasn't the same sketch Jeffrey James had drawn last night. This one was fancier, but it had the same lines, the same style. Underneath, a little bronze plate said, Portrait of a Gentleman, original sketch by Renoir, worth 5,000 pounds. Only I knew better. Why? Because it was a picture of me, Rocky Jordan. You are listening to Portrait of Rocky, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. 
Today we salute San Francisco CBS station on the occasion of the change of the call letters from KQW to KCBS. For the best entertainment on the air, for the nation's favorite personalities, remember it is now KCBS at 740 on the radio dial in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Portrait of Rocky. Well, there I was, framed very nicely in the art gallery. A pencil sketch of me valued at a few thousand pounds, done by Renoir. Well, somebody had themselves a deal selling phony pictures by old art masters and collecting a fancy buck for them. But who? The artist who drew them? The Australian who stole the sketch from me and ended up dead? The model or Ali Ben Seamus? There are a lot of people in the play, but as we stood there in front of the picture in the gallery, Sam Sabaya kept looking at me, because he was interested in finding a murderer. Mm, yes, Jordan, it, it might be you. The, there is a certain resemblance. I tell you, it is me. You could see that fast sketch James did of me last but night. But art is not one of my specialties, Jordan. Murder is. Now, who killed the Australian? Oh, how should I know? How should anyone else know? I, I will search for the others you speak of, but I would not want to lose you, Jordan. Look, Sam, look here at the nose. The ears, one's bigger, see? What are you trying to prove, Jordan? That this artist you want to help is some kind of a forger, a crook? Uh, that's the hard part. Well, anyway, Jordan, it is not likely the Royal Gallery would accept a fraud, is it? This uh, Renoir is on loan from Mrs. Baldwin Wentworth. She's very important, very skillful, very rich. Okay, I'll see her myself. Why, Jordan? I am the police. Don't you understand? It's my face. She can look at my face. <laughs> yes, your face. The police can hardly protect her from that. <laughs> Mrs. Baldwin Wentworth lived in a private pyramid with a view of the Nile. She was maybe ten years older than she tried to look. When I got there, she was pouring tea for a, a slob in a fez. It was Tuga Bay, the art critic I talked to on the phone that morning. Yes, yes, we talked on the telephone, didn't we? You were looking for that fellow James. Dreadful sense of color. James? James? Never heard of him. Who is he? Uh, sugar and milk, Mr. Jordan? Uh, thanks. I'd like a slice of lemon. May I ask why it was you wished to find him? Really, I don't particularly care who he is. You needn't bother telling me. Oh, it's frightfully hot. I uh, wanted him to paint me a mural, Mr. Bay, that's all. Oh, yes, yes, of course, that's it. A restaurateur, you say you are. I own a place. Oh, people eat so much, don't they? But it would be nice, wouldn't it? One of those lovely panoramic things over your bar, I suppose. With simply acres of female flesh. Bad for the digestion, though, I should think. Uh, Mrs. Wentworth, about your Renoir. You were saying you bought it here in Cairo just a day or two ago. Did I? Oh, but of course I must have. How much did you pay for it? Oh, uh, um, oh, blast, how should I know? What's the five pounds? That's what uh, I printed in my article. There you are, young man. Newspapers never lie. Isn't it just possible that your Renoir isn't real? That you threw away over $20,000 on a phony? <laughs> That's a ridiculous notion. I'm an expert, Mr. Jordan. And took her here. He's frightfully keen. The picture is perfectly genuine. The find of the season. Mrs. Wentworth, take a look at me. Oh? You've studied the drawing. It could be my photograph. What? It's me. Look at me. Don't you see it in my face? Really, young man. All I can see in your face is my desire to be 25 years younger. <laughs> there, now. That's the nicest thing I've said all day. Thank you, Mrs. Wentworth. I wish you were. Goodbye. Oh, Jordan. Jordan, wait a moment. Yes, Mr. Bay? Um, about that picture. What about it? You said it was genuine. And I am certain it is. I have staked my reputation as a critic on the authenticity of that Renoir. Then we haven't anything to talk about. No, wait, Jordan. You interest me. Tell me, does Jeffrey James have any connection with this, uh, this impossible theory of yours? Nothing much, except that he drew my picture and sold it to Mrs. Wentworth for 5,000 pounds. But it's preposterous. Is it? Why don't you ask Jeffrey James? I most certainly shall. And immediately, Jordan. (laughs) 
Tortuga Bay moved out fast. And next, I went looking for the agent who'd sold the Renoir. Only he'd taken off the day before to visit the Louvre in Paris. I got around, talked to a lot of people, but they all thought I was nuts. And an hour later, I began to think so myself. I headed back for the tambourine about sunset. I was just crossing the street in front of my place when a little jeep whirled around the corner and I jumped for the curb. Oh, I find it, Jordan. I find you. Uh, Ollie, the Seamus. Where you been? Well, that I have come to tell you. I am convinced the life of a private eye is a bomb racket. All right, come off the spade routine, Ali. I'm not buying. Oh, but this you should know, Effendi. There is a murdered man. I discovered him a short time ago lying in an alley back of the street of Many Moses. You discovered who? The art critic, Tugabe. Tugabe is dead? Yes, Effendi. He had been shot only a short time. Come on, let's go. Where, Effendi? Back to Tugabe. Now, start it up, Ali. As you wish, Effendi. And now, uh, suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything you know. But there is nothing you do not know yourself. You're avoiding the police too much, Ali. Why? Oh, please, you are touching a sore point, Mr. Jordan. All right, let's have it. Even in Cairo, the eye must be legit. No license? Natural intelligence, they admit I have. Uh, But I am handicapped. How so? Mirror vision. Say that again. Oh, please, it is not good for my ego... The world I see backwards. Only a few people are so afflicted with mirror vision, and I am one. Yeah. Something's beginning to add up. What did you say, Effendi? You're the only one who looked at the Renoir and said it was me. That is true. Nobody else could see the resemblance, because that drawing is wrong side, too. Like I see myself when I shave every day, like the guy who drew it. Uh, Like he what, Effendi? Jeffrey James sat in my tambourine night after night, staring at me in a bar mirror. That is it. He studies you. He is making a sketch. He sells it as a master for big money. He made another for me in the tambourine freehand. Oh, yes. Evidence against him. A mistake. So when it falls into the hands of the Australian, James must kill him. Uh, I don't need a diagram. I put Tuga Bay on the artist trail today. James had to kill him, too. Ah, so, Effendi Jordan, we have got our man. Ali Ben Seamus parked his jeep a couple of blocks from where he discovered the body of Tuga Bay. A crowd of natives was milling around the spot, so we knew the police were there, too. I didn't want to talk to them just yet, not till I paid Jeffrey James a visit. So I headed on foot for his studio, and the eye of the desert flapped along behind like a a boy scout on his first snipe hunt. It was dark by now, and the street of many Moses didn't look quite so shabby. We groped up the rickety steps, and Jeannie answered my nod. Mr. Jordan, what do you want? A word with your artist friend, Jeffrey James. But I told you he's gone. I still haven't heard from him. I, I'm so worried. Why? Well, so many strange things are happening. Yeah, like the murder of Tuga Bay. Mr. Jordan, no. no. What are you doing? Getting a look at these pictures you covered up this morning. Oh, please, I... Here, I'll... have a look, Ollie. They're not all pictures of Jeannie. Renoirs, Monet's, Gauguin's, all phonies by Jeffrey James. Right, Jeannie? Why, yes, but but what does it matter? It adds up, Effendi. Now we know this girl is covering up for the artist. You're right, Ali. I don't understand. What is this all about? It's simple, Jeannie. Your boss has been playing people like Mrs. Wentworth for suckers, selling his own stuff as originals of masters, then killing when anybody got in his way. Oh, no, this can't be. Jeffrey's like a father. He couldn't harm anyone. Yeah. Where is he, Jeannie? I don't know. Now, please go. Let them stay, Jeannie. Jeffrey. It is the artist. Watch him, Mr. Jordan. Calm yourself, my boy. It's as Jeannie says I would harm no one. Uh, we've got a different idea, James. Yes, I know. I heard everything. You've made a great mistake, Mr. Jordan. Oh, yeah? Like spotting these masterpieces as phonies you drew yourself? Is that a mistake? Not at all. For many years I've known that I wasn't a creator. So what better could I do than imitate the work of great artists? Sure, and then sell them as originals. Mr. Jordan, do you think I would represent my feeble efforts as the work of masters? There's a picture hanging in the Royal Gallery, says you would. One moment. Let me show you something. What is this, F.N.D.? Just watch him, Molly. We'll move this Renoir over under the light. Now, with my mat knife, I will scrape off the name of Renoir. Now, step over here, Mr. Jordan. Read what is underneath Imitation of Renoir by Geoffrey James, 1947. 
Now you realize I couldn't possibly have represented the sketch as anything but my own. Ah, you're clear, Jeffrey. Sorry I didn't get it right the first time. So, Mr. Jordan, why don't we forget this whole affair? That's not so easy. Somebody sold that picture hanging in the Royal Galleries as a genuine article, and two people were killed because of it. The police want to know why. Are the police necessary? Yeah. Very well, Mr. Jordan. Let us go to them. I will confess to the murders. Jeffrey, what are you saying? Quiet, Jeannie, my dear. It's the best way. So, Effendi, uh, Geoffrey James is the killer. We have apprehended him. No, Ali, but you'll get your badge. We have the killer. Please, Mr. Jordan, let's say no more. The cover-up's the other way around, isn't it, Mr. James? If you look in Jeannie's room, I'll bet you'll find the 5,000 pounds for that picture. Wait. Recently, I've been aware of many things. But for Jeannie's sake... You'd do anything for her, wouldn't you? Even after she's made a sucker out of you. Mr. Jordan... Try it this way. Jeannie knows how you feel about her, so she gets away with plenty. She and Tuga Bay hatch up this idea of selling your imitations as originals. When you start getting wise, they put the Australian on your trail. You learn too much. He was killed. Not by Jeannie. What difference does it make? Then Ollie here scratched around too much. Things begin falling apart. So Jeannie decided to get rid of Tuga Bay and keep all the money for herself. Oh, it's all so easy. You take the blame, Jeffrey. You're the sucker. Please let her go, Mr. Jordan. She and I will go away together. No, Jeffrey. And... Only I will go. Effendi, she has a gun. Yes, and there are enough bullets to kill all of you. Please, Jeannie, my darling. Shut up. I'll do it quickly. Why do you cringe, Jeffrey? Effendi, Jordan, what do we do now? You're a detective, Ali. You tell me. Oh, yes. Sam Spade, he would think quickly. He would move in. Ali, no. So you're the first. She swung around, but he kept coming, and she fired on him point blank. That was my chance. Before she could swing back, I had her by the wrist, and the gun dropped. Jeannie scratched me up a little, but she knew she was through. All this time, Jeffrey James stood as though in a stupor. Well, as usual, Sam Sabaya was moving around a couple of steps behind me, and the gunshot brought him quick. Jordan! All right, here's your killer, Sam. She just tried it again. Yeah. Greco, Amul, take everyone into custody at once. At once, if it... Uh, lay off the artist. He's okay. I will get a full statement at headquarters from everyone. Uh, Jordan, who, who, who is this? Ali Ben Seamus. She only creased him. He's coming out of it. Ben... Is this the, the, the pest who is always hounding me for a detective's license? Yeah. And I think he won his color, Sam. Oh, wait. Oh, I, I think they are... I did not do so well. I fear capers are not for me. Well, think again, Ollie. I got an idea you'll get your license now. Can it be, Effendi, that I will be a real private eye? How about it, Sam? Hmm? Uh, oh, uh, well, Jordan, uh, if, if what you... Uh, perhaps. Oh, so? Now, when the telephone rings, I will say, Ali Ben Seamus, the license number 34687... Oh, but uh, now I am tired. Sure. Do you know what your friend Sam Spade would say in a case like this? What, if indeed? Good night, sweetheart. Buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you by Del Monte Foods, the brand preferred by more women than any other line of canned fruits and vegetables in the world. Far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, The Big Heist. <laughs> It started on the afternoon I took a walk to the British Embassy office. One of my customers the night before had lost his passport at the tambourine. 
I was going to turn it over to the consul and have him deliver it to the owner. I went through a large plate glass door into the ante room of the embassy office. There was a map of the British Isles on the wall and a couple of travel posters of the Dominions. A big mahogany desk stood in the middle of the floor right next to a full waste paper basket. Behind the desk sat a British brunette with a French haircut. She was the consul's secretary. You could tell she was real efficient by the way she was spreading red polish on her fingernails. Yes? May I help you? Now, my name's Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine. One of your nationals left his passport in my place last night. Oh? Well, here it is. Uh, you'll see to it that he gets it. Oh, yes. Just toss it on that pile. My fingernails are still wet. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Jordan. I'm sure whoever it is that lost their passport appreciates your returning it very much. Excuse me a moment. Miss, um... Buckley, Helen Buckley. I couldn't help seeing that telegram lying on your desk. Oh. It says it's from McLean. Could that be Freddie McLean from London? Why, yes. Flew with the RAF, flies British transport now? The same one. Oh, we're old friends. We always get together every time he makes Cairo. I, uh, see he's coming in. Yes. The telegram says keep Thursday night open. You saw it. You say I don't like to break in on anything, but... How about you and I meeting him at the airport together? Have supper on me, rehash old times a bit, and then, well, you two can carry on from there. Well... Uh, Just a suggestion. Skip it. No, 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 no. I suppose it's all right. Might even be fun. It's a date, Mr. Jordan. Make it rocky. All right. Rocky. Thursday evening, then. <laughs> Well, Helen Buckley and I were at the airport Thursday evening waiting. The Cairo airport's a modern affair, a very busy place. Planes shuttling in and out from all parts of the world. EWA flight 907 for Athens, Rome, Geneva, Paris, and New York. From where we were standing, I could see the big constellation being ready for its flight to the United States. It gave me a lonely feeling. But I shook it off as the PA spoke again. British transport... Flight 6-1, arriving now from London, England. Oh, that should be Freddy's plane, Rocky. Yeah. Come on, let's get closer. We watched the big plane taxi up to gate 4. Then they cut the motors and the passengers began to disembark. Then we watched the crew come out. And we were in for a surprise. Freddie McLean wasn't among them. Well, we asked a few questions about him, but no one knew anything. We figured we might as well leave. That's when I spotted an armored car with a couple of guards parked off the side of the field. Alongside the armored car was a black limousine that looked real familiar. It was Captain Sam Sabaya's police car, and he was standing by it, nervously looking at his wristwatch. Sergeant Greco was there, too, and a couple of very British-looking gentlemen in street clothes. It was a cool evening, but they were all sweating. I got a funny notion that maybe they were waiting for the same one Helen and I were, so I decided to find out. Hiya, Sam. Hmm? Oh, Jordan. Looks like you're hard at work. Armored truck, guards, grim look. Yes, Jordan, I am hard at work. Uh, waiting for something? Uh, please, Jordan, I do not have time for conversation. Now, if you do not mind, I would appreciate it. Sorry, if... Sam. Just thought I'd say hello. Yes, yes, of course. Now, if you will excuse me, yes, Jordan... Yes, we've both been disappointed, Sam. I was waiting for a friend who never showed. Indeed. Well, we shall talk of it another time. Name's now... Freddie McLean. He's uh, a pilot. Who did you say? Freddie McLean. Are you interested? Are you here alone, Jordan? Now, that young lady standing over there is with me. We were waiting together. You'll be kind enough to get her, Jordan, then step into the rear seat of my limousine. That an order? Yes. Mr. Bliss of the British Intelligence Service and I have some questions to ask of you. Helen and I moved into the back seat of Sam's car. Sam and Mr. Bliss, a thin, wiry, energetic man with a drawn face, sat in front and spoke over the back of their seat. Mr. Bliss carried the ball and he wasn't soft. Mr. Jordan, Miss Buckley... Captain Sabaya tells me you were at the airport waiting for Freddie McLean. Yeah, that's right. What do you know of McLean? Well, he's an old friend of mine. I knew him when he was flying in the RAF. He's flying British transport now. And you were under the impression he was due at the Cairo airport tonight? That's right. How did you arrive at that impression? Say, what's this all about? Is he coming in or isn't he? You will please answer Mr. Bliss's question, Jordan. Well, Helen can tell you. Well, I... I got a telegram from him. A telegram? Yes. What did it say? Not very much, just keep Thursday evening open. 
I assumed from that he was flying in Thursday night. Do you have the telegram, Miss Buckley? Well, I, I really don't know. I, I can look around the office, but I've probably thrown it away. She had it, though, Bliss. I saw it. I see. Well, what happened? What's wrong? Why hasn't he come in? Captain Sabai, you'll please take Mr. Jordan and Miss Buckley's addresses so I may question them later, if necessary. Now... Don't we get any explanation? I'm afraid not. Not only no explanation, Jordan, but a further order. You are to mention McLean's name to no one. Nor are you to speak of what has occurred here. Is that clear? Yeah. Now you are free to go, but do not make any trips or plans of trips out of the city without notifying us first. Something was up, something big. And whatever it was, it looked like Helen and I were right in the middle. Well, it was past supper time when we left Sam and Bliss, so we picked up a cab and headed for the house of Pompeii. But our appetites were someplace else, and we took it lightly. As we stepped out of the restaurant and started down the Sharia Muhammad Ali, going toward Helen's apartment house, I spotted a tan gabardine overcoat leaning against the telephone pole. It was draped around a heavy set man with hanging jowls and black horn rimmed glasses. I knew we were being watched. I saw Helen to her apartment house safely. Then I turned my attention to the guy in the glasses. But as I moved toward him, he moved in the opposite direction. I had to pick up speed. He led me around the corner and down to the alley where he ducked in. I ducked in after him. The man in a gabardine overcoat was still running. I didn't notice the two guys standing against the wall till one of them got his foot in the way. Just as I figured. Poor sense of balance. Go on, Maxie, help him up. Oh, save it. I can handle it myself. No, no, Maxie wants to help you. Sure. Maxie wants to help you. Come on. All right, Jordan. Strain yourself. Nothing strains Maxie. He takes pills. Yeah, I take pills. You're a little out of your district, Jordan. Maybe. The tambourine's the other way. What you doing over here? Passing out handbills. Uh, what kind of an answer is that? What kind of a question is it? What do you guys want? You were following a friend of ours. Oh, was I? He doesn't like to be followed. Well, neither do I. What you like isn't the point, Jordan. Who is he? guy with the glasses. A bad question, Jordan. Show him how bad that question was, Maxie. Sure. Maxie will show him. <coughs> Hurt, Jordan? Well, let him have his fun. I'll get my turn. You heard the man, Maxie. Have fun. Yeah. Maxie's gonna have fun, Max. Yeah. <coughs> okay, Maxie, okay. I can't stand the hilarity. Yeah. From now on, Jordan, the only things you follow are blondes. Drip him over that garbage can, Maxie. He gets the point. It took a while for the ground to get steady again. And by then, the two muscles had vanished into the Cairo night. I dragged myself out of the alley and whistled a taxi to a stop. It took me to the Cairo police station for a word with Captain Sophia. Even at that late hour, Sam was still sitting behind his desk. Bliss of the British Intelligence Service was standing by the window. They both looked real worried, like goldfish in a shark pond. Jordan, what are you doing here this time of night? I got a complaint. But what happened to you? Helen and I were being followed tonight. After I dropped her off, I tried for the tag man. I didn't get him, but two of his friends got me. I can give you a description of the big boy. Go on. Oh, 45 or so. Heavy set. About 5'10", I'd say, 200 pounds. Big jowls, black horn rim glasses. Walks with a lean to the left. You could identify him if you saw him again, Mr. Jordan? A pleasure, Mr. Bliss. What about the two men in the alley, Jordan? That was too dark. All I can tell you is what their fists felt like. I shall have Sergeant Greco bring in some pictures from the Rose Gallery, and perhaps you will be able to find a photograph of the man you followed. Yeah. Look, fellas, don't you think I've earned some answers? What's this all about? What's the mystery around McLean? Mr. Bliss... Hmm? Shall Jordan be told? You might as well tell him, Captain. He's in it now, whether he wants to be or not. Jordan, earlier today, a transport plane left the London airport carrying uh, cargo. Its destination, the Cairo airport. And Freddie McLean was the pilot? Yes, but the flight was to be most secret. No one was to know of it. Why? Because of the nature of the cargo. The Federated Bank of London was sending $1 million in gold coin to its branch bank here in Cairo. Oh, I see. That's what the armored cars and guards were for. Unfortunately, Jordan, there was a leak. Perhaps the telegram McLean sent to Helen Buckley. Perhaps something else. At any rate, there was a leak. The plane did not arrive at the Cairo airport. 
So that's big trouble. Communication with it was lost someplace over the desert. And so, Jordan, a huge cargo plane, Freddie McLean and two other men, and one million dollars in gold coin have all completely vanished. <laughs> Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. One sure way to prove to yourself what a wonderful cooking aid Del Monte tomato sauce is, is to ask experienced homemakers, cooks who have used it year after year. Mrs. Arthur Bergreen of Portland, Oregon, for instance, is one of these experienced cooks. She said, Over the years, I've used lots of Del Monte tomato sauce, and I've always liked it. To me, Del Monte tomato sauce is superior in flavor and rich red color, and it's seasoned just right. <laughs> you should see my husband go for the rich home-cooked dishes I make with Del Monte tomato sauce. Spanish rice, I think, is his favorite, but he likes them all. Yes, I certainly am a Del Monte fan. Cooking with Del Monte tomato sauce is so easy... And the way it brings out the flavors of the foods it is cooked with is really wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Burgreen. Yes, friends, cooking with Del Monte tomato sauce is so easy, and it has a very special way of bringing out all the flavor of the food you cook with it. Look for Del Monte tomato sauce, the original tomato sauce with the matchless flavor. <laughs> Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Big Heist. Well, Sam had cleared some of it up. At least he had told me why he and Bliss were so worried. So a million dollars in gold coin was missing. The problem was uh, how to get it back. I spent a couple of more hours at the station going through some photos Sam had. But I didn't spot the man I tried to follow. Then Sam said I could go. I went back to the tambourine and hit the sack, but I didn't sleep well. I was worried about McLean, why he'd been stupid enough to send a telegram. The next morning, I had a visitor at the tambourine. A skinny guy with a hawk nose and dirty robes and a smell like a camel. Fendi Jordan, owner of this most noble establishment. Yeah, that's right. My name is Luca. I am a driver of the camels. I have followed the desert trails all my life. A humble lot for a humble man. Uh, what's on your humble mind, Luca? <laughs> you will please excuse the intrusion, Effendi, but observe this small black book. It's an address book. Observe the page I have folded. My address with phone number. Where'd you get this book, Luca? Uh, I'm the person of a poor Inglesi who lost himself on the desert. A flyer? Uh, his clothes were most odd. He's got a name. Uh, one I do not know. Uh, where is he now? Somewhere. But safe. Uh, he is then a friend of yours. Uh, maybe. And you wish to be taken to him? And so do the police. Oh, but Luca cannot permit that. Luca will take the offended Jordan to this man if the offended Jordan will be considerate of the fact that Luca is a poor man with three wives and many, many children. Uh, how much do you want? Hey. Your wish, Effendi. Five pounds. Will the good Effendi wish again? All right, ten then. Now, come but on. But no police. If the police are called, I shall deny my conversation with you and become as silent as the sphinx of my forebearers. I know I know you're not trying to get me out of the desert for another reason. A foreigner who chooses to live in the desert land, Effendi, is one who will take chances. Uh, I got a phone call to make. Be right with you. I walked into the office and picked up the phone. Luca tagged along. He wanted to be sure I didn't ring the police. I didn't. I dialed Helen Buckley's number. It rang a couple of times, and I heard her voice. Hello. Hello, Helen. It's Rocky. Rocky? I'm glad you called. Any news on Freddy? Yeah, maybe. Listen, I haven't got much time. I think I got a lead on it. A lead? What do you mean? I got a visitor here right now. Camel driver who says he found someone out in the desert. Freddy, I think, and he's got him hidden away. Where? I don't know. I'm going with him now. How do you know he's telling you the truth? Oh, I don't. Rocky, don't do anything foolish. Well, stick close to your phone. If you don't hear from me in three hours, notify Sam. Yes, of course. And good luck, Rocky. Thanks. See you later. All right, Luca, let's go. 
Luca nodded and we left the tambourine. I drove to the outskirts of town where Luca got old-fashioned. He had a couple of horses waiting. We switched and soon we were riding over the sand. He led me over an obscure desert trail over endless dunes of hot, still sand, then turned off the trail and wound me in so many circles I felt like a roulette wheel with a loose bearing. It was about an hour and a half after we left the tambourine that I saw a couple of solitary palm trees jutting up toward the sky. When we got closer, I saw a tent. That's where Luca was taking me. A few minutes later, we were reining our horses to a stop. Uh, you will find the Inglesi in the tent. Uh, I hope so. Uh, you coming in? I will wait outside. The Effendi will go into the tent alone. Uh, okay, I took it this far. Guess I can take it the rest of the way. I walked to the tent and threw open the flap. The first thing I saw was a body draped on a blanket on the floor. It was dressed in aviator's clothes, and the mop of red hair told me it could have been Freddie McLean. But he was lying face down. I went over to him. It was Freddie McLean, all right. There was a bullet wound in his shoulder, and he was sleeping. I shook him gently and woke him. Hmm? Uh, Rocky. Rocky Jordan. The same. Where, where, where am I? You're in a camel driver's tent on the desert. But how did you get here? Eh, uh, long story, Mac. How do you feel? Well, better. The last thing I remember, I was wandering around the desert. Yeah. Um, you strong enough to ride a horse? Yes, I think so. How's the shoulder? Well, as good as can be expected. Well, we got to get into the city. A lot of people are wondering about you. I can imagine. Look, I know about the gold coin you were flying for the bank. What happened? I still don't believe it. Let's hear it. Well, we were flying without incident until we hit a stretch of the desert close to Cairo. The next thing I knew, there was a strange voice on my radio. It came from a fighter plane on my tail. Fighter plane? Yes. He had his guns on us. Well, we weren't carrying any guns. It was a secret flight, and we didn't want to get any attention by loading up with guns. Anyway, the fighter plane made us cut our radio, then forced us into a landing on some isolated airstrip in the desert somewhere. That sure took a lot of planning. Well, they thought it was worth it. There was a lot of gold on my plane. What happened to your crew? Yeah, dead. I, I got away somehow. I, I imagine they didn't care much. They knew I'd caught a bullet, and I, I suppose they thought that I'd die out on the desert. You remember where that airstrip is? Approximately. All right. Let's get into town and tell Sabaya. Come on, I'll help you. No! No! Please do not! Jordan! Avendi! Luca! Luca! He won't answer, Jordan. Maxi just separated him. Yeah, Maxi just separated him. You fellas are pretty busy, aren't you? Oh, there's enough to do. Maxie, throw a little sand over that camel driver and scatter the horses. Sure, Zarko. You know, McLean, we owe Jordan a vote of thanks. He was a good enough Joe to lead us right to you. All right. Out of the tent. Go ahead, climb in the back seat of the Jeep. Watch the tour. Don't ask. You won't like it. Let's just say a friend of mine's real anxious to see the both of you. I bet he's nearsighted. And also rich. You know, he, he just picked up a million dollars in gold someone left sitting around in an old airplane. He won't have it long. He'll lose it in taxes. Uh-uh. My friend just won't report it as income. And anyone who tries to is going to get separated. Just like Luca. Well, the second lap of that desert journey of mine was taken in the back seat of a jeep. Zarko drove and Maxi sat in front with a tommy gun across his lap. It didn't take a sand diviner to guess where we were going. An hour or so later, we were pulling into an old abandoned oasis, stuck in the middle of some ruins from an early dynasty. There was an airstrip leading to it, probably left over from the last war. To one side, under some camouflage netting, stood the British transport plane McLean had flown from London. Alongside of it stood a fighter plane. That's all we saw. Next thing I knew, we were hustled down some stone stairs. The door was open in front of us, and a heavy hand gave us a shove. Don't go away. I'll be back in a minute with some company. Well, what's that? How's your shoulder, Freddy? All right. Uh -oh. Put a bar across the door. Yes, I, I don't see any other way out. They're really playing for keeps. I can't understand how they got wind of this thing. How they knew I was flying in the gold on that particular day. Well, I can answer that. Oh, but how could you know? The whole thing was secret. What we were flying and especially when. You gave it away. I did? A telegram you sent. Telegram? To Helen Buckley. Saying keep Thursday night open. Anyone who saw it could figure out when you were coming in. I thought you had more sense than that. But, Rocky, I didn't send her a telegram. Huh? I didn't. I flew in the war. I know how to keep it secret. Well, somebody sent it. 
There must have been a leak in London someplace, like Sabaya said. The telegram was used as a signal. It was sent to her to tell what day you were flying. Daco's boss probably kept an eye on the telegrams going to Helen Buckley and picked up the right day that way. Yeah. You think there's any way out of here? If they gave us long enough time to let our fingernails grow, how else we can dig through those walls? Oh, you make it sound very hopeful. The only hope we've got is Helen. I told her to notify Sam if I didn't get in touch with her in three hours. The three hours are up. Well, they would still have to find us. Yeah, that's right. Look, goes back. With his boss, I'll bet. There they are. Yes, the most joyful sight. Good afternoon, Mr. Jordan, Mr. McLean. You know, we almost met once before in an alley by Helen Buckley's place. Yes, almost. Did uh, you do all the brain work on this? Most of it. Must have given you a headache. I had some notable assistants from Sacco and Maxey and the Confederate in London and someone else in Cairo whom both of you know very well. Uh, come in, Miss Buckley. Helen. Yes, Rocky. Well, I guess I had the telephone conversation with the wrong person. Oh, for us, it was the right person. Instead of notifying the police, I called Mr. Bannister. And this, Mr. Jordan, is the result. It's all over, huh? The gold is hidden in the ruins of this oasis. It shall be flown out of Egypt the moment you two are disposed of. And now, Zarko, my lad... <laughs> Look, we'll see what's going on. Yeah, I'll go take a look. Bannister! It's the police! They got Maxi! They're all around! They're all been... Bannister! The police! Uh... Zacho sprawled out on the dirt floor, pretty dead. Helen stood looking at him, too stunned to move. But Bannister wasn't. He started up the stone steps looking for a place to run. I caught him on the top step and grabbed his back of his shirt collar. I spun around, tried to use his knee, but my fist was fast. That bounced him off the dirt wall. I moved in to try again, but Sam Sabaya stepped up and stopped the fight. That would be sufficient, Jordan. Yeah. All right, men. Take Bannister away. Have him take Helen Buckley, too, Sam. She and McLean are down in that room. Also take Miss Buckley into custody and see if Mr. McLean is all right. Well... That's it, Sam. You'll find the gold coin hidden in the ruins someplace. Bannister will tell us exactly where. Do not fear. Well, I'm still a little confused, Sam. Hmm? How'd you get here just when you did? How'd you know where to come? You told me, Jordan. I told you. Do you not remember? No. But nevertheless, you did, Jordan. Come, let us go back to the police station. I shall explain it all to you there. <laughs> In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. With Thanksgiving Day coming up next Thursday, one thing is sure. You won't have to worry about what the main dish is going to be. But planning dishes to go with the turkey is sometimes a problem. So here's a suggestion. Why not serve shrimp or crab cocktails? They're easy to fix, and they're a grand way to get your meal off to a flying start. Yes, a shrimp or crab cocktail is a wonderful starter for that Thanksgiving Day dinner. So easy to fix and so tasty when made with Del Monte catsup. Use it plain or in any special recipe you like. Yes, seafood cocktails certainly profit by the extra zip and zest you get in Del Monte catsup. You see, Del Monte catsup is made with pineapple vinegar the exclusive, superlatively fine vinegar that coaxes out all the very best tomato flavor in catsup. No other catsup has pineapple vinegar. Only Del Monte catsup has it. And Del Monte catsup costs less than many other quality brands. Ask your grocer for Del Monte catsup today. Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. <laughs> That was just about it. Sam left some of his men to gather up the gold coin, and the rest of us rode back into Cairo. Freddie McLean was taken to the hospital to have his shoulder dressed. Helen Buckley and Bannister made the lockup. I went to Sam's office with him and Mr. Bliss, the special British investigator. The first thing Sam did was dispatch the coroner to take care of Zako and Maxie. Second thing he did was brew some of that very strong Egyptian coffee. We all had a cup, and for once, it tasted good. 
Well, Mr. Bliss, what are you going to do about Bannister's London contact? The one who sent the telegram through to Helen. I'll have my London office trace the telegram. They'll find out who sent it and make the arrest. After that, I'll wire the London bank and tell them their one million dollars in gold coin has been recovered. Yeah, that shouldn't make them sore. Well, Sam, what about it? What about what, Jordan? I still want to know how you got to Bannister's hideout. As I said, Jordan, you told us how. A moment, please. Now, uh, listen. Listen, I haven't got much time. I think I got a lead on him. A lead? What do you mean? I got a visitor here right now. A camel driver who says he found someone out in the desert. Freddy, I think. And he's got him hidden away. Where? I don't know. I'm going with him now. How do you know he's telling you the... Well, Jordan, does that answer your question? My conversation with Helen. Mm. He had my phone tapped. Oh, uh, I'm afraid I'm responsible for that, Mr. Jordan. You see, I couldn't trust anyone. And while you were here last night, I had my men set it up. After that, Jordan, it was just a matter of following you through the desert. Well, I'm not complaining. At any rate, Jordan, Mr. Bliss has now learned something that I have known for a long, long time. What's that, sir? If one ever wishes to locate the source of trouble in Cairo, one should simply observe your movements very carefully. <laughs> Why? Because somehow, Jordan, you always manage to end up right in the middle of it. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you by Del Monte Foods, the brand preferred by more women than any other line of canned fruits and vegetables in the world. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with a babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, Smokescreen. It was the other side of midnight, and I was beginning to think I'd spent one of those routine days I could forget. That just goes to show how wrong you can be. The customers and the help had gone, and I walked over to the front door to let a little air in before I locked up for the night. I got the air all right, but I also got something I wasn't counting on. Mrs. Jordan. Mrs. Jordan. She moved in out of the shadows like she'd been waiting there. She was inside like a magazine salesman. But she didn't look the part. She was small and dark, but all woman with eyes a little too big for her face. Monsieur Jordan, you do not remember me? Oh, give me time. It'll come to me. I was a manicurist. Oh, I... sure, manicurist at Shepherd's. Oui. Uh, Adele, wasn't it? Adele Simano. Monsieur Jordan, I had to see you. And the light's better in the daytime. No, no, this had to be tonight. I'm asking you, please, to do something for me. It will not be difficult. Who ever heard that before? I'd like to help Miss Simano, but it makes a long day. I will pay you if that concerns you so much. I ask no favors. Well? I can answer better if I know what it's about. Oh, thank you, Monsieur Jordan. Wait here but a moment. She moved out the door again and walked a few steps to a shadow near the corner. Then they were both coming back. The shadow was a man, much older and grayed. I wasn't sure about the pallor in his face, but the look in his eyes meant something. I'd seen fear before too many times. Monsieur Jordan, this is my father, André Simonot. Hello, Simonot. Monsieur Jordan, I... Must explain that what we ask is my daughter's wish. Please, Papa. It is settled. There is no other way. Well, maybe I'm the one to decide that. What's this all about, anyhow? It is little to ask, Mr. Jordan. We wish only that the cafe tambourine remain open for us tonight. That we be permitted to stay here. Oh, I get it. Big convention in town, huh? Hotels are all full. You do not understand. We also wish that you stay here with us to watch my father. He needs watching. I'm trying to tell you. You have only to witness my father's presence here. Oh, I expected something like that. Good night, Simono. The tambourine closed ten minutes ago. You will not tell us. Look, I've been taken in in my day, but this isn't my day. You walk in here and tell me you want a witness for Papa. Why? Because somewhere in Cairo, something has happened or is going to happen. Either way, it won't be good. Because I'm supposed to pull the chestnuts out of the fire. 
Oh, no thanks. I burned too easy. I told you I'd pay you. The police work for free. But we can't go to the police. If you let me explain. Sure, I'll stop in for a manicure someday. You can tell me all about it. You see, Adele, I was right. And I thought you were the one person who would help. I was mistaken. Come, Papa. Uh, uh, Monsieur Jordan, I do not blame you. Our situation is hard to understand. Monsieur Jordan, your answer is still no. I don't have to spell it out, do I? Good night. She looked at me for a minute without another word. Something in her eyes made me wonder if I ought to change my mind. But I was too late. She turned and opened the door. That's when Simono stopped in his tracks. The cat! <gasps> the cat! Adele! Simono, get away from that door. Jordan, help me. Here, here, let me. Here. Adele. Adele, mon fille. Mon petit fille. Stay back, Simono. Let me look at her. Monsieur, she... she's... I'm sorry, Simono. So... The cat. Simono, wait. Keep away from the door. Do not hold me, monsieur. Let me go. Get out there. Listen to me. The cat. Simono! Come back! Simono! I stood there trying to realize what had happened, and the answer wasn't pleasant. All they'd asked for was a little help, and I'd said no. And now Adele was lying dead at my feet, and her father had gone out of the door with a look on his face that spelled more trouble. I called Captain Sam Savaya, Cairo Police. He made it to the tambourine in a hurry. And while he examined the girl, I told him everything I knew. Most regrettable. Ah, uh, go on, Sam. Tell me I could have stopped it. Well, you have no reason to condemn yourself, Jordan. I'm not so sure. You saw nothing of the assailant? No, but Simono did. All he said was the cat. So this is what we must find. The cat. Hmm. Aren't you forgetting something more important, Sam? More important? Andre Simono. I saw the way he went out of here. He's after revenge, Sam. And who can blame him? Don't you see? He'll cause more trouble for himself unless he can be stopped. The duty of the police is quite clear. We are able to function only after a crime has happened. Oh, sure. That's great. You'll throw half the Cairo police force into a hunt for the cat. But you won't spend five minutes trying to prevent a murder. I tell you, my hands are tied. I'm interested in Simina only as a material witness. We will find the murderer of his daughter, of course. Sure. You'll find him dead. Perhaps. Unless... Oh, I get it, Sam. Unless I get to Simino first. Well, that made it pretty clear. If Simino was to be found, I had to find him. I left Sam and his boys to take care of the girl and started out into the Cairo night. I wasted two hours and 20 piastres asking questions to try to get a line on Simino. No results. That left the Shepherd's Hotel where Adele worked. A sleepy night clerk gave me her address in the French Quarter across town. It was already daylight by the time I found it. I didn't expect Simino to be there, and I was right. But I made enough noise in his door to raise a neighbor. What he told me sent me back north across town to the Bulak Shipping Company. They were just opening up, but a workman was already there, scraping a name off the window. It said J. Constantine and A. Simino. The name he was scratching off was Simino. Inside, a red-headed secretary sat at a desk in the outer office, putting on her face for the morning customers. She kept right on with a lipstick. Well, an early bird. Do you have an appointment? Why? Do I need one? Uh, well, that depends on who you really wanted to see. I could be satisfied right now. Are you asking for an appointment or a phone number? I bet you got a lot of them there in that book. Andre Simino's, maybe, huh? Haven't you heard? He's not with us anymore. Anything else you can tell me about him? No, but I could try. I get an hour off for lunch. So do I. But right now, I'll settle for Jay Constantine. He's awfully busy. Oh, he's got a minute. I said he's busy. What is the meaning of this? Who are you? My name's Jordan. Doris, I told you I was seeing no one. Mr. Jordan's the impetuous type, aren't you, Mr. Jordan? But uh, be gentle with him, Juno. I might want him back. I'll speak up. What do you want? I hope I didn't interrupt your morning paper. You did, but that doesn't answer my question. I thought you might be reading about Adele Simino. Adele Simino? What about Adele Simino? I was reading about a safe robbery last night at the Nile Investment Company. Oh, I see. Does that tie in with it? Mr. Jordan, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, then I'll tell you. Adele Simino was killed last night. Shot down in my cafe. What? Yeah. I see. 
Sit down, Mr. Jordan. Please sit down. This is a terrible shock. Terrible. Andre and his daughter loved each other very much. How did this thing happen? We don't know. I was hoping you could help. Anything, anything, Mr. Jordan. All right, then, let's start with why Simino's name is coming off your window. Oh, that. He quit the business several days ago. He didn't tell you? No. Any special reason? Just decided he wanted out. I'm sure it has no connection. Well, maybe the cat can tell us more about that. The cat? That doesn't mean anything to you? Should it? I don't know. But we've got to find Simino. He seemed to know who did the shooting, and he's out for revenge. To kill or get killed. Yes, of course. Andre would think of revenge. That girl was his whole life. After the way she stuck by him through everything. Yeah, everything. September 39, Paris, you know. She still had faith in him, waited for him, to help him when he got out. September 39, Paris, uh, got out of where? Why, out of... Mr. Jordan, I thought you were a close friend of his. That's right. Obviously, you're not. And I have told you too much already. Now you can get out. Touchy subject, Mr. Constantine. I said get out, or I'll have you thrown out. A half hour later, I was at the Cairo Library going through the Paris newspapers for September 1939. And it paid off. The third paper I went through carried a story of a robbery conviction. Expert safe-cracking, defendant Andre Simino. Now that made me think about something else Constantine had mentioned. The safe-cracking job at the Nile Investment Company just last night. Well, Sam could tell me more about that. I drove to the tambourine, parked out back, and started for my office door on the phone. I didn't quite make it. I did not enjoy waiting, Mr. George. Right there, my search was over. I hadn't found Simino, but I had found the cat. He looked like one, and he sounded like one. And he was very much alive. Observe me, Mr. Jordan. I'm looking at the gun. The same one that killed Adele? So you saw me at the window last night. Who were the shots for, Adele or her father? She was at the door at the wrong time. Yeah, so they were for Simino. And then he said many things, did he not? Only two words. The cat. <sighs> two words that mean death to you now. Why were you after him? Why was he marked for killing? I talk no more. No more, Mr. Jordan. I felt nothing. It wasn't me, but the cat that slumped against the door. The sound of a lot of footsteps sent me whirling. In time to see a figure stuffing a gun in his pocket, dart out of the alley to the side street. Hey, stop! Come back! Come back here! I stood there looking after the fading car, and I knew I'd failed. There was nothing now but to call Sam and tell him who I'd seen running away from the killing. I was sure who it was. Adele's father, Andre Simino. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Cheeseburgers, egg burgers, sun burgers. Seems like everybody's inventing new ways to serve hamburgers. But as far as lots of folks are concerned, there's just one way to make them all taste their best. And that's to serve them with rich, extra lively Del Monte catsup. Mmm, now you're talking, Larry, and talking flavor. Yes, believe me, that Del Monte catsup has a special zip. A zesty kind of spiced tomato flavor that has just what it takes to put smacking good flavor into a hamburger or do justice to a steak. Well, let me tell you, I certainly make it a point to keep Del Monte catsup in my house. I just can't afford to be without the lift it gives the low-cost foods that I serve so often. You know, Larry, there really is something different about Del Monte catsup. You bet there is. You see, Del Monte catsup is the only catsup made with pineapple vinegar. And pineapple vinegar is a super fine, sparkling vinegar that coaxes out an extra measure of real, deep-down flavor from those plump, vine-ripened tomatoes Del Monte uses. Yet, for all its goodness, Del Monte catsup actually costs less than many other quality brands. Now, there's value for you. So make yours Del Monte catsup next time. You'll say you never enjoyed catsup so much. <laughs> Now we 
take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Smokescreen. All I'd wanted was to find Andre Simino and keep him out of trouble. But I didn't make it. And it looked like he'd paid the cat in full for Adele's death. So my job was still to call Sam Sabaya and tell him to pick up Simino. Not for safe cracking now, but for murder. I got my office door open, stepped over the cat's lifeless form, sprawled half inside and half out, and reached for the phone. Just then, the door for my cafe opened. There stood Constantine's red-headed secretary. Forget about the lunch, Rocky. Not in here, Doris. Not now. Oh. You mean we're not quite alone? Just wait for me in the cafe, huh? You shouldn't have done it, Rocky. It was Simino's job. That's why I wanted to find him. Poor fellow. And dressed so nicely. Don't touch him, Doris. What's the matter with you? Keep away. Very well, Rocky. Then you will find it for me. Well, everybody carries a gun. Search him quickly. Go through his pockets. Sure. Is there anything in particular? Only the key to his fiat, nothing more. Get it? Hmm? Yeah. Is this what you want? Toss it over here on the floor. Thank you, Rocky. But don't try to follow me. You wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it at all. She ducked out the open door, and I was on the phone dialing Sabaya. I got a quick answer, told him to get over to the tambourine on the double, and hung up. Then I ran to my car, spun out of the alley, and up to the main drag. I was in time. The little Fiat was speeding down the hill three blocks away. After a while, the car pulled up at a deserted spot near the river docks. She was outside, opening the car trunk. She found nothing, but kept hunting. Under the car seat, under the floorboards, under the hood. But still no luck. Finally, she gave it up in disgust, left the Fiat, and started walking toward the Nile Drive. When I saw her flag down a taxi, I turned to get back to my car. And bumped right into a big, shiny badge. You will come with me, Mr. Jordan. In my car. Oh, Greco, you're just in time. Get after that taxi. There's a girl in it that can tell you plenty. You feeble attempt the delay avails you nothing. The Captain Sabaya wishes to see you. Yeah, he can wait. Enough, Mr. Jordan. The Captain Sabaya is most annoyed by your manner of hanging up the phone without explanations. Now, it is an order. Uh, all right, Greco, let's go. And so there is violence is still more violent, Jordan, and always at your very door. All right, Sam, you got the cat now. That's who you wanted. You are telling me that the man murdered at your alley door is the cat? Of course he is. He admitted killing Adele last night. And who killed him, Jordan? I wasn't looking. Indeed. Of course it was him, you know. We will most certainly find him now. Sure, you'll find him. A man sees his daughter cut down right in front of him. He can do nothing but square it, and then you get real busy. Jordan, do not forget, retribution is a concern only for their... All right, Sam. What would you have done? What could any man do? My feelings are not important. Uh. Well, what do you know about the cat? Very little, except this bullet which we found in him. Uh, 32, huh? Now, Jordan, why were you not at your cafe when I arrived? I was tailing somebody else you'll want, Sam. A red-headed secretary named Doris. She works for Simino's old partner at the Bulak Shipping Company. What has she to do with this? Well, ask her. I'd have brought her in, only that's when our good friend Greco showed up. Greco did only as he was ordered. Yeah, sure. Look, Sam, Simino was once in prison for safe cracking. Could that connect up with the big job at the Nile Investment Company last night? Perhaps Simino himself will clear that up. When we find him. Oh, all right, Sam, have your fun. Sam didn't stop me, and I went out. Pretty soon, Simino would be found, and that would be that. I tried to walk it off, but things wouldn't sit right. A lot of things. One was a redhead named Doris. I had to get her story. It was late evening when I got to the Bulak Shipping Company. The place was already closed. I'd just taken a hold of the doorknob when it happened. Shots were from inside the building. I twisted the knob without thinking, and the door came open. The outer room was empty, so I went on into the office. The first thing I saw was what had been Jay Constantine lying on the floor and slumped down on a nearby chair, gun still in his hand, was Andre Simino. Simino. Mm. Simino, what's the matter with you? Snap out of it. Uh, uh, oh, Monsieur Jordan, when did you come? Too late. What do you mean? I, I cannot seem to remember. Something happened. Take a look at Constantine. That'll help. Hmm? Oh, 
Then I did kill him, as I came to do. Listen to me. Tell me why they were after you. Uh, it does not matter now, monsieur. Constantine was your partner. What else? Yes, we were partners, but not here. Well, then what then? Robbery? Safe cracking? Yes. I had great skill with locks and nitroglycerin. Constantine did the planning, but finally I was caught in the act, convicted and sent to prison. Uh, you do the work and take the rap. When I got out of prison, it was my daughter who convinced me that I must not return to crime. And Constantine also seemed kind. He invited me to join him as a partner here in the shipping business. It was my chance to live a decent life. Only what happened? Constantine have other ideas? Yes, he suddenly announced to me that all plans had been made. I was to carry out his orders. A safe-cracking job at the Nile Investment Company last night? Big haul of negotiable securities? Yes, then, you know... Constantine was commanding. I did not know what to do. Again, my daughter Adele convinced me I must not do it. I called Constantine by telephone and tell him that. Oh, he was in great fury and said that if I would not do it, he would do it himself and leave evidence that I had been there. Yeah, and that's when you and Adele came running to my cafe. But only to ask you to witness that I do not have a part in the robbery. But Constantine had to get rid of you then. You knew too much. That is why he sent the cat. Not to kill my daughter, monsieur. Me. To kill me. I only wish it had happened so. You know what I have to do now? The police have got to know. It does not matter now, monsieur. First, you better hand me that gun. Take it quickly and call the police. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? That's the one you used? Why? Why, yes, of course. Hey, he's not Constantine dead? No. There's no cordite smell in the gun, and none of the shells have been fired. But, monsieur... Besides, this is a thirty-eight. The bullet found on the cat was a thirty-two. Well, how could that be? I, I went to kill him. You saw me. I do not remember, but uh, how could it be otherwise? I got a good idea, Simino. But right now, you're getting out of here. Hold up at the nearest hotel and stay there. I watched him as he went out and closed the door behind him. I held up a second, then I heard footsteps in the warehouse behind the office. A moment later, the door opened, and it was exactly who I expected. Rocky. Ah, oh, you work nights around here too, Doris? No, I just got here. What are you doing here? I'll show you. Have a look, Doris. I see. It's Constantine. You don't seem very surprised. Oh, it's, it's just that... I don't know how I feel. Simono did it, of course. Well, sure, who else? What do you mean by that, Rocky? Now, why did you come here tonight? I just came back to get a few things I'd forgotten. Same things you were after at my cafe when you grabbed the car key off the cat? The same things you were scratching for in the little car but didn't find? A stack of negotiable securities that Constantine hijacked from a safe at the Nile Investment Company? You know a great deal, don't you, Rocky? Not as much as you do, Doris. Come on, let's have it. Rocky, I worked for Constantine. I did only what he told me. I had to. What did he tell you? Only that he'd given the securities to the cat to hide. He didn't trust the cat. I was sent to watch him. When I found him dead at your cafe, I had to get the securities. I, I was afraid. Sure, you were real scared, weren't you? Tell me something. Where'd you meet up with a guy like Constantine? One meets up with many people on the continent, Rocky. Yeah, that's true. Oh, I knew you'd leave me. I knew you would, Rocky. Yeah, this, this black smudge on your sleeve. Why, right. mascara, I guess. It doesn't matter. No, not mascara. But we know what it is, don't we? I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, come on. Let's find out. I kept hold of her wrists and dragged her through the warehouse, out the back door, into an enclosed lot. And there it was, a big incinerator. We went to it. She stood there silently as I opened the metal door and reached inside. First thing my hand touched was what I wanted. Bulky envelopes. A lot of them. You don't have to open them, Rocky. The securities are all there. You're in a big hurry to hide them, weren't you? The soot on your sleeve shows that. Does that make you feel very proud of yourself? You couldn't have carried that smudge very long without noticing. Now, what happened? You heard me coming in the door. You hit him quick, figuring to come back and get him after I was gone. Did I leave out anything? Just one thing. Yeah? That I have a gun. Well, Rocky, no! Can't do it twice, Doris. No! Rocky, give it to me. Yeah, the answer's too much. Yeah, 32, like the slug found in a cat. I figured the same will be found in Constantine. Sure. 
two shots gone. Hey, Rocky, listen to me. It looked easy, didn't it? All you had to do was get the cat and Constantine out of the way, and the securities were all yours. You knew Andre Simino, half crazed with grief, was after them both. So you stayed with him. Only you fired the shots, not he. But he didn't even realize that he was to take all the blame. Rocky, Rocky, listen. They're gone, both of them. I... We have securities now, you and I. No one has to know. Yeah, that's possible. We could keep that lunch date. We could keep a lot of them. Not for an awful long time, Doris. But why? Because you won't be around. Not after the police get through with you. <laughs> In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. As a mere man around the house, it's a little out of my line to tell anybody how to make a food budget behave. But I do know how many, many women insist that there's no help like Del Monte tomato sauce when it comes to making thrifty cooking good cooking. Don't you be telling me about Del Monte tomato sauce, Larry. Why, my mother uses it, and so did her mother before her. Well, why not? After all, Del Monte is the original tomato sauce. The way Del Monte combines those fine, ripe tomatoes and zesty spices is a special secret. It must be. No other tomato sauce has ever matched Del Monte's flavor. You know you can depend on it, too. That's extra important with tomato sauce, it seems to me, because you cook it in. That's right. The tomato sauce represents only a fraction of the cost of your other ingredients, but its flavor can make or break your whole recipe. Now, Del Monte tomato sauce makes any dish a success, and no mistake. Try it in your favorite stew or meatloaf recipe, friends. Taste for yourself why it always pays to get Del Monte tomato sauce. Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. Well, I walked Doris out of the Bullock Shipping Company building, put her in my car, and took her to the Cairo Police Headquarters. I gave Sam a quick rundown. He dispatched some boys to go for the body of Jay Constantine. Then I waited while Sam put Doris on the grill for a while. When he came out, he motioned to me. Come with me, Jordan. Oh, where are we going, Sam? You will learn in good time. Come along now. Okay, but let's have it, Sam. What did Doris tell you? She confessed everything. There was little else she could do. Especially when we found that the shot that killed Constantine was also from a thirty-two, her own gun. Uh, it's easy to put together now. Constantine planned the safe-cracking job. When Andre Simino backed out at the last minute, Constantine decided to go ahead with it. In the meantime, sending the cat to kill Simino, who knew too much. And that was when the unfortunate Adele brought her father to your cafe? Yeah. Only for my witnessing that Simino wasn't at the scene of the robbery. The cat killed Adele by mistake. Thanks to my help. After that, things looked simple for this Doris woman. As Constantine's employee, she knew of the robbery. She had but to kill him and his assistant and get the stolen securities for herself. And all the time, the pressure would be on Simino. Everybody knew he was out for revenge. Well, she had us fooled for a while. Even Simino was fooled. A man half crazed with grief and the thought of revenge who did not even know that the shots were not from his own gun. So, uh, what about him now? He has achieved no wrong. Surely his unhappiness for his daughter is enough for him to bear. Thanks, Sam. Now, for the last time, where are we going? <laughs> for once, Jordan, I thought I would drive you home to your tambourine, where you belong. Well, then hadn't you better turn around? You passed the place, four blocks back. Now we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'd been eyeing the guy sitting in the back booth for quite a while. Everybody in the cafe tambourine was having a good time but him. He was American, maybe 30, black hair, combed straight back. I thought I'd come back and say hello. He looked like a nice guy until I got close. Then I saw something in his eyes I didn't like. Fear. Uh, what do you want? What's the matter, buddy? Drinking alone, not good for you. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Oh, sure you do, but aren't you hitting the bottle kind of hard? Who are you? I own this place. Oh, 
Oh, then you're Rocky Jordan. That's right. You're, you're an American. Right on two counts. That's why I came here, Mr. Jordan. This is really an American place, like Chicago or New York. I'm safe here. Safe from what? My name is Lint, Mr. Jordan. I... Uh, maybe you better walk out and get some air. No. He... He's waiting out there. He was following me. I know I saw him. He, he's going to kill me. Kill you? Don't let him kill me, Mr. Jordan. Nobody's going to kill you, Lint. Let's go to the front door and take a look. No. Come on. I want to hit you. Lint acted like a nut that might cause trouble. I took him by the arm and led him up to the front door of the tambourine. Outside, there was nothing but a cabbie and two girls walking up and down. Then suddenly, Lint pulled away from me. Across the street! It's him! I told you! Lint tore back into the tambourine, running for the rear. I headed across the street and into 24 hours I'd never forget. <laughs> On a narrow street not far off Cairo's native quarter stands a Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Trail of the Assassin. He was American. His name was Lint. He was hitting the bottle a little too hard, and he was using my tambourine for a hiding place. The usual formula for trouble. He swore somebody was waiting just across the street to kill him. I got Lint to the door to have a look, but he tore himself away and ran back into the cafe. So I scouted the street alone. All I found was shadows cast by the streetlight. I checked the cabbie parked at the corner. Yes, sir. There was a man waiting a few minutes ago in the shadows. An American? I would not know. He wore a black coat as though he was cold. He kept coughing into a handkerchief. Yes. That was all the cabbie could give me. So I went back into the tambourine. Chris, my bartender, said Lind had gone out the back way through my office. I don't like wild men running around my place, so I went after him. I just opened the office door when I saw Lint stumbling toward me from the open alley door. He suddenly fell into my arms, pushing me back into the cafe. Then he slid to the floor, face down. That's when I saw the orange handle of an assassin's knife, pinned between his shoulder blades like a flower. I had Chris lock the doors, then phone police headquarters. Ten minutes later, who should show up but Sergeant Greco? As I see, stepped in the back. Murder, of course. That's good deduction, Greco. Now, where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya is in Alexandria. I am in command during in his absence. You mean in charge? The man was killed here in the cafe tambourine? No, out in the back alley. He stumbled in here after. Very well. Where were you, Mr. Jordan, when the man was murdered? Sergeant, I saw it all. I saw it all. There was a fight. This man... Mr. Jordan? Yes, him. He was throwing the man out. The man broke away running. They went to the alley. The poor dead man... Fox his way back toward the light. Thank you, my friend, for this information. I saw it all. I will testify for the usual fee. <laughs> Look, Greco, are you going to take the word of a... For the moment, you may consider yourself in my official custody, Mr. Jordan. You better get it straight. Back in my office. As you wish. Now, there is only one question unanswered. Huh? Only one? You motive. Why did you kill this man, Lint? You tell me. I advise you to cooperate, Mr. Jordan. Admit, this man was an old enemy of yours from America. You recognize the orange-handled dagger, didn't you, Greco? Of course. It is a type used by the tribe of Singori. That's right. Tribe of Singori, professional assassins. There have been too many murders in Cairo, but those who would wish us to believe the tribe of Singori were the murderers. You will have to do better than that, Mr. Jordan. Why should I want to kill Lint? I've never seen the guy before tonight. You Americans have a tendency toward violence. Okay. You win, Greco. I killed him. Excellent. Now, we are progressing. You're making a fool of yourself. What? I was going to kill a man. Would I do it right outside my cafe with everybody here? In a rage, yes. And pull him back into the light? Well, uh... Would I use a knife? Maybe a forty-five, but no knife, Greco. Uh... <clears throat> Now go on, take me down to headquarters. You look real good when Captain Sabaya gets back. As Captain Sabaya has done in the past, I hereby release you on your own recognizance. But 
I assure you, Mr. Jordan, I shall not rest until I have uncovered evidence to bring you to justice. Oh, what a brain. Also, your cafe tambourine will be declared off limits and closed until this affair is settled to my official satisfaction. That is all, Mr. Jordan. Greco went out and took the names of the witnesses. I told Chris to go on home. In 20 minutes, the cafe was empty. I locked the front door and turned off the overhead lights. There was a spilled drink on the piano. I picked up the glass and set it straight. Sat down. It'd be in the papers tomorrow. With my picture. All about Lynch's murder in the cafe. Bad for business. Business? <laughs> there wouldn't be any until Greco pulled down his official stickers. Lynn had been an American. Funny I hadn't thought about home for a long time. And it had been a real long time. Lint. Who was he? Who killed him and why? With Greco putting the pressure on, I knew I'd better find out before everything crashed in on me. Greco would work like a bulldog until he'd hoped something up that would look like evidence. The next morning, I went to Mustafa Bey's shop down on the bazaar. In Cairo, 1950, he was one of the last true artisans making knives. Tempered blades, daggers, cutlasses. Mustafa Bey made them all. He was an old man. He knew everything that had happened in Cairo in the last 60 years. If anyone would, I figured he'd have the answer to the orange-handled dagger. Ah, Fendi, you wish to buy a blade of truth. Sorry, Mustafa. Oh, Jordan, sir. An old man who has burned his eyes over the forge until even the stars are lost to him. He's sorry that he did not rise to make welcome an old and trusted friend. Oh, thanks, Mustafa. I'll just sit here on the rug beside you. What brings Jordan Bay to the shop of an old man who finds himself as worthless as the moon to men that will not look up? Oh, you're not worthless. For 69 years, Effendi, I have made the finest blades. And my father before me, and his father before him, the same. Now, the pistol. Ah. Well, everything changes, Mustafa. Everything but Ashes, do not hasten to that far place where yours are destined to be found. Say, look, uh, maybe you can help me. I am a friend. The orange-handled daggers of the tribe of Singori. What do you know about them? The Singori are assassins. Oh, I know that. Ah, yes, they were excellent customers. But the Singori were driven into hiding many years ago. Are they still active? It is said the camel may live from its hump, but there comes a time when the camel must drink. You're saying maybe the Singori are getting back into harness. You are concerned about the man who was killed with the iron Singori dagger at your cafe last night. You knew about that? Even so. If the Singori did it, it doesn't make sense that they leave their calling card. Mustafa is vain of his knives. See, my mark on this one. All artists are proud of their labor, and they mark it with their sign. So the Singori always leave a sign of their work, the orange dagger. Unless... Go on, Mustafa. Unless someone kills and wishes to point to the innocent. Oh, meaning maybe somebody did the killing with a Singori dagger to make it look like the tribe of assassins. All things are possible. Thanks, Mustafa. You've been a big help. Now, the first thing I had to do now was to get a lead on who wanted Lint knocked off. I made a few telephone calls and found Lint's hotel, the Du Nord. I grabbed a cab and was there in ten minutes. Fifty piastres talked the room clerk at the Du Nord out of key 416, the one to Lint's room. I went upstairs. Lint's room was a mess. It looked like Greco had been there and taken a close look around. But maybe Greco had overlooked something. He had. Just as I was snapping open Lint's suitcase, a big job with hotel, airline, and steamship stickers from all over the world posted on it, I felt a sudden movement across the room. 
I started to turn, but it was too late. I felt a rocket sink through my skull, and the rug went black. Deep black for a long, long time. Are you all right now? When the rug began to lighten Here, up... Here, put this cold rag Don, I was looking at the ceiling. Isn't that the... Framed by the ceiling was the Do face of a woman. That? Red hair hanging oh. down, almost touching my face. Can you hear me? Green eyes, cool it's against a creamy rag. tan. She was young. There, now isn't this better? I'm supposed to say, where am I? You're in room 416 at the Hotel du Nord. I don't get around much anymore. Ooh. Here, let me help you up. Oh, uh, thanks. I hear... <sighs> I heard a noise in here, and then a man ran out and left the door open. I, I saw that you were hurt. Well, thanks for coming to the rescue, lady. I, um, was coming to this room anyway. But did you know the man named Lint? I was his wife. His wife? Well, I, I, I just heard about his death a little while ago. The newspapers. I, I don't know what to do. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Your husband was killed in my cafe. Then you're... Rocky Jordan. Yes, your picture was in the paper. Didn't you wonder where your husband was last night? He, he stayed out before. Hmm. Did you get a good look at the guy that ran out of this room? Well, it happened so fast. You must remember something. Well, he, he was wearing a top coat, a, a slouch hat. I, I couldn't see his face except... Wait. Yes, he was coughing. Top coat, coughing into a handkerchief. You've never seen him before? I don't know. You're not sure, then? We were on a sightseeing tour last week into the native quarter. I, I couldn't say for sure, but we went into a little place. I think I saw him there. What was the name of the place? It was a cafe. Well, do you remember the name? Yes. It was the cafe of the Singori. I told the redhead to sit tight until she heard from me. Then I raced for the elevator. Down in the lobby, I ran into none other than Sergeant Greco. Well, Mr. Jordan, I hope you are not attempting to free Cairo. I don't go to hotels to catch planes, Greco. Just a reminder. Amut, come on, dear, the elevator. One moment, Greco. Oh, Sam, am well, I glad you're back? Oh, Captain Sabaya, you have returned from Alexandria. As you can see. I was told you had followed Jordan to this hotel, Greco. Following me for information, Greco? Jordan, I have just heard of your part in this unfortunate affair. Just an innocent bystander, Sam. Yes, yes, of course. You make it most difficult, Jordan. Things are tough all over. Why are you in this hotel? I heard it has a good rumba band. It came here to enter the room of the murdered man. Have you been upstairs, Jordan? Yeah, I took a look around. You see, Captain Sabayo? But Greco here made such a mess of the room, there wasn't much left to see. You are wrong as usual, Mr. Jordan. I made notes concerning the location of all articles, but touched nothing. Awaiting the return of Captain Sabayo. You better go take another look. Things have changed since you were up there. Sam and Greco started for the elevators. I went to the hotel desk to ask a question, but I got the wrong answer from the clerk. There must be some mistake. Mr. Lint registered as a bachelor. There was no woman in his room. So, Lint wasn't married. The red-headed girl had lied. She was likely the one that had turned Lint's room upside down, looking for something. And she was likely the one that had tapped me on the head, too. She'd been in the room when I opened the door, hadn't had a chance to leave. She didn't want to get caught there, so she'd sat me. But why had she stayed? She could have run away while I was knocked out. Then it hit me. She'd worked real hard to plant the idea of the coughing man in the black slouch hat, like the one the cabbie had seen across from my tambourine the night before. She'd also mentioned the cafe of the Singori. But there was only one place to go now, deep into the native quarter to the cafe of the Singori. It could be a front for the headquarters of the assassin tribe. <laughs> I passed the beggar at the entrance of the cafe of the Singori. He looked like a beggar, but I had a hunch he was a lookout. The cafe was dark and almost empty. I felt the stare of hidden eyes. A native girl was dancing in a small, cleared space. I sat at a table and waited. I didn't have to wait long. Rocky Jordan honors the house of Singori. I put you one card ahead. You know me, but I don't know you. You the head man around here? I am Haki, 
A simple waiter, Effendi. Sure. Real simple. It is my profession. I have heard many things of you, Mr. Jordan. I hope they are all true. Believe half you see, nothing you hear. Estimable. It is a saying from a book of wisdom. No, a saying from 7th Avenue. Akim considers it an honor to serve the wise Rocky Jordan. Oh, not so wise. I didn't come here for refreshments, Akim. Oh? I can see you're real surprised. <laughs> Perhaps Jordan Bay would care for uh, company at his table. A man was killed in my cafe last night, Hakim. Oh, unfortunate. Yeah, he thought so. Name was Lint. Ever heard of him? Englishman? USA. We do not get tourist trade so deep in the native quarter. <laughs> they become fearful before they have penetrated to the Singori. Maybe you know a red-headed woman, about 25. Creamy, tan, green eyes. Ah, that is beyond Hakim's hope of heaven. You had a customer here, maybe a week ago, an American, middle-aged, wears a black slouch hat, coughs a lot. Maybe he bought a little, uh, service. I do not recall such a man, Effendi. But surely Rocky Jordan knows the day of the tribe of Singori being hired as assassin is in the past. What kind of a knife are you carrying, Hakim, inside your robe? No, Effendi. Uh, let's take a look. Hey, Jordan! Yeah, it's like I thought. It's necessary for Hakim to protect himself in this low place of employment. Eight-inch dagger. But you will notice, Effendi, the handle. Yeah, it's not orange. As I have said, the day of the assassin, alas, is over. All of you! It is all right. Sure, Hakim, sure. Effendi, listen... I must be careful here. Such a man as you have described has been seen in the quarter. It is said he is a man of great evil. Where can I find this man of great evil? It is said he lives at the Hotel of the Armenian Davos, near the Fountain of Musa. But Hakim does not know if this be true. Hakim would know the truth if it came dressed like the Sphinx. But Hakim knows where the man of evil lives, for sure. Here, Hakim. Oh, Muta Shakir, that thing. Give part of that to the dancing girl, will you? She's the only thing in here you can depend on. I had an idea if I was ever going to get my cafe open again, I'd better see the man of evil. I got to the Armenian's hotel by the fountain of Musa about sundown, spreading the fox sheesh on the fly specked front desk to get a straight answer, then walked up to room 237. The room of a man who had registered as Rufus Glanders. So, you are Rocky Jordan. Come in, Mr. Jordan. I've been expecting you. <laughs> You're uh, Rufus Glanders? I am called that. Another American? Uh, San Franciscan. Well, just why are you expecting me, Glanders? Lint was killed in your cafe last night. Ah, you get right to the point. I've only been in Cairo a short time, Mr. Jordan. But already I've heard much of you. Your tenacity. <laughs> hey, you're a sick man. And a relatively poor one. <laughs> I didn't come here to talk money. Money can be very important. You see, Mr. Jordan, I have used up my monetary reserves in traveling about the world. Yes, I uh, noticed your suitcase down at the foot of the bed. So? People that tour the world usually pick up a lot of stickers for their luggage. That reflects middle-class taste. Oh, I don't know. Folks get quite a kick out of it. But your suitcase has just one sticker on it. I know. A view of the Golden Gate Bridge. A sticker from a hotel in San Francisco. The only city in the world. Why should I bother with the rest? So, you're from San Francisco, huh? Yes. Yeah. Ah, there's nothing like that view from Golden Gate Park on top Telegraph Hill in Frisco. Golden Gate Park is nowhere near Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. <laughs> okay, you're from San Francisco, all right. But that still doesn't explain why you're expecting me. I've heard much of you. And since Lint was killed at your place last night, and since the killer has not been apprehended, I thought you might contact me. <laughs> why should that follow? My reasoning for traveling all over the world on the little money that remained to me, was to catch up with Lint. 
kill him. Maybe Captain Sabaya down at police headquarters would like to hear your story. Police got an idea I did Lint in. That's absurd. Last night, the cabbie outside my cafe spotted you waiting there to kill Lint. Yes. I was there. At the end of a 6,000-mile search, I found him. I thought I could kill him. But I couldn't. You nailed him out back. No. If I had been able to kill Lint, I would have entered your cafe and accomplished it in the open. You see, Mr. Jordan, my life means nothing to me now. I have only a little time left. And Lint took everything that mattered to me when he left San Francisco. My money. My wife. Your wife has red hair? Beautiful red hair. I don't know about your story now, Glanders. But from where I stand, it looks like your wife's trying to put the finger on you. But you've seen her? She practically led me to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Jordan. Stop stalling, Glanders. We're taking a trip to headquarters. Ah, Mr. Jordan, get back. Come on, Glanders. I shadow behind the window. Sorry. I whirled toward the window that opened onto a fire escape. I dive for the floor. A knife. Come through a knife. Getting down the fire escape, he won't stick around. Be careful, Mr. Jordan. Oh, yeah, I see him now, running down the street. Who is it? You're lucky to be asking. That knife was for you, Glanders. Went into the sofa, right up to the orange handle. But who threw it? Who was he? A guy named Hakim. A guy who's got a lot of answers. Answers? But it's too late to follow. Uh, we don't have to. I know just where you and I are going to find him. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns with the ending to tonight's story. What is the war news today? Whatever it is, you want to help, don't you? Well, you can do something very important. You can contribute a pint of your blood every three months through Red Cross. Again, Red Cross is the official agency to collect blood for the armed forces when and wherever needed. That need is now. We must build up a blood reserve. and We must continue to take care of the day-by-day needs of our community. If you are a normally healthy person between the ages of 21 and 60, will you call your local Red Cross and make an appointment for a blood donation? Call your local Red Cross. We return you now to Rocky Jordan. For the conclusion of tonight's story. I headed out of the hotel room with Rufus Glanders in tow. Outside, we caught a cab and directed the driver deep into the native quarter, the Café of the Singori. The native watcher was still at the door as we went inside. This time I didn't take a table, but barreled on through into the back. That's where I surprised Hakim in a small cube-like room. Ah? Oh, you... You honor us again, Jordan, sir. Breathing kind of heavy, aren't you, Hakim? It's been a most exceptional evening for business, Jordan, sir. Hell, yeah, bet. Uh, you know my friend here. I have never set eyes on this rascal before. As he says, if envy... We have not met. Now you forget fast. <laughs> Who hired you to put a dagger into Lent's back, Hakim? <laughs> Very funny joke. Was it the woman with red hair? I do not understand. Be careful, Jordan. You... I hope you know what you're doing. It was the red-headed woman, wasn't it, Hakim? She paid you to kill Lent. She also paid you to put me on the trail of Glanders here. So I'd go to him and be caught there when you slipped a dagger into him, too. I was to be the fall guy. What manner of lie is this? She knew the police were already suspicious of me. That'll be the payoff. Rocky Jordan, caught alone in a room with another dead American. <laughs> Your funny story makes me laugh. Eh, maybe this will make you laugh, Hakim. I think the woman's here in this cafe right now. No, she is not. I'm so sure I'm going to call Captain Sabaya and have him search the place. No, you cannot do that. He'll make her talk. You know what she'll say, Hakim? She'll say, I paid Hakim the assassin 100 pounds to knife Lint and another 100 to kill Glanders. no. No lies. Careful, Jordan. He's dangerous. Not Kim the assassin. No, she will not tell me. Kim took off like he knew where he was going, and he did. Before I could move, I heard a noise in the hallway, and a woman stumbled into the room. It was the redhead, and she was wearing an orange corsage pinned over her heart. 
the orange handle of a singori dagger. Just then, Captain Sam Sapphire came in with about ten men. One of them had Hakeem by the neck. Oh, let me go, go, let me go. Hey, you got the right man, Sam. The woman is dead. Yes, she's dead. How'd you get here? My son had always followed you to trouble, Jordan. Well, she was asking for it, Sam. She was hiding out here. I'd spotted her in Lint's hotel room, and she had the idea that Flanders here was after her to kill her. Flanders? Who is he? I was her husband. She hired Hakim. No! No, Jordan! To kill Lint and Flanders. When I got mixed up in it, it looked like a good idea to make me the fall guy. I would have to have more information. Well, this is a good time for you to talk, Flanders. Well, <coughs> when Lint left San Francisco, he took nearly all my money, ruined my business. He took my wife with him, too. I followed them all over the world. I was going to kill them. But when I caught up with them here in Cairo, I found I couldn't kill. I also learned that Lint had thrown her out without a dime. Reason enough for a woman to hire an assassin to kill him, Sam. She probably got the lead of the Singori in a sightseeing tour. Well, you were lucky, Glanders. You were next on her list. She was going to make sure you didn't catch up with her. Lucky? I suppose. I put the pressure on Hakim here, and he killed his client so she wouldn't be able to testify against No, him. Jordan, no. That's when you walked in, Sam. Jordan, is it possible that you will ever leave the matter of justice to those in authority? Oh, hold it, Sam. Greco was out to get me. Greg? Oh, yes, yes. I shall discuss this with him. Then I can open up the tambourine? At once, if you so desire. But I didn't so desire. I headed back to the cafe with Rufus Glanders, but I just didn't feel like opening up. It was kind of late, and we sat down at the bar, and I mixed a couple of drinks. Uh, delicious drink, Jordan. Thanks, Glanders. May I propose a toast? To the United States and to those of us who can never return. Why can't you go home? The matter of Lynn's theft? He juggled books in the firm, making me appear to be a criminal. It was a personal matter, one which I do not care to explain. So you can't go back? No, I can't go back. That's tough. You know San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a cafe there once. Looking down on the Embarcadero, night, with the soft lights of the ships floating up to you through the fog. Cable cars, fishermen's war. Post Street. Forest Park. Forest Park? But that's in St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Starring George Raff, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine here in Cairo. They've got a saying out this way, he who has been frightened by a serpent fears the sight of a rope. I remember one piece of rope that had me squirming. It was around my neck. <laughs> Cafe Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, chiefs, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Partially transcribed, tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Lady from Tangiers. <laughs> Yeah, what is it, Chris? Joe Spalvo's at the bar, wants one on the cuff. How is his back bill? Ooh, that long. Oh, let him have one more. Right. 
And Miss Adder's party wants another round. I'll be in the office. Yeah, that's the boss, Rocky Jordan. I'm Chris. I run the bar. I also handle most of the conversation. You know how bartenders are. Yeah, Rocky Jordan. Some guys in town will say he's got a cash register for a heart. I see the other side of him. You take that Chantel deal, for instance. That began when a tourist guy named Harubin turned up dead in an alley. A nice little guy. Rocky thought a lot of him. That night he went to Harubin's house, a heap of dried mud in old Cairo, to pay his respects. As he expected, he found Harubin's widow in tears. What he didn't expect to see was that classy-looking doll with the honey-colored hair. She turned away from the body, looked sympathetically at the widow, and left. I'm sorry, Mrs. Harubin. Very sorry. You're done, babe. You're done, babe. In my book, he was the right guy. It is her fault. That French woman, the one who just left. It is all her fault. What has she got to do with it? She gave him money. He was helping her. I had a feeling Jordan Bay things would not go well. My husband. Here. Here, Mrs. Harubin. Fifty pounds. Jordan Bay. I just remembered. I owed it to him. He did me a big favor. A solemn alakum. Rocky left us staring down at that 50-pound note and he went outside. Up the street, he could see the girl as she moved through the glare of a lamppost. Her hair was full, her legs were long, and she walked in a slow, easy kind of way. So he quickened his pace and he caught up with her. Uh, excuse me. Uh. I saw you at Harubin's house. Mind if I walk along? Well, I... I was a friend of his. I take it you were too. I knew him. He looks kind of lonely back there, doesn't he? The dead often look lonely. Sometimes so do the living. You, for instance. Excuse me, I must go now. Oh, just wait a minute, please. I'd like to talk to you. I do not have time. The name is Jordan. Rocky Jordan. I run a cafe here in town. Please excuse me, Mr. Jordan. We have nothing to talk about. I think we have. Reuben's death might be a good start. You know, it was a rope around his neck that did the job. I know. The police turned him up in an alley. There's nothing clear beyond that. Look, uh, there's a coffee house up the street. A cup would do you good. Well, uh, all right, Mr. Jordan. Why not? Coffee? No, no, thank you, Mr. Jordan. I got a first name, you know. I know. Sir Ruben's wife said he was working for you. Mr. Jordan, do you always concern yourself with other people's affairs? <laughs> Hardly ever. I learned a long time ago to mind my own business. Then I am afraid I do not understand your interest in Ruben. Let's put it this way. Seeing him back there, he looked like he needed a friend. No longer, Mr. Jordan. Well, for the living. I guess you're right. As a matter of fact, you look like you could use one yourself. Anyone can. How many true friends does one ever have? You shouldn't have any trouble. Nor should you, Mr. Jordan. Rocky. I think I'd better go. Wait a minute. You still haven't told me your name. Lorraine. Lorraine Chantel. Chantel. Hmm, sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah, there was something in the Cairo Mail the other day. Fire in a cheap hotel over in the Citadel. Found a body. Amy Chantel. My husband. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. I had not seen Emil in some time. We were separated. I was living in Tangier when a wire came asking me to meet him at Shepherd's here in Cairo. I came. I waited. He did not arrive. The next day I read of the fire. What about Harubin? Your friend Harubin knew my husband. After Emil's death, I naturally began to wonder what he had been doing lately. Why he had suddenly wired me and... 
Well, uh, Harubin was helping me to find out. And he got a rope around his neck for his trouble. You can bet that Harubin's death is tied in some way with your husband's. Yes, that is what the police seem to think. I spoke to A. Well, they kept on talking, and pretty soon it was kind of clear they were a team, both interested in the same answers. And it was also kind of clear they were interested in each other. They spent the next several hours asking questions about Chantel and Harubin. The search took them through the Cairo that tourists seldom see. The dark, crooked streets, the haunts of the beggars, the blind, the thieves. The Cairo that Rocky also knows. Two o'clock the next morning, they wound up back at Lorraine's hotel with a whole lot of nothing. Rocky ankled back to the cafe, went upstairs, and that's when the phone rang. Yeah? Hello? Jordan? That's right. I have been trying to reach you all evening. Who is this? Jordan, it has come to my attention that you have been asking many questions about two men who died recently. What have I had? It is wise to leave the dead alone. If that's advice, I'm not interested. You should be. The last man who ignored my advice found himself in the river. I can swim. (laughs) With holes in your head, Mr. Jordan... I do not think so. The next day, Rocky was with Lorraine again, but he didn't tell her about the phone call. And that night, they wound up at the Ramesses Club to check with a girl Chantel once knew. Well, the floor show was on, and the featured act was fracturing the males. A wren with cold black hair was doing a specialty. Oh, the kind of a dance that makes a guy feel like he's run on AC current instead of blood. <laughs> a few minutes later, the doll was sitting with Lorraine and Rocky, and they were going over the same old questions. No, I'm sorry, Lorraine. I did not even know Emil was here in Cairo until I read of his death in the newspaper. It was such a shock. I was always fond of Emil. Yes, I know. Zarita, you ever hear of a man named Harubin? Harubin? No, I do not believe so. A guide? He was a friend of Emil. No, I do not know this man. He might have come around to see you a few days ago. Oh? Why would he have done that? To ask about Emil. No. Now, if you'll excuse me, my my next number. I really must go. Of course. Goodbye, Lorraine. Mr. Jordan. So long. Rocky, what is the matter? Nothing. Come on. Let's get out of here. Well, I guess it was about 1 a.m. when they finally got back to Lorraine's hotel. It was a warm night. Rock had supper set up on the balcony. It was one of those desert nights full of meaning. The stars were as big as watermelons. The moon threw a big shine down on the Nile. The air was full of river sounds and the hotel orchestra playing it soft. Rocky cracked open a bottle of wine. They sat there for a while, not saying much. And then... You know, Lorraine, you haven't said much about Emil. Hmm? What is there to say? Oh, I don't know. I thought you might say a little about what he was like, how you felt about him. He was my husband. I loved him. And what kept you apart all that time? Lorraine, I've got a feeling there's something hanging over us. Something you're not telling me. Emil was in prison, Rocky. In Alexandria. I see. He... He was a counterfeiter. I did not know his occupation when we married. Later, when I found out my husband, someone I loved, was a criminal was going to prison. Never mind. None of my business. But I want to ask you something else. What are you going to do now? Uh, I mean, where are you going to live? How are you going to get along? I have not made definite plans yet, Rocky. I've got a suggestion. Lorraine. Shh. Rocky, there was a man watching us at the Ramsey's Club, was there not? 
I didn't think you saw. Paul, wearing a beret. He followed us when we left. He may even have followed us here. He may. Oh, there will be trouble. He will be hurt like her Ruben. It will be my fault. Oh, Rocky. Rocky, I do not want to bring any trouble on you. Lorraine. Oh, Rocky, there are things going on which we do not understand. There are things... Oh, you should not have. Rocky, I... Lorraine. No. Rocky, please don't. But you... Please, please go. When will I see you again? I do not know. Tomorrow at the tambourine, about noon. Yes, yes. Now go, Rocky. Rocky decided to walk back to the tambourine. He had some thinking to do, and the fresh night air felt good. He was coming up the Sharia Bendar, going slow, when it happened. The rope came up from behind and wound around his throat, and then a couple of arms shoved him forward into a wall. And he could smell the garlic coming over his shoulder as a buster moved in close behind him. You do not heed warning, Jordan. You do not heed warning at all. How many times must you be told to stop looking for Emil Chantel? Looking for Chantel, Claude. Oh, most certainly. Oh. Now you listen and listen well, Jordan. I'm not talking just to hear myself talk. Stop looking for Emil Chantel. Stop or you will never look for anything again. Oh, I seem to have held the rope. Too tightly. <laughs> no matter, Claude. Let him lay there for the dogs. When Rocky came to, he staggered to his feet, shook the cobwebs out of his brain, and headed down to police headquarters with a lot of questions on his mind. When he got to Captain Sam Sabaya's office, he found Lieutenant Greco there. Settled comfortably in the captain's creaky chair. Well, Mr. Jordan, what is on your mind? A guy named Chantel. 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 Mm. I'll refresh your memory. He died in a hotel fire a week ago. Oh, yes, yes. An unfortunate affair. That depends. On what, Mr. Jordan? Whether he died or didn't. What do you mean? You jumped at that like a vulture going after a meatball, Lieutenant. What do you mean? Are you sure the body found in that hotel room was Chantel's? Of course. His wife identified him. How well did you know Emil Chantel, Mr. Jordan? I didn't. Of course. Naturally, you would not care to include an ex-convict among your acquaintances. Look, Greco. A guy made a mistake. So he paid for it. The way I feel about it, if a guy goes straight... But he did not. What do you mean? The day after Chantel's arrival here in Cairo, samples of his artwork went back into circulation. You're sure of that? Of course I am. I see. Well, you don't have to worry about him anymore, do you, Greco? He's dead now. Uh, yes, he's dead. Uh, that reminds me, Mr. Jordan. So is Harupi. He was working for you at the time of his death. Was he not? Where did you get that idea? You gave his widow 50 pounds. Do you deny it? Oh, that. For services rendered. What was he doing for you? Nothing. I gave her the money because I thought she could use it. Indeed. <laughs> I do not believe it. I don't care if you do or not. How about Chantel? What about him? I've got another 50 pounds that says he isn't dead. Want to take me up on it, Greco? Thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Well, Emile Chantel was alive and everyone was in the know but Lorraine herself. And the Rock went back to the tambourine, poured himself one, and did some thinking. He could tell the doll Emile was alive and say goodbye to her, or he could clam up. Lorraine didn't make his decision any easier when she showed up around noon the next day, wearing a blue silk dress... And one of those French perfumes that kind of reach out and grab. Without wasting any time, he told her. Lorraine, Emil's alive. 
I know he is, Rocky. You what? I know he's alive. I... I knew it all along. What is this? Come on, Lorraine. Level it out. I'm not in the habit of making a play for women with husbands. The day after I read of Emil's death in the newspaper, I saw him in the Muski Bazaar. Before I could get to him, he disappeared into the crowd. So I knew he was alive. That he was in Cairo. And I hired Harubin to help me find him. You could have told me. No, Rocky, I could not. At first, I did not know who you were. I did not know you could be trusted. What about later? I could not tell you then. For another reason. For the same reason you got so angry when you found out my husband was alive. Rocky, we have been spending much time together. We have had certain feelings. They're all right. That's ancient history. Forget it. Uh, Of course. I am sorry, Rocky. Me too. Well, what do we do now? I don't know what you do, Lorraine, but I find your husband. But for why? Why should you wish to find him? You asked yourself why Emil was playing dead? Yes. And what answer did you get? No answer, Rocky. I do not understand. Well, then try this on for size. Emil's back in the counter fitting up to his ears. He killed a guy in the hotel and made it look like he himself was dead. Why? So he could work free from the police. No, Rocky, no. Emil would not kill. He wouldn't, huh? You ask me, also murdered her Reuben because the poor devil was getting too close to some answers. No, Rocky. Emil is not a murderer. Everyone to his own opinion. Come on. I'll take you back to the hotel. Rocky and Lorraine took the trip back to Lorraine's hotel and kept the conversation down to nothing. Whatever they were thinking, they kept to themselves. And then as they opened the door to Lorraine's apartment and went in... Close the door. Close it. Emil. Emil Chantel. Gun and all. I was wondering when you were going to show. Emil, you're bleeding. What a very nice way to meet my lovely wife after all these years. With a bullet in me. Who is this man? His name is Jordan. He's a friend. That's a mistake. I'm not a friend of yours, Chantel. Emil, please. Put the gun away. No, no, not yet, Lorraine. Are you suggesting we have business, Mr. Jordan? A little. Some squaring to do on the life of a guide named Harubin. Mr. Jordan believes you killed him, Amy. That is not so. Tell him it is not so. Of course it's not so. Why should I kill Harubin? You tell me. Also tell me why you started to run off those phony pound notes again. Two weeks out of jail and you've already bought a return ticket. No, no, that is not so. Now listen to me. Lorraine... I did not meet you as shepherd as I wire because... Because of a Turk named Gabek. He wears a beret and eats garlic sandwiches? Yes. He was in business with me. The plates I made of a man with him. He was clever enough not to use them while I was in prison. I was to join him again when I was released. The years, however, changed me. I no longer wanted the life I had with Gabek... With my release, he began to issue the counterfeit notes again. I went to him. I demanded if he do not stop, I would go to the police. He agreed. But instead, he sent one of his men after me. I've been running ever since. Oh, and me. Well, that's a lot of stories, Chantel. But there's still that guy who died in the hotel fire. The one who was supposed to be you. Yes, he he was supposed to be me. Gabek's man made a mistake. I took advantage of it. Put my identification upon him. That's nice work. No, not nice. But I felt it necessary. If... If Garbeck thought I was dead, I would be free. But he saw me when I tried to contact Loin. He did... This... To me. But he did not catch me. No, Willie. I have too much to live for. You, Lorraine. Emil, you are weak. Please sit down. Listen, I... I... I have two tickets on a boat, which leaves for Natal in less than an hour. The arrangements are made. A... A friend... will pick us up. 
in a taxi. Emil, oh, I, I, I got him. the couch. Over here, Rocky. Oh, gently, gently, Rocky. Uh, he can use a doctor. We will get one on the boat. Then you're going. He is my husband. What about a little thing called love? I loved him once. Perhaps I can again. And he needs me. He needs me so. Rocky. Yeah, Lorraine. You were wrong about him. Wouldn't be the first time. He is not a killer. That's what he said. He did an evil thing once. But he paid for it with years of his life. Now, now things would be different. Yeah, he said that too. There's just one little problem. What is that? How do I know he's on the level? Or that you are? How do I know he didn't do those killings? Everything hasn't been on the up and up between us, you know. How do I know for sure this isn't another curveball? Yes, Rocky, I understand. You do not know for sure. Well, everything is in the open. We leave by boat for Natal in an hour. That gives you time to think. If you decide Emil is a liar and a killer, you can phone the police in time to apprehend him. And if I decide the other way? You can forget him. And... And the last few days. This seems to be my day for decisions. Rocky. Yeah? Whichever you decide. I want you to know, I will never, never forget you. Well, Rocky had a lot on his mind when he left the Chantels. He walked a dozen blocks thinking about it. Then he grabbed the cab, went back to the tambourine. But he never got inside. The tall gent from the beret was waiting at the side door, and with him was a wiry little guy with nervous eyes and hands two sizes too large. Mr. Jordan. Yeah, what can I do for you? We have never met. Except over the telephone and in the dark alley. I recognize the voice and the garlic. You do, Jordan. <laughs> you hear that, Claude? Yes, and I, Mr. Jordan, recognize blood when I see it. Blood? Observe the stain on your sleeve. Don't move, Jordan. Search him, Claude. He is unarmed. Good. Now, if you will come with us, Jordan, we'll find a nice, quiet place where we can talk. Huh? Garbeck and Claude bundled Rocky into a big black sedan and headed for the river. Twenty minutes later, they were going along the river's edge, and Rocky could see the ships being loaded. One he knew was leaving soon for Natal. And then he was inside a warehouse, and the going got rough. Sit down, Jordan. Sit down. You may be here for some time. Yeah, I could have guessed that. Looks like a long night. He does not have to be. Where is Chantel? Chantel? Never heard of him. Where is Chantel? Like I said, I never... <coughs> Perhaps I should attempt to persuade Jordan with this. No, Claude. Remember what happened to Harubin. Tugged a little too hard with that rope, didn't you, Claude? Unfortunately, yes. You know, Garbeck, you do well to get yourself another boy. This kid isn't too reliable. Look at the mess I made of that killing in Chantel's room. Do you seem to know a great deal about all this, don't you? Pretty careless of you, Claude. Killing the wrong man. Yeah, it's a stupid mistake. But what is past is past. At the moment, I am interested in finding Emil Chantel. And I told you I... Be sensible, Jordan. Be sensible. You want the girl. And I want Chantel. You can do us both a favor. Tell me where he is. We will get rid of him. Then the charming Lorraine will be all yours. It's as simple as that. Sorry, Garbeck. No deal. <laughs> well, they went to work on Rocky. They threw everything in the book and some things that weren't. But Rocky held on. What he was waiting for was the boat whistle. And ten minutes later... 
You find all this amusing, Jordan? The smile on your face. Buster, you just missed the boat. The boat? I do not understand. Skip it. It's a long story. Do not move. Quick. Yeah. The police. Sergeant, cover the door. Swine. Stop. Enough. Enough. You have been very clever, Garbage. But it will take a man more clever than you to explain the counterfeiting equipment I have just found in the back room of this warehouse. Abdullah, hurry. Take these two men away. I don't mind admitting, Greco, this is the first time I've been glad to see you. Make no mistake, Mr. Jordan. I'd rather hope that I was coming to apprehend you. You had a couple of your boys tailing me, hoping to pin something on me. Right, Greco? That is right. Because I could not believe that you had given the widow Harubin 50 pounds for nothing. She needed the money. That was reason enough, Greco. But you wouldn't understand that. Anyway, it turned out to be one of the best investments I ever made. Our star, George Raff, returns in just a moment. Tomorrow night, Paulette Goddard adds a generous touch of glamour to the dramatic proceedings over most of these same CBS stations. She plays the lead on the Broadway Playhouse production of Bachelor Mother. Later tonight, over most of these same CBS stations, the President of the United States will be heard on a full-hour CBS observance of the 175th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. In addition to the President's dedicatory address, delivered at the Washington Monument ground in the National Capitol, a host of noted personalities take part in this event, which touches off a full year of American rededication to the principles of American freedom and democracy. Tonight, on CBS. Now, here again is our star, Mr. George Raft. Thank you. Be sure you drop around next week at the same time. For another story of adventure when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine. So until we meet again next week, Saida. George Raft stars as Rocky Jordan, Larry Dobkin as Chris. In tonight's cast were Gene Tatum, Doris Singleton, Lou Krugman, Paul Fries, Byron Kane, and Gerald Moore. Original music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Rocky Jordan is written by Adrian John Doe and Larry Roman, produced and directed by Cliff Howell. Bob Lamont speaking. This partially transcribed program came to you over CBS, where you hear the FBI in peace and war every Thursday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, starring George Raft, we bring you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. I'm Rocky Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. You've heard the old saying, everything comes to him who waits. I remember one time, if I awaited then, I'd be waiting still. Real still. Dead. Cafe Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's partially transcribed Rocky Jordan story, The Janakos Affair. I'm Chris, Rocky Jordan's barkeep. Been working for him for years now. I guess I know the rock better than anyone. I know he's so close-mouthed, you'd never find out what went on around here if I wasn't such a yak. 
But you know, it isn't always Rocky who plays it shy with the words. I'm thinking of the time Rocky was beating his brains out trying to get someone else to open up. Yeah. I remember how that one began. Night, all the Kyrenes asleep. Rocky, too, in his apartment over the tambourine. And all of a sudden, it sounded like the front door was going to cave in. Mr. Chosen, you would please open the door. It was one of those things from under a stone that passes for a man. Lieutenant Greco, Cairo Police. In the name of authority, you will open the door. What's going on, Greco? Lieutenant Greco to you. I am here on official business, Mr. Jordan. You will dress and come with me. What? At four o'clock in the morning? I said you will dress and come with me. That is a command. Greco, what's this all about? I am not at liberty to say, but I warn you, Mr. Jordan. I have the authority to enter your establishment and take you by force if necessary. And as you know, I would like nothing better. Well? Okay, Power. You're around. But this better be good. Look, Sam, I don't like this. I don't like being hustled out of bed in the middle of the night by that cop. And I use the word loosely. I am fully aware of what has happened to you, Jordan. Jordan, I am tired. I am worried. Do not test my patience. Well, I've got a right to know what's going on. We will not argue the point. Let us simply say I am not at liberty to say... Sounds like you and Greco had a rehearsal. Excellency. So, this is Mr. Jordan. Jordan, may I present His Excellency Hassin Bey of a special government service. How do you do? You have been in Cairo a number of years. Restaurateur, American citizen. You ran the cafe, Tambourine. That's no secret. You have dealings with the Janakos Produce Company. I get my fruits and vegetables from them. When did you receive your last delivery? This morning, before I closed up. What time this morning? How should I know what time? I don't keep a log on the exact time I get a delivery. I see. Now, how about you opening up and telling me what this is all about? Take him, Captain. This way, Jordan. Well, by then, the rock was as mad as a rooster with laryngitis. Sabaya waltzed him into the next room, and things got worse. There were a dozen more people in there, all standing in line with their sleeves rolled up. And at the head of the line, a medico was busy with a hypo in his hand. What is this, Sam? Get in line, Jordan, and roll up your sleeve. Now, wait a minute. If you think I... Jordan, you will do as I say. If some joker's going to stick a needle in my arm, I want to know why. You will, Jordan, in time. For the moment, do as I say. All right, Sam. If that's the way you want it. When you have finished here, you may go home. Thanks. Sure you haven't forgotten anything? Though, as a matter of fact, Jordan, there is one more thing. Your cafe tambourine is to be closed until further notice. Rocky was really steaming when he left police headquarters. He ankled across the street to Amun's coffee house, found a good crowd there, and more than one guy rubbing his arm. He had a call to make, but the phone was occupied, so he sat down at the table and ordered a cup of java... And then the doll eased in. I hope you do not mind if I sit here. All the other places are taken. No, I don't mind. Thank you. You get hauled down to headquarters, too? Headquarters? I do not understand. I thought you were one of our little group. Everybody else here seems to be. I usually stop here on my way home from work. Such a crowd at this late hour. Has something happened? Yeah, something has. You seem angry. I've got reason to be. Tell me about it. It would bore you. I see. Oh, of course. Now I know. Now you know what? Sir, I have seen you before. The Café Tambourine. You're Rocky Jordan. (laughs) My name is Zelda. Zelda Volma. Zelda. Yeah, it fits. Why do you keep looking toward the front door? I'm just sweating out that buster yakking on the phone. I've got a call to make. If it's urgent, perhaps I can be of some assistance. I live not far from here, and I have a telephone. Thanks for the offer. But the buster looks like he's ready to hang up. Excuse me. American Embassy, McIntyre. Mac, this is Jordan. Oh, yeah. Listen, I... I know. You get hauled out of bed in the middle of the night... Get a shot in the arm and your cafe gets padlocked until further notice. 
Yeah, we know all about it. Well, what are you going to do about it? Not a thing. We're in complete agreement with the Cairo police. Night. Ah. Uh... That did not take long. Oh, you are leaving. That's right. So am I. My apartment is just down the street, at the Nehru house. And I have a date at the other end of town. Looks like we're headed in opposite directions. It needn't always be that way, Mr. Jordan. I'll file it, baby. Yeah, what? Oh, hello, Jordan. Thought maybe you'd be asleep, Janakos. Asleep? Asleep? Who can sleep? Come on in. I just got back from police headquarters. They had a few questions to ask me. Some of them had to do with the Janakos Produce Company. Oh, you too, huh? Hey, sit down, Jordan, sit down. Well, Janakos, what's it about? Look, I don't know any more about it than you do. They closed up your place? Okay, so they closed up mine, too. They put a padlock on my warehouse, my trucks, everything. Sure, they didn't tell you why? Yeah, I couldn't get anything out of them. Just a shot in the arm. Look, I got a lump there already. You're not the only one. Stop beefing. Rocky, listen. What is this shot business? What's the matter? I got something that's horrible? I'm a menace to society? Don't ask me. Why did they give me that needle? Why didn't they tell us something? Rocky, what Rocky. is all this hocus-pocus? Why did... Do... What's the matter, Janakos? Janakos' face suddenly turned white and his jaw dropped. He was staring over Rocky's shoulder. And as Rock started to turn around, his eyes swept the mirror on the wall and he caught a glimpse of a figure moving in behind him and then something crashed in behind Rocky's ear. Hard. When Rocky came to, he was still sitting in the chair. But the room around him looked like it had been hit by a blockbuster. And standing in the middle of it all was Captain Sam Sabaya. Are you all right, Jordan? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so, Sam. What happened here? You tell me. I was just sitting here talking to Janakos when somebody slugged me. Who did it? I don't know. I only caught a glimpse of the guy in the mirror. But you did see him. Yeah. You know, Sam, there was something familiar about the guy. Oh, my head. Oh, I'm sure I've seen him someplace before. But I can't think where. Wait a minute. Janakos was sitting across from me. He saw me. Janakos is dead. Janakos? Dead? We found him in the bedroom. He had been shot. Captain Sabai. Captain Sabai. What is it, Lieutenant? We have searched everywhere. The apartment, the warehouse. There is no sign of a small black bag. Uh, I was afraid of that. The killer must have found it. Taken it with him. Yes, yes, yes. What's all this about a black bag? Never mind, Jordan. Come along. Where are we going? To police headquarters. I want you to look over some photographs. Well, Jordan? No go, Sam. I've been over these mugs twice already. The killer isn't here. We must have your cooperation, Mr. Jordan. You are the only one who knows what this killer looks like. That's right. Now I'm in the driver's seat, Hassan. And if you expect any more cooperation out of me, maybe you better start telling me what this is all about. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, perhaps it would be wise... Uh... Very well. Tell him, Captain. Jordan, there was a robbery at the University Hospital last night. Someone was after a bag containing a large supply of narcotics. The black bag you've been looking for? We have established that the man who took the bag left in one of Ginocco's trucks. But he was not one of Ginocco's drivers. We have checked that. And the truck was returned. All right, Sam. So this guy copped a bag of narcotics. That's happened before. You didn't carry on this way. Uh, Jordan, patience. We believe now that Janokos was involved in the robbery, that he was the recipient of the stolen bag, and that the killer took it from him, believing it contained narcotics. Believing? But you said it was narcotics. It was supposed to be narcotics. The original thief made a mistake. He took the wrong bag. That is why we have had to operate with such secrecy. That is why you and the others who had some contact with Ginocco's truck were given their shots. What was in that little black bag, Sam? A rack of test tubes containing deadly germ culture. Pneumonic plague. So don't you see, Jordan? The killer opens the bag. 
It does not contain what he thinks. He throws the bag away. Where? In some dark alley? A storm drain? The river? Jordan, we must find that bag. Yeah, because if you don't, you're liable to have the biggest epidemic in history on your hands. Thousands and thousands of lives. A whole city wiped out, Mr. Jordan. We can't prevent that, but we must move quickly. Well, the quickest way to find the bag is to find the killer first. Exactly. And you are the one man who knows what he looks like. What are you driving at, Hassan? If we were to let the word spread quietly that you, and you alone, knew what the killer looked like, the killer would learn of this. And might he not come out into the open to try to silence you? Yeah, he probably would. I get it. You're asking me to set up myself as bait. Wait around for the killer to take a crack at me so you can nail him. That's it, isn't it? Frankly, yes. We know we have not the right to ask you to expose yourself to a murderer's bullet. Oh, save it, Sam. All right. You've got yourself a pigeon. You are listening to tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, starring Mr. George Rand. The only show in radio where the audience writes the scripts. That's the Wednesday night CBS favorite, Dr. Christian, starring Gene Hersholt. The Devil's Workshop is the title of tonight's Dr. Christian program. In it, Gene Hersholt, as the kindly physician of River's End, combines his skill as a doctor with extraordinary instincts about human behavior to bring about a surprise conclusion to a very strange story. Remember, your next program over most of these same CBS stations... It's Gene Hersholt as Dr. Christian. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Janakos Affair. Well, they hooked Rocky on the end of a line to bait the guy who did in Janakos and waltzed off with a little black bag. Some of Sabaya's men dropped a few choice words in the Cairo dens, and the underworld was to do the rest. The boss came back to the tambourine to wait for the play, feeling a little bit like a goldfish in a shark pond. Meanwhile, more of Sabaya's men, rigged out in native dress, took up stations along the street. Sabaya himself stayed at headquarters. Everything was set. A few long hours later, it was noon, and nothing happened except the boss used up a lot of cigarettes. A year went by, and it was four o'clock, and then five. No play. Then a little after seven, the phone began to jump. Cafe Tambourine. Rocky Jordan? That's right. Hey, who is it, Rock? Huh? Shh, shh. Rocky, this is Zelda. Remember the girl you met in the coffee shop last night? I remember. Rocky, I must see you. I must see you right away. What for? I, I cannot tell you on the phone, but it is important. Please, Rocky, meet me. Joseph's well in the Citadel. No. The Trake Bazaar. East End. All right. Five minutes. Fifteen. All right, Rocky. All right. Don't fail me, please. Zelda Valma. She wants me to meet her. She in on it? Could be. There's one way to find out. Hey, Rocky, listen. That killer could be using her to get you out in the open. I can't sweat this thing out forever. I want to get it over with. I'll be all right. Sam's men will tail me. Ring Sabaya. Tell him what's up. Sure, Rock. Good luck. I watched the boss slip out into the night and Sam's men move after him. A block or so from Turk Bazaar, Rocky stepped into a hallway and waited. A few minutes later, Zelda went by, carrying a grim look. She was alone. That was how the rock wanted it. He let her go by and walked down the block a ways, and then he stepped out and called. Zelda! The dame pivoted, saw him, and he moved up the street after her. Only crossing that small Moolak alley, he ran into trouble. Halt! Jordan! Halt! Where are you? In the dark of the alley. You cannot see me, but I hold a gun. Take my word. Now... Call Zelda. Tell her to come here. Call! Zelda! Over here. Good. I know you're being watched by the police. 
gives him reason to believe all is well. Light a cigarette. Relax. Good. Is everything all right, Leon? Fine. Talk to him, Zelda. Let us not waste any more time. You will not be injured if you cooperate. I've heard that before. Zelda, ask him. Quiet, Leon. Let me do this. You're wasting time. We do not have all night. Sounds like you two are married. Crocky, you must answer a question for us. A very important question. What disease are the police giving shots for? Why do you want to know? We want to know. Isn't that enough? The police have a free shot for anyone who might have come in contact with the germs. For everyone they know who might have come in contact with the germs. Some they do not know. You and Leon? Yes. I'll make a deal with you. Answer my questions, and I'll tell you how to get an answer to yours. Well, Leon... Of course, of course. What does it matter now? Okay. Who is this Leon character? Is he the one who killed Janakos? No. Bring him out of the shadows so I can see for myself. All right. You pass on that. Now tell me. How did you two come in contact with the germs? Leon was the one who drove the truck and stole the bag for Janakos. And you? I worked the switchboard at the hospital. I was the inside contact. I set up the robbery with Janakos. As you know, we were supposed to steal narcotics. Janakos had a buyer. We were supposed to get rich. Instead, all you're going to get is a high fever. Oh. Where did you touch the stuff? At Janakos' house after the robbery. Before we knew it was so deadly. Rocky, what is it? Cholera? Typhus? What? Who killed Janakos? Where's the black bag now? We do not know. Who was Janakos' buyer? We do not know. Well, that is true, Jordan. She had told you everything we know. Now you must tell us the name of the disease. I said I'd tell you how to get an answer to your question. And I will. Go to the police and tell them what you just told me. What? Cheat. You have cheated us. I didn't cheat you. I'm doing you a favor. You will die with your favors? Leon, don't shoot. That will not get us what we want. The lady's so right. That native selling water up the street is actually a cop. He'll give you what you want. But Rocky, if we tell the police what we told you, it means jail. Yeah. But not telling them means the morgue. Take your pick. So long. Rocky turned on the gun and walked off. He could hear Zelda and Leon scrapping, but he didn't wait to find out what they decided. He signaled the water cellar, and the cops did the rest. Well, the Volmer floozy and Leon the weasel were buttoned up, but the killer in the little black bag was still among the missing. The Rock came back to the tambourine, filled me in, and went up to his apartment. But when he stepped inside, he found out he had company. Come in, Jordan. Shut the door. It was a beanpole with a voice, and he was sporting a nervous thirty-eight. Shut the door, I said. Quickly. Now lock it. What piece of woodwork did you come out of? The police followed you when you left. I came up the fire escape. I've been waiting for you ever since. Well, Harold Bannister. Janako's killer. Yeah, now I know you. Now you know me? Are you saying that you didn't know me before? That's right. Just a little idea to get you out in the open. Oh, you... Idiot, you stupid meddler. Before this, I had no quarrel with you. You needn't have had to die. Now I must kill you. And of course you don't want to. Of course I don't. Killing isn't my business. Just peddling narcotics. Why did you kill Janakos? Because he tried to double-cross me. He took my money. And then he tried to say that he didn't get the narcotics. He tried to tell me... Hey, Rocky. Who's that? My bartender, Chris. You'll have to be let in. He knows I'm up here. All right. I'll be in the closet. The door will be partially open. Now, don't make me kill him, too. Hey, Rock. Anything wrong? No, Chris. All right. Let him in. Oh, <laughs> had me worried for a minute. Here, I brought you some coffee and sandwiches. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, put the tray down on the table over there. Yeah, sure thing, Rock. You uh, want anything else, Rock? No, thanks. Well, I'll... I'll get back downstairs. Slug him, Chris! Chris! Hey, was lucky I caught you not, Rocky. Nice work, Chris. Let's get a look at him. 
Hey, you really put out his fuse. I guess I did hit him kind of hard. Well, now it shouldn't be long before we turn up that black bag. Bring Sabaya. He'll want to talk to this boy down at headquarters. Sam, you've been in there with Bannister for two hours. Yes, yes, I know. Well, what's the matter? Won't he open up? Oh, he confessed to the murder of Janaka readily enough. What about the little black bag? Well, he does not know where it is, Jordan. He's lying, Sam. No, no, I'm certain he's not. Well, make him a deal. If he tells you where the bag is, you'll see to it that he gets off with life instead of an execution. I've already tried that, Jordan. He insists he does not know where the bag is, that he did not find it when he searched Janaka's apartment. Oh, fine. Then Janaka's must have gotten rid of it. Yes, I'm afraid so. But where could Janakos have hidden it, Jordan? Where? Look, he must have gotten rid of it between the time Zelda left his apartment and the time I got there. One half hour, Sam. Yes, yes. Well, he couldn't have gone very far. Well, if you were to search the area around Janakos. We have place... already done that, Jordan. We found nothing. But it's got to be around there somewhere, Sam. Well, it isn't. <laughs> Lieutenant Greco and his men searched the area thoroughly. The empty lot. The garbage heaps, the storm drain, the railroad yards. Uh, everywhere. Everywhere. Standing there, staring out the window isn't going to help find it, Sam. Look. Look out there, Joe. Cairo. My city sleeps unaware of the danger that threatens to destroy it. Unaware that death will come with the dawn. Come, Jordan. I, I will drive you back to your cafe. Thanks, just the same. I'll walk back. As you wish. Good night. Good night, Sam. Now, when Rocky left police headquarters, he didn't head for the tambourine. He just started walking. Just walking and thinking hard. And then suddenly he realized he was back in Janakos' neighborhood again. He stopped by the railroad yards, lit a cigarette... Watched the switch engine batten some empty boxcars back and forth. And that's when it happened. The idea hit him with the wallop of a Sunday punch, and he took off with the switch tower on the dump. Questions, questions. I have told the police all I know, Effendi. Let's run through them again. You said there was only one freight train in the yard here early this morning. Yes, yes. And that is it there on the far track. The police have already searched it an hour ago. They did not find the bag. Is that all of the train? All of it, Effendi. Were any of the cars unhooked? Sent down the line before the police searched the train? Why, yes. Several empty cars were removed this afternoon. Where are they now? About a mile that way on a side track. Thanks, Buster. That's all I wanted to know. Rocky put in a fast call to Captain Sabaya and then headed down the tracks on the run. He found the empty boxcars, all right. Real empty. The bag wasn't around. And then something started buzzing in Rocky's head. He was pretty sure the police hadn't told anyone what they were looking for. And yet, the gent in the switch tower had mentioned the little black bag. So Rocky raced back to the tower. But before he got there, he saw the gent running across the tracks with the bag under his arm. The rock was closing the gap between them by the time they reached the St. George Bridge. And then the guy jumped up on the rail and stood there holding the bag over the river. Stay back. Stay back or I will drop it. Now, take it easy, Buster. Nobody's going to hurt you. I just want that bag. Yes, so you can turn me over to the police. No, Effendi. No one will know I found the bag. I have only to drop it in the river. It will be your word against mine. You won't get in trouble if you do as I tell you. Trouble? Never in my life have I been in trouble. I do not know why I took this cursed bag. You found it after the police left, in the boxcars down the line. Yes, yes. The police forgot to ask you about them, didn't they? Stop. Do not come closer, or the bag and the jewels go into the river. Jewels? You better take a look in that bag, Buster. No jewels, no money, nothing but death. D death? Go ahead, take a look. Only be careful. Well, are you satisfied? I do not understand. 
Nothing but bottles. And enough germs to wipe out a whole city. Oh, oh. And whether you like it or not, you're going to have to go to the police. Get yourself a shot in the arm, or you're liable to be dead by morning. You are trying to trick me. Don't be a sucker. I'm giving it to you straight. Now, come on. Get down from there and give me that bag. Come on. Here. Take it. Take this cursed bag. That's better. Nice work, Jordan. Sam. Uh, I was watching from the shadows close by. I did not dare shoot. I could do nothing. Here, let me have the bag. Here you are. Yes. Oh. Jordan, it is all here. At last. Captain, Captain Samoy. Here comes Greco. Captain, it has just occurred to me that the black bag may be... Uh, uh, what is that you have, Captain? A little black bag. You were supposed to have found it. Uh, you were supposed to have searched this entire town. Instead, it was Jordan who found it. Mr. Jordan found it. I'm sorry, Greco. Lieutenant Greco. Correction. Sergeant Greco. Sergeant Greco. 